Right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to you all, and thank you for, for joining us for this introduction to drilling course. As you know, drilling is one of the most important aspect of our works as geologists. And if you get it wrong, you can cost the company the entire mine. This course is aimed at introducing you to some of the, the things that you don't learn much about at university, particularly regarding the practicalities of drilling and logging. But before we get into the course, I thought to share some stuff with you regarding what it is that we are doing at the, uh, the, the GSSA. Here are some of the basic services that we provide to our members. And we'd like to encourage you to make yourself familiar with what these mean for you. Remember, all of these opportunities are available to you as GSSA members. Now, I know that many of you are not members, and I'd like to encourage you to go to the website and fill out a form. I'm not going to go into to too much detail here. I just want to highlight specifically the technical and scientific meetings where we have both free and paid events, live recorded events, we're doing online, starting with contact and hybrid events going forward. And we also have a number of networking events. And just to highlight the events calendar for the year, as you can see, we're pretty much just over halfway through our, our year. We're currently sitting here at the introduction to drilling course. And if you look down, you can see the courses that we've still got to come. There's the, the green energy day towards the end of the, the year. And note this is also free to all students. Then we have Colin's more detailed drilling methods and techniques for resource exploration. So if you enjoy what you hear here today, please look at coming on Colin's more extended course. We've also got the 3D geological modeling, followed by data analytics and machine learning. We have the, the ESG inquisition feedback, which is also a free event for everyone. And the, the last event of the, the year is the African Exploration Showcase. And so that brings us to today's course, an introduction to drilling. And just to highlight your presenters today, first up we have Colin Rice, who has been in the, the drilling industry both locally and internationally for many years. And he does a number of courses in association with the, the GSSA, of which we're very pleased. Then we have Masi Zintwana, who is the section manager of ore control at Anglo-American. And he also has 100 years of experience in the, the practical application of, of logging. And last up, but by no means least, we have Nolene Pauls who's also been working in the, the mining industry for many years, shall we say. And Nodine's going to talk to us about the importance of structural logging. So we're going to, to start off with um, an introduction by Roson Drilling. Then we'll go into the, uh, the first section. Then we'll have a tea break at about uh, 10.25 thereabouts. Firstly, a thank you to all of our annual sponsors. Without people like this, we would never be able to hold these events, and particularly the free events. And specifically, the, we'd like to, to say thank you to Rosond and Index as event sponsors for today. 
some housekeeping. Please, people, first and foremost, keep your video and your microphone off during the, the presentations. It is extremely frustrating for speakers if there is noise in the background. Please raise your hand if you want to ask a question. You can also type into the, the chat function your question there. There are CPD credits for the day, eight credits, which would be in the category one SACNAS uh, points or mm -hmm. formal learning to the, the GSSA. And this one is particularly important. Make sure to name yourself if you want to get a certificate of attendance. I need your name and your surname if you're going to get a certificate. But a number of people who I can see here on the list who have just got a first name, please put a surname into it. There are also one or two people who are identified by their cell phone or other device that they are attending. I cannot give a certificate to a device. So please make sure you name yourself correctly. Okay, so without much further ado, I'm going to hand over to Chelsea to speak to us about um, Rosond. Chelsea, if you, I see there you are. Okay, do you want to share your screen, Chelsea, or are you just going to talk? Uh, Chelsea, your microphone is not working. Can you hear me now? There we can hear you now, yes, that's perfect. Fantastic, sorry about that. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm gonna share with you for five minutes a bit of what Rosan does. It's wonderful to see an amazing turnout on this seminar, wow. Well done for all showing up. Um, thanks for having us, Tanya. Rosan has been around for over 65 years and um, we've evolved with the mining industry. So I wish my memory was as good as some of the veterans in our industry. So I'm gonna to refer to my notes as I explain to you what our service offering is. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to drop them in the chat box and I'll address them uh, in the chat box afterwards. So thanks. Roson provides safe, fast, efficient, and cost-effective drilling and grouting services to mining and exploration industries throughout Africa. For over 65 years, we've applied advanced design and engineering disciplines to create client-specific solutions our state-of-the-art in-house manufacturing facilities provide products designed and engineered to meet our clients' specific demands. While our experienced team of engineers and artisans ensure, ensure a solution in keeping with global best practice. So our organization, our organization uh, expands across surface and underground drilling operations. In our underground operations, we do underground drilling with smaller drilling rigs. We also do pack grouting, which provides grout support to areas that have been blasted out from under the mine. I'm gonna focus in this instance on our surface drilling operations where we have seen a lot of growth and a lot of innovation and development in the past two years. We have a fleet of over 50 combined old and new generation surface drilling rigs spread across two contract sites in South Africa. And on these contracts, we employ over 400 people. We currently have surface drilling exploration contracts with major mining houses, such as Anglo-Americans Kumba Iron Ore, Anglo Platinum, De Beers, and Debswana in Botswana. And we've serviced most of South Africa's blue chip mining houses, expanding our operations over our several decades of existence. Roslan has positioned our business for the future, using technology to improve operational effectiveness and find alternative solutions for our clients. In making this shift and transforming digitally 
the application of integrated discipline project management and continuous innovations in our technology give us the leading edge in the industry, known for its generally slow uptake in technology. Our surface drilling operations contribute significantly to our company's operations, and these consist of diamond core drilling, percussion drilling, RC and grade control, and uh, Mr. Colin Rice can teach you a lot about all these different methods. Each type of drilling serves a particular purpose for Rosen's mining clients, such as greenfield exploration to discover new deposits, brownfields projects to augment existing life of mines. Great control drilling, on the other hand, aims to acquire new geological information and metallurgical information to inform current mining activities. Rosen's machines for each drilling type are standard and interchangeable in terms of platforms, engines and spare parts and our in-house Rocal brand of machine has been in existence for decades and undergone operational and safety improvements over time. And now it is being replaced by new gen drill rigs with automated rod handling systems, remote operator cabins, and telemetry systems to record critical data while drilling. The benefit is that our new rigs contribute to improved safety while data from telemetry systems is used to improve operational efficiencies to better understand machine capability, as well as being useful for value-added geoscientific and mining analyses and decision-making by the client. On our machines, the in-hole telemetry sensors record big data sets in real time. And this is as close as it gets compared to with how oil and gas industries acquire and handle similar data in real time. An important part of Roson's mandate is employee development as well, which is critical to ensure that required performance levels are maintained. Here we have training and skills development translated into a personal development plan, which is key to close any performance gaps. For example, each of our operators is subjected to formal OEM accredited training, proficiency grading and certification to operate just that drill machine. And this is a big this is a big journey considering we have a variety of drill machines, which each person needs specific training for each one. Operator proficiency is enhanced further by on-the-job practical training and any potential for leadership ability is identified. And this is part of our career pathing as well. So it's not just about our machines, it's about our people and where they're headed in the drilling world. And um, you may have seen in the news recently, our, our new technology machines have enabled women to form part of drilling crews. So we've, we, we believe it's an African first. On our surface exploration contracts, we now have women part of our drilling crew. So we're very proud of that. We're proud of the technology. We're proud of where we're going. We're proud to work with our clients and we're proud of where our journey is going in terms of digital development. Um, and that is what I have to say about Roson. So please do follow us on LinkedIn. You're welcome to follow me on LinkedIn as well for any of your questions. Rosond is a easy, easy, um, easy thing to find, R-O-S-O-N-D. Thanks very much, everyone, and enjoy the coursework today. Take it all in. Thank you very much, Chelsea, and thanks once again to <clears throat> for the um, sponsorship of this course. Colin, we now I'd like to, to hand over to you. Um, what geologists need to know about practical drilling? Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, can, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, we can hear you and see your screen. All good. That is fantastic. Thanks, Chelsea, for that uh, that introduction to to Rosant. I um, I'm I'm very lucky, as Tanya said earlier. Um, I've I've been involved in the, the 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 drilling industry for for many many years, thirty six odd years now, and and Rosant were one of the very first companies I did work with way back in nineteen eighty four. Um, and if you look at the pictures that Tanya had up of uh, myself and Massey and Nolene, um, I promise you we don't look like that. Um, it's amazing what you can do with Photoshop. So, so thanks for keeping those young photos there, uh, uh, Tanya. Okay, guys, uh, we've got a chunk uh, uh, to get through today. First of all, thanks everyone for, for joining and congratulations to Tanya and her team for putting together the, the a most amazing uh, uh, collection of people. It's absolutely incredible the numbers of people that have that have registered for this this course. And um, and well done to you. It's an incredible service to to the exploration industry. And well done. And we look forward to doing this for for many many more years. 
Guys, what, what I'm going to try and talk to you about today in a very, very short period of time is, 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 um, is to give you an idea of, of what we believe uh, a geologist needs to know about drilling. Um, and, and this is really, really hard to do this in a very short period of time. So, so I've kind of condensed things, a little bit of technical stuff, a little bit of uh, philo philosophical stuff, if you like. Um, and uh, and we're going to try and try and get through this now. Just as 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 Chelsea was chatting there, I could see on the uh, uh, on the screen the people who who have joined this this course, and I see some some people who are not new geologists. They are they are well practiced geologists, people I've worked with for many many years. Um, so so I, I hope they've come to maybe um, refresh their memories, possibly. Um, but I'm going to keep this presentation fairly fundamental from the point of view of um, 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 uh, the, the, the depth that we, we're going into. And I'm going to assume that we're all newish geos. I must preface all of this by saying that I'm not a geologist. I'm, I used to be a maths teacher uh, back in the, in the good old days. Um, but I'm not a geologist, but I do work a lot with, with geos. So what I want to do is to, is to try and give you a, a, an outline of what I believe, based on my years of experience and the work that I do with mining companies and exploration contractors, um, uh, an idea of what I believe you need to know about drilling. So that as you as you move through your careers, you develop your career as a geologist, you you maybe focus on, on these issues that, that I will that I will highlight. So just to start off with, we, we know that all geological information is founded on, on rocks. Um, whether it's a chip or, a, or a, a, a core sample, it's all founded on rocks. And so we, we, we have to drill holes in the Earth's surface. And, and thank goodness we do, else we wouldn't have, have work. Um, so, so drilling is a critically important part of a geologist's life. And the, the, a, a deep understanding of drilling is I believe is a core competence of, of every geologist. And uh, a great deal of the work that I'm involved in is, is involved in solving problems which really stem from misunderstandings between geos and, and contractors. And, and very often geos don't understand how a contractor works and, and even more often contractors don't understand what a geologist wants. Um, and so you have these conflicts, and, and very often I get involved in trying to sort those, those conflicts out. Um, we must all understand that, that drilling is, is a complex operation. It involves high-powered machinery, and there's been a massive shift in, what, in maybe the last seven or eight years, maybe even less. For mining companies to move away from the old uh, mechanical manual type of draw rigs to automated draw rigs. And, and while this is great, it's fantastic, um, we, we must never lose sight of the fact that um, these, these machines cost significant amounts of money. They don't suit every drilling operation. Um, uh, um, green fields, remote in jungle operations on mountaintops, it's very, very hard to get this equipment in there. So, so we must be very, very aware that um, a lot of the new developments that are taking place, uh, um, while they are fantastic, they improve safety, they improve productivity, we, we must understand that they're not universally applicable in, in, in all exploration uh, uh, projects. Um, so, so we can get from different methods drilling. We're going to talk about drilling methods in, in, in a minute. I just want to try and set the scene of what we're trying to do in this, uh, in, in this period this morning. There are many, many, many different methods of drilling and many different techniques of drilling. I'll explain to you just now the difference between the two. And basically these techniques, these different methods and techniques will produce either a chip sample or a coarse sample. And the geo needs to, needs to uh, determine, obviously before you start drilling, whether you want a chip sample or a coarse sample. Um, and they will they will fit into different uh, uh, um, stages of the exploration project. In early uh, stage uh, exploration projects, a chip sample would be fine. It, it will be adequate for what we want to do. But in later stage projects, we have to have core samples. 
Um, and so it will move into a much more expensive, much more lengthy, much more complex core drilling uh, uh, exercise. So what do you need to know about this? What does a geo need to know about? Uh, and, and, and this summary has based on, on, on the work I've done over many, many years working with geos and, and, and mining companies. I believe the first thing a geo needs to know is you need to have a good understanding of different methods of drilling. You need to understand what the method can do and more importantly, what it can't do. Frequently, I come across situations where geo has, has in his head uh, that you can drill from here to Australia uh, uh, in two and a half days. Well, you can't. Um, and we have this, this, this misunderstanding. Very often, let's be fair, sometimes it comes from contractors promising more than they can deliver. Um, but, but you need to have a good understanding of different methods of drilling, what they can do and what they can't do. What they can't do is sometimes the most important part. Then the next most important thing I, need, I think a geo needs to understand are the factors that affect the representativity and the quality of samples that you produce. Um, uh, drilling is expensive, uh, irrespective of the method of drilling. It's expensive, and you drill to get a quality, a, a sample of the best quality that you possibly can. And very often, there are many, many factors that affect the quality of that sample. And representativity, I'll just very, very quickly talk about what I believe representativity means. Representativity has got two components to it. It means that the sample we get is truly representative of the in-situ rock that we've drilled. And number two, that it comes from a known depth. That word depth is, is very important in exploration drilling. And I can tell you right now that based on many years of working in the industry, very often whole depths are misreported very often. Um, and one of the key things that Geo needs to understand is how you measure the depth of a borehole. And if you don't, we can chat about it later. I haven't included it in this little presentation. So we need to understand the factors that affect the quality of the samples you get, because very often I see Geos get delivered samples that are of poor quality. There's ground core, there's uh, mixed chip samples, there's uh, 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 inaccurate RC sampling. So you need to understand that uh, because you need to control uh, the, the quality of what you get, get given. Then third, many people argue this is the, should be the first thing in the list. You have to have a very good understanding of safety aspects of drilling. In South Africa, a geologist um, has a very significant safety responsibility. In other parts of the world, they don't. Um, I, was, I was chatting with you guys. So can somebody turn their mic off there, please, guys? Um, in, um, I was telling to doing a little course for some guys in Canada recently, and, and this particular company, their geos didn't have a great safety responsibility at all. But, but just your, your, your duty of care says that you need to have a good understanding of safety aspects of drilling. So that's a, another aspect. That involves your legal responsibilities and liability as well. In South Africa, it's very well defined. We've got very defined legislation. I'm not going to talk about it today because we've got people from all over the world in this, in this course. But you need to know your legal responsibilities and your legal liability. What happens if you drop the ball? What happens if you do something that injures someone or, 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 or God forbid, causes a fatality? And then the fifth thing that I think you need to know is you need to understand the factors that affect the cost of drilling. You need to understand how a contractor makes money. And I'm going to talk a little bit later. I'm going to have to, uh, 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 hopefully we'll get to, to the last parts of, of this course today. Um, uh, um, the geo has a very, very big impact on whether the contractor can or cannot make money. And let me say something here that, that we'll talk about as we go through. We'll repeat it a few more times. A contractor has to make money. He has to make money. And I often say to geos, part of your job is to make sure that he makes money. If he's a poor contractor, he should not have gotten the work in the first place. And that's not his fault. That's your fault. He should never have gotten the work. But if he's a good contractor, he must make money. He must make a profit. And you must do whatever you can to assist him to make a profit. And, and that might sound a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, um, offbeat, but I promise you it's, it's true. And I'll explain in some more detail later. So I believe 
geos need to know about these things. And if you if you then analyze them, I think we can break it down into, into three categories of, of knowledge, if you like, technical safety and economic. And I'm going to try and get through all of this, all of this today. Okay. Um, as I said, I believe that that a successful exploration project will flow from a, a clear understanding with the geo and the contractor are in sync, where they understand each other's requirements. I think we have the makings of a of a good of a good contract. So the first thing I want to talk about here quickly, I'm going to rush through this, guys. Well, not rush through it, but but we've got a lot to get through, and I'm going to go through this uh, 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 hopefully uh, uh, quickly enough that we can get to the end of of, of today. Geologists must understand some fundamentals of drilling. They must understand how different drilling methods work. And one of the most fundamental things, and I come across this oddly enough very, very often in, in drilling operations, where even experienced people don't understand these basic fundamentals. Every drilling operation, every method of drilling that you will ever come across anywhere in the world in your entire life will involve a drill bit that is put in contact with a rock and a drill string. And the drill string is made up of drill rods or lengths of what we call drill pipe. Um, they are typically three or six or nine or 12 meters in length. In the oil and gas industry, they're even longer, but typically in our industry, they're three or six meters uh, uh, long. And the bit is put in contact with a rock. It is rotated. And at the same time, we put load on the bit, we push down onto that drill bit, and the drill bit fractures the rock. The pure function, the only function of the drill bit is to cause the rock to fragment, to cause rock failure. And that happens in different ways that we might get around to talking about just now. And the purpose of the drill string is it provides rotation, it provides torque to the bit, it allows you to put weight on the bit, it allows you to push down and put load on the bit. And also something very, very critically important is all drill strings are hollow, it's tube. So it's got a hole in the middle. And through the tube, through the drill string, we pump a drilling fluid. And that drilling fluid flows down the drill string, past the face of the bit, and up the side of the borehole, what we call the annulus. That is the space between the borehole wall and the drill string. And the purpose of that drilling fluid is to remove the drilled cuttings, the chips that we create, the fragmented rock uh, from, from the borehole. And every single drilling method involves those basic principles. If you're drilling a hole in the wall to hang a picture up, or drilling a hole in a piece of wood, or drilling a four kilometer deep hole uh, to explore for gold, those same fundamental principles apply. And all that varies really, guys, is the nature of the drill bit and the drill rods that we put on. And we will select a drill bit according to the purpose of our drilling project. So if you look, for example, here, let me try and get my little, my little laser pointer here. I think this will work. This bit on the left-hand side is what's called a tricone bit. Widely used in oil and gas exploration, very widely used in drilling blast holes on open cast mines, in surface mines. Um, and, and this drill bit, as you can see, it's a, what we call a full face drill bit. So when this bit drills, the entire volume of rock is fragmented. And so we call that a full hole drill bit. The bit on the right uh, is, a, is a polycrystalline diamond drill bit, also a full face drill bit, widely used in oil and gas exploration um, and, and production holes. Again, it's a full hole bit. So the entire borehole becomes chip sample. This bit at the top in the middle is what we call a drag bit. The, the one on the right, we also call that a drag bit. It's got three wings on it, three, um, three legs, if you like. Um, and in this particular case, it's got tungsten carbide cutting elements. We call that a drag bit. Um, and then this bit at the bottom, it's got a hole in the middle, and that's a diamond core bit. So in this type of drill bit, this part here where you can see these natural diamonds uh, on what we call the kerf of the bit, the, 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 the circular part, uh, the, the, uh, the cutting part of the bit, if you like, um, the central part becomes core, and it's only that part where the diamonds are that becomes that becomes cutting. So all that varies really in different methods of drilling is the type of drill bit that we use. And we'll talk about this one just now. So let's look about look at, at, at what I consider to be the most fundamental and most important part of understanding drilling methods. In every drilling method, guys, anywhere in the world, wherever you drill, whatever you drill, 
you have to have rotation of the cutting elements. So it's the most fundamental feature of every drilling operation. So we, we put the bit in contact with the rock and we rotate it. The speed of rotation varies according to the bit and various other factors, but in every drilling operation, we have to rotate the drill bit. So rotation is one of the key elements. And there's different ways. There's different types of drill rig that provide that rotation in different ways. We're not going to go into that now, but there are different types of, of methods or different uh, uh, mechanisms, if you like, for imparting that rotation to the, to the drill bit. Then the second essential feature that is common to every method of drilling is thrust or weight on bit or bit load. All of these things, they, they, they mean the same thing, and I tend to use them interchangeably. We cannot just put the bit in contact with the rock and rotate it. We need to put load on the bit. We've got to push down onto the bit so that there is some pressure um, on, on the, uh, uh, between the, the cutting elements and the rock face that we, that we are drilling. And we call that bit weight or bit thrust or bit load. And it's very important. Again, different types of drill bit will require different levels of, of, of bit load. And we need to understand what those different levels of bit load are. The third feature that is common to every drilling operation is what we call a bit weight control system. Sometimes when we drill, the, the rock is extremely hard. We've got to push hard. Sometimes it's softer. And we've got to push with less weight. And the drill rig has got to have the ability to alter that weight on bit. If we can't alter the weight on bit, we're going to damage the bit. We're going to cause deflection in the hold and all sorts of other problems that we won't talk about now. But we have to have this, what we call a bit weight control system. Then the fourth system, the fourth essential element of every drilling operation is a hoisting system. At some point in time, <clears throat> the drill bit is going to be finished. We're going to have to pull it out the hole, change the bit, uh, put a new bit on, and go back into the hole and continue drilling. And that can happen multiple times in, in, in the life of a borehole. We might have to hoist for other reasons as well. But we have to have the drill rig. Our drilling operation is going to have the ability to pull and lower what we call rod tripping. It's got to be able to trip drill rods, pull and lower drill rods. It's a critical feature of every drilling operation, every drilling method. We've got to have the ability to hoist. And that function is provided by the drill rig. And many, many mining companies believe that, uh, um, that drill rig hoisting is the most uh, dangerous part of, of a drilling operation. It's not, uh, but we tend to think it is. And so we, we push very, very hard um, for, uh, for rod handling systems. Rod handling systems where you remove human beings um, uh, from the operation and the, and the operation is done mechanically. Um, they're fantastic, wonderful, huge uh, uh, strides in, in, in reducing manual labor, but it is not the most dangerous operation on a drill rig, uh, not by far, uh, but we, we, we think it is, um, but we'll talk about that later. So when we pull rods out the hole, <clears throat> when we trip the drill rods, we pull them out either as what we call singles or multiples or, or stands. So if we, for example, are drilling with three meter drill rods, I could either pull my rods out three meters at a time, or if my drill rig allows it, I can pull out six meters at a time. In other words, two rods at a time, what we call a stand. And typically we would stack these drill rods horizontally, either on a, a rod sloop, a, a trailer of some sort, a, a rod carrier, or we'll stack them on, 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 on racks like this. Now, fortunately for us, we don't do this anymore. Um, and again, this is one of the problems that we frequently see, and, and geologists, by your training, should be able to multiply. Uh, one of the things in the drilling industry, people can't multiply. And, and so we don't understand the mass of the steel that we put out of a hole. This rig here, for example, on the left-hand side, uh, this was a rig in, in South Africa uh, uh, a while ago, a number of years ago, I went to do an audit at. And these guys were drilling this drill pipe that you can see here. This is what's called BQ drill rod. It weighs six kilograms per meter. And this hole was 1,650 meters deep. 1,650 times six is about 10 tons, roughly. So there's about 10 tons, 10,000 kilograms of steel laying on these little rod racks that you see here. And nobody batted an eyelid. Nobody thought anything about it. 
nobody realized how much weight there was. Now, 10 tons, a small, medium-sized car weighs about one and a half tons. That's about six or seven cars sitting on those little rod racks. Um, I don't think I would do that. Um, I don't think I'd put that much weight on, on those rod racks. So in the old days, um, when I first started the industry, we did not lay rods horizontally. We stacked them vertically in the mast. Now, there's many reasons why we don't do that now. But it's essentially in South Africa, it's banned. We're not allowed to do that. And again, we're not going to go into this in any detail. But I can tell you right now, if you want to afterwards, I'll sit down, I'll explain it to you. Stacking rods horizontally is much more dangerous than stacking them vertically. People think that stacking rods vertically, like you see in the right-hand side here, is dangerous. Um, if it's done properly, it's not. Um, but, but because we drill many angled holes, we can't stack in the mast and so on. So we stack rods uh, uh, um, uh, uh, horizontally. But these are safety issues that geos need to understand, safety and productivity issues. And we, we can't go into all the detail now, but, but please bear that in mind. The, th the fifth, the last of the essential features of every drilling operation is a flushing system. In every drilling operation, we fragment rock. This bit down at the bottom, whichever type of bit it is, doesn't matter, it fragments rock. It creates what we call drilled cutting. Guys, please don't call it sludge. It's drilled cutting. It's rock that we've drilled. And we've got to get those rock chips they vary in size, but we get those rock chips out the hole. So we pump down the middle of the drill string. We pump a flushing medium, a drilling fluid. It's either air or water. Let me rephrase that. It's either air-based or water-based. And we pump that drilling fluid down the drill string. It flows past the face of the bit, picks up the cutting, and then transports the cutting to, to surface. And that is an incredibly important part of, of the whole operation. And I'll tell you right now, but as a geo, you're going to come across in-hole problems you maybe are already on projects you work on. And I can tell you 95% of the problems, the in-hole problems that occur in drilling operations occur because of poor hole cleaning, because people don't understand how much cutting we generate when we drill a bore hole and how important it is that that cutting comes out. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a slide or two. So we drill either with water or with, with air. If we drill with water, we will have a, a sump. We will have reservoirs of some type. They'll either be earthen sumps, in other words, holes dug in the ground, or they'll be above ground sumps. They'll be tanks or some sort of uh, a reticulation system above ground. But the principle's the same. We'll have a circulation pump, a positive displacement pump. We'll suck drilling fluid out of the reservoir. We'll deliver it down the drill string, it flows past the bit and up the annulus uh, um, to surface. If it's a, a water-based system, we'll generally recycle that. So it'll flow through a series of troughs and sumps to help settle the cutting out. It'll then flow back into that main sump where it's, it's then re recycled. So we have this recycle system. If we're drilling with air, we, we don't have a water pump, we have an air pump which we call a compressor. And the compressor sucks atmospheric air into it. It compresses it and then delivers that high pressure air down the drill string. And in this case, exactly the same thing happens. But with air, the air blows the cutting to surface. It can't carry it. It's got no carrying capacity. So it blows the cutting to surface. And so that leads us to two very important differences. If we're drilling with a drilling fluid that is water-based, we talk about what we call the annular velocity. And that is the velocity of the fluid, the speed of the fluid as it flows up the annulus. In other words, from the bit to, to the collar, to the sur to surface. And typically, we want the annular velocity to be between 30 and 50 meters per minute, roughly in that range. If it's too low, if our velocity is below 30, we have a danger of not being able to clear the, the cutting quickly enough. We might not get all the cutting out the hole. If the annular velocity is too high, then the fluid flowing up the side of the borehole becomes erosive and it can cause hole enlargement. I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. That is the biggest problem and probably the cause of 95% of in-hole problems is hole enlargement because we've got the wrong Annular velocity, our pump rate is wrong, and so we cause this hole enlargement, what we call washouts. 
if we're drilling with air, air's got no carrying capacity. So now we need a much higher velocity. Um, and I won't talk about this now, but when we talk about air, we talk about what we call an upper hole velocity. So we want uh, a, a much higher speed in order to get the, the, the cuttings out of the hole. It's going to blow the cutting out the, out the hole. I can't get into this, but if anybody comes on, on, on the longer courses we do, either the, the drilling methods and techniques course we do for the Geological Society or any of our certificate programs that we offer, I talk a great deal about the flushing system. Um, it is without a question the most important part of a drilling operation and without a doubt the, the most poorly understood amongst contractors and, and, uh, and geologists. Um, okay. Um, why, why, why is this so important? Very quickly, let's put one little slide in here just to, to illustrate what I'm getting at. If you look at the picture on the left, whether we're drilling with air or water, it doesn't matter. If my hole is engaged, in other words, it's, it's the same diameter or very close to the same diameter from, from, from the bottom to the collar, then, then the annual velocity will be constant from bottom to top. It shouldn't vary. If, however, I've got a washout, if the hole is enlarged for some reason, that might be a water sensitive zone, it might have been a caving zone, um, whatever the case. But if the hole is enlarged, then from the bit up to the, um, sorry, I'm trying to get my mouse to work, then from the bit face up to the start of the washout, my annular velocity will be perfect. But as the fluid enters the washed out zone, the volume of that zone increases and so therefore my velocity will reduce. And the velocity in this washed out zone will be reduced. And the cutting that we have evacuated, that we've taken up to that point, literally is in suspension. It sits there in the borehole until we switch the pump off for whatever reason, and that cutting then falls back to, back to bottom. Borehole enlargement is a huge problem, and please, I want you to, to try to, uh, to remember that. The last little bit of basic I want to talk about here before we start talking about uh, uh, some, uh, some more technical stuff. Some people said that geos sometimes don't understand too, too carefully. I want to just two minutes talk about how we design a borehole. When we design a borehole, um, we, have a, we have a target depth that we want to get to, and we will drill uh, um, a bigger diameter through the top weathered section of the hole, what we call the overburden. So we'll drill a largest diameter through there, and I've tried to show you that in my very, very good PowerPoint picture here. Um, we'll then pull that, uh, uh, that, that bit and drill string out, and I will run in the second picture a string of casing. Casing is nothing more than, than a tube, a steel tube or PVC tube, depends upon the depth and the purpose of the hole. And the purpose of that casing is purely and simply to maintain the integrity of the top of the hole, to stop the hole caving in and causing problems. I will then take a smaller size bit with a smaller size drill string, and I'll then advance through the, the bottom of the casing. And I will continue my hole, hopefully, to target depth. But sometimes I will hit a geological issue uh, it might be caving ground, it might be a water sensitive zone, it might be a great big circulation loss, um, but I will reach something that is going to prevent me advancing the borehole, or it's going to dramatically increase the risk of completing the borehole. And so what I might do then is we might have to run another string of casing. So in other words, I pull that drill string out and I run another string of of, of, of steel, uh, uh, um, steel casing, steel tubing in to case off that uh, uh, um, that problematic zone that we've seen. I will then take have to take a smaller drill string, a smaller bit and smaller drill string, and then drill through that second string of casing. And this is essentially how we design balls. The principle here is this, guys, is we, we always design boreholes from the bottom up. So as a geo, based on the, on the nature of, the, of, of what you're looking for um, and your, your, your assay or, or testing techniques, you will um, um, uh, have a certain minimum core size, a certain minimum sample size that you want at target depth at, at the bottom of the hole. And so you will, based on your knowledge of the lithology, your knowledge of the potential risks in the hole, you'll say, okay, we need one casing string or two casing strings. So we don't need a casing string at all. And so you'll design the hole from, from bottom up. So that's, that's important for you to remember uh, um, as well. Okay. 
Um, all right, so we've got five essential elements. And guys, if you remember this, you've, you've made a good start to understanding how a drilling operation works. So when you look at a drilling operation, you go to any operation, whether it's an RC operation, surface, underground, diamond drilling, blast hole drilling, it doesn't matter. Look at that operation and ask yourselves, how do we get rotation? How do they put thrust on the bit? How do they control the, the weight um, on, 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 on the bit? How do they hoist draw rods and what type of flushing system are they used? Are, are, are they using in this operation? It's only five things you address. And if you understand those about a drilling operation, it will help you to understand a lot more the, 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 uh, the, the, the more complex issues that, that come up. Okay, very quickly, very, very quickly. The next bit of fundamental knowledge you need to have is we need to understand how different bits make whole. Every drilling operation involves fragmenting rock. We've got to fragment rock. And the more quickly, the more efficiently we can fragment that rock, the, the, the more quickly we can drill. And so we, we have just a rough understanding. This is quite complex. I'm going to rush through this quite, quite, quite quickly. There are three mechanical ways that we can make rock fail. We can crush rock, we can shear rock, and we can abrade rock. We can, we can make rock fail chemically, but that's, we don't use that in, in, in drilling applications. So, so we've got three mechanical ways that we can make rock fail. Let's look at each of them in turn. The first way is we can crush rock. So we take something like a, a bit like we saw earlier, what we call a tricone bit. This one obviously is upside down. We put it in contact with a, with a formation. We put huge amounts of load. But this is a big full face bit. Because it's a full face bit, we've got to put a huge amount of load on it. We've got to push down with a, with a, with a, a lot of force and we simultaneously rotate the bit. And these little cutting elements you see here, these are tungsten carbide teeth. Um, and those teeth literally uh, 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 penetrate the formation. They cause the formation to crack and spoil and for a cutting to develop. And as the bit rotates, those teeth constantly create new cracks and new and new cutting. But it's a it's a it's a crushing action. And and we know that this bit will not make whole, it cannot cause failure of the rock unless the load we apply exceeds the compressive strength of the rock. So the greater the compressive strength of the rock the higher the load we need, the greater the weight on bit we need to make these, these bits cut. Um, I'm going to come back to that later. The second way that we can make rock fail is we can shear it. So if you take a bit like I've got on the, on the right here, what we call a drag bit, you might remember that from earlier, we've got three wings on this bit. You can't see the third one, it's stuck at the back there. We put this in contact with the rock and we rotate it. And the cutting elements slide across the rock face, very similar to a knife sliding through butter, and you get the shearing action. It's not a crushing action, it's a shearing action. So it's a slightly different type of, 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 of cutting action um, in, in this case. And these blades, the cutting elements, the stuff that does the work, it can be steel, it can be tungsten carbide, it can be polycrystalline diamond, it can be a number of different uh, um, uh, cutting elements, depending upon the type of rock that you, that you are, are, are cutting. And then the third way that we can make rock fail is we can abrade rock. And this is the cutting action, the cutting uh, mechanism that, that a diamond bit uses. And on the left-hand side there, you, you've got a, um, a, 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 what we call an impregnated diamond bit where the diamonds in that cutting structure um, are synthetic diamonds that look like, looks like yellow sugar. Uh, made in a made in a factory, um, a synthetic diamond. The bit on the right, these diamonds here um, are, are natural diamonds. Diamonds mined in a in a diamond mine and then set into a um, into a, into a bit body. But these cutting elements are relatively small, and they cut in a similar way to sandpaper or emery paper. So they rely on the rotational speed. They rotate very very fast, so that those small cutting elements can abrade away the rock. So we drill here with very high rotational speed, but very low weight on bit. Because they're diamonds, we don't want big weight because we're going to cause the diamonds to fracture and we lose our cutting ability. So it's a, it's a, 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 a high speed, low weight type of, of cutting action. And so you can see then 
Sorry, guys, why is my mouse not working? Bear with me one second. Every now and then this, this does it. Um, so a diamond bit with very, very fine cutting elements lends itself to drilling hard rock. And so we use diamonds in, in core bits. Um, and hopefully you're gonna get core a little bit more like the one on the left rather than the, than the one on, on, on the right. And so if we, if we summarize this quickly, we've got three mechanisms to make rock break. We can crush it, we can shear it, we can abrade it. Um, and as long as you've got a basic understanding of that, um, you will then be able to understand how different methods of, of drilling work. We can't spend too much more time on that, uh, um, unfortunately. Okay, so let's get down to the, the nitty gritty. Let's get down to the, the, the more important part of what I wanted to chat today. We've got an understanding. We know that there's five essential elements in every single drilling method you will ever come across anywhere in your life. And there are three ways that we can, we can make rock break. And one of the things that I find most frustrating, in fact, it's probably the most frustrating thing that I've come across in, in the 36 years I've been working in the drilling industry, is, is we call things different names. And it causes massive confusion. Um, for example, in uh, uh, I was talking to some Australian guys the other day, and they talk about, about air drilling. Um, well, when you talk about air drilling, it means, to me, it means you, you've got a compressor, you're flushing with air. And I can drill, I can use air to flush many, many different drilling, in diff, many, many different drilling methods. So it doesn't, I know what they mean. Uh, in South Africa, uh, we talk about percussion drilling. We talk about RC drilling. Those terms are wrong. Um, and, and I get a bit pedantic about it, a bit, uh, a bit like an old person, but, but there's very good reason for it. So I believe one of the key things that geos need to understand, one of the key things we must all agree on, is a nomenclature, a naming system, a classification of drilling methods. And I've got a very simple method here. And if you can remember this, this is, this is great. Um, uh, um, it'll help us to, to maybe when we talk about things, we know exactly what we're talking about. We can classify the left-hand side here, there are these four blocks. I believe the best way to classify methods of drilling is to classify them by the rock, the, 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 the rock breaking mechanism. So we've got pure percussion methods of drilling. We're not going to talk about them, but we've got pure percussion methods of drilling where the bit is made purely to, to hammer. There's no rotation. It's purely a hammering action. And, and the bit uh, penetrates the rock, creates chips, and, and so, we, and so we, make, we make holes. So we've got pure percussion methods of drilling. Then we've got pure rotary methods of drilling. Uh, diamond drilling, where we drill with a core bit. Is a, is a rotary drilling method. There's no percussion, there's no hammering action. Um, it's a pure rotary drilling method. Then we've got a combination of the two. We've got what we call rotary percussion methods, where we have both the percussive action and a rot and, and rotation of, of the drill bit. So those three basic things there cover all of the methods of drilling that we co commonly come across. So if you take, for example, rotary drilling, I'm not going to talk about percussion, guys. We'll just leave that out for the time being. Okay. When we're at rotary drilling, for example, I can, I can distinguish two different techniques of rotary drilling. Rotary drilling is a method, but there's two different techniques. I can use a full face bit, a tricone bit or a drag bit, and I would call that full hole rotary drilling. Then we've got diamond core drilling, where we use a different type of bit, uh, a, a bit with a, with a hole in the middle, a, a core bit. They're both rotary drilling methods, but they are different techniques. We've got different equipment, we've got different weight on bit, we've got different drill rods, we might have different flushing systems, but they are rotary drilling methods. Similarly, we've got different rotary percussion methods. We've got rotary percussion methods where we have a drill string with a bit at the bottom, and the percussive action happens at the top of the drill string. So we've got a hammer that hammers at the top. The energy wave is transferred through the drill string into the bit. The bit crushes rock, and then we flush the, the chips to surface. Or we have what's called a downhole hammer technique. we at the bottom of the hole, just above the bit, we've got a hammer, and that hammer hammers the bit. And then we've got another rotary percussion technique, 
which is very, very important to us. What is commonly called RC in the exploration industry, it's not RC drilling, it's called dual tube RC drilling. I'll explain that to you just now. So the point I'm trying to make here, guys, is we've got def defined methods of drilling and we have got different techniques. So it's the method that's slightly altered, if that makes sense to you. Okay, so I want you to please bear, bear that in mind as we, as we go through this, all right? Um, okay, so let's look at a couple of these methods. I'm not going to go into massive detail because we're going to run out of time, and I'm looking at my clock very, very carefully here. Um, um, I want to just talk about these just in, in rough, broad terms, okay, just so you get an idea of, of how the method works, the principles of operation, and, and to some extent, what the, um, the capabilities of each of these methods are. So let's look quickly. Let's start with rotor percussion drilling, and we'll end up with, with diamond drilling, okay. As we said here, there's, there's, there's two main kinds of, of rotor percussion drilling. This is where we've got both rotation and a hammering action, a percussive action. We've got what we call top hole hammer and down hole hammer. So we've got two systems here. Either we have a, a drill string with a bit at the bottom. Let me get my little pointer back. We've got a drill string with a bit at the bottom. And the hammering action takes place at the top of the borehole. I'm not going to explain how that happens now. It's beyond what we're talking about today. But we, we make the hammering action at the top. And the energy wave it travels through the drill string into the bit. The second way is what we call a downhole hammer system where the hammering action takes place at the bottom of the hole. So we can have a 300 meter deep hole, but the hammering action still takes place at the bottom. Obviously the energy transfer in a downhole hammer is more efficient than in a top hole hammer. And so it has certain advantages and, and disadvantages. Um, we, we can't go into that in too much detail now. But this downhole hammer the system that I've spoken about on the left, it's, it's a pneumatic system. So we blow high pressure compressed air through the drill string. The drill string enters the hammer, that bottom part of the drill string. And essentially that high pressure compressed air causes a piston to reciprocate. And I've got it shown schematically here on the right hand side. So that piston moves up and down very, very fast, very, very high frequency anything from 900 to 1200 blows per minute. So very, very high frequency. And every time it comes down, it hits the drill bit, transfers an energy wave through the bit. The buttons of the bit penetrate the rock, cause the rock to fracture. The air then blows the cutting past the bit and back up to, to surface. That's the basic principle of a tunnel hammer. It is a pneumatic tool. Um, and uh, um, so therefore it relies on high pressure compressed air. And the higher the pressure of the air, the more efficient this, this hammer will, will, will be in, in drilling. Okay. Um, there are many, many, many different sizes, uh, diameters of downhill hammer, many, many different designs. There's dozens of manufacturers of downhill hammers around the world. They all have different designs, different things in the inside of them. But the important thing for you to remember, guys, is that there's only two parts really that are important, the bit and the piston, all this other stuff that you see here. This is just one example of, of, of a hammer. All of the other stuff, all that does is it makes the piston reciprocate. That's all it does. So the principles of every dial hammer are the same. High pressure compressed air, piston that reciprocates, strikes a bit. The same air that makes the piston work escapes at the bit and blows the cutting to, to surface. They all work in exactly the same way. We won't talk about that now. Very, very quickly, the, 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 the main working part, or one of the key main working parts of, of a down old hammer are the drill bits. And drill bits vary in design. Uh, in uh, these, these little buttons that we see here, these are tungsten carbide buttons. We can vary the diameter of the button. We can vary the shape of the button. We can vary how they are arranged. On the, on the bit face, there's all sorts of variations that can take place to suit a particular drilling condition, to suit um, either a hardness or an abrasiveness uh, of, of a particular rock. Um, and we certainly won't go into that. And as a geo, you want to stay well clear of this. You leave this kind of stuff to, uh, uh, to the contractor to, to understand. Um, um, okay, I'm not going to talk too much about that because we're going we're to run out of time. 
I want to talk now quickly about the next um, rotary percussion method of drilling. Let me go back one slide quickly, guys. Bear with me one second. I'm sorry. You will all agree, I'm sure, <clears throat> that if we're using <clears throat> a downhole hammer, the air going down the drill pipe, you see I've got it blue here because it's clean air, if that makes sense. It enters the hammer, the piston reciprocates, strikes the bit, the bit crushes the rock, and the rock is then blown up the annulus, the rock chips. You will all agree with me that that sample, those chips are contaminated samples. In other words, they've moved up from the bottom of the hole to the collar of the hole, and they could have picked up contaminants as they as they moved up the annulus. So uh, a downhole hammer produces a contaminated sample. Now, downhole hammers are very efficient drilling tools. They drill hard rock very efficiently. Um, but they, they produce this contaminated sample. So Geo's wanted an uncontaminated sample produced very quickly from hard rock conditions. And way back in, in Canada, I, I believe it was like the early 1950s, a, a long, long time ago. Um, in fact, oddly enough, that's when I was born. Um, a very long time ago. Um, the Canadians developed this dual tube system, what we commonly call RC. It was a system that was developed to drill very soft coal uh, um, formations. Uh, they couldn't call drill, it was too soft and friable. And somebody came up with this dual tube system. And the concept was like this, guys. You have, instead of having your drill string um, in one piece, it's in two pieces. So you've got an outer tube and an inner tube. Um, and the concept was this. They arranged that they blew compressed air down between the two tubes. The air traveled down. It then came and exited just above the drill bit. I'll show you a picture just now. There was a little hole, a little uh, outlet just above the drill bit. The air then flowed out of that annular space around the face of the bit, picked up the cutting, and then blew the cutting to surface up the inner tube. It was a, it was a system developed in Canada um, to drill these soft coal uh, uh, um, formations. And so the bit they had at the bottom was a little drag bit, just like we saw just now, a little tungsten carbide drag bit. And it worked extremely well. It was incredibly efficient. And they got these fantastic samples that they couldn't get in any other way. And they said, that's fantastic. They then took that same technique and they tried to apply it to hard rock, to harder formation. But this silly little drill bit here couldn't drill hard rock. And so they said, uh, it doesn't work, and they put it on the shelf. And then, as the story goes, in the, in the early uh, um, uh, 1970s, the Aussies, who, who are probably the, the, the best RC drillers in the world, they make the best equipment. Most of the best RC equipment comes out of Aussie, or certainly a large part of the, the good equipment comes out of Aussie. Um, they, they sort of picked up this technique and they further developed it. And Geo said, look, we, we want to use this technique because it gives us, it gives us an uncontaminated sample. The sample coming up the inner tube is not contaminated by anything in the annulus. The air going down is not contaminated. And so it was a great high speed, relatively inexpensive sampling method. But Geo said, we want to drill hard rock. We don't want to use these tricone bits and drag bits because it's the penetration rate is too slow. And so they then started to develop um, face sampling hammers, reverse circulation hammers. It works in exactly the same way as a downhole hammer we, we spoke about earlier. But it, it allows the sample to flow the other way. So what we have, and I've shown you here, this is a particular uh, 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 a picture I took from a, an Atlas Copco brochure, but it shows the principle very well. You have your, your dual wall drill pipe. So you've got your drill rods with the inner tube, and then that inner tube extends into the hammer. So this tube here that you see is called a sample tube. And I've 
in this picture, it shows you uh, it's almost the same length as the as the hammer. And so the way that this hammer works is that the, the air comes down between the two tubes, it enters the hammer, the piston reciprocates, strikes the bit, the bit creates a, a chip. The air then escapes out just above the bit here, uh, in these little holes that you see just above the bit. The air travels across the bit face, picks up the cutting, and blows the cutting up through the sample tube, through the inner tube, to surface. So it looks like this. I'll come back to the pictures just now. So we have our hammer down the bottom. We've got our dual wall drill pipe. The air comes into what we call a side entry swivel. It's a, don't worry about that too much. But the, the air is allowed to enter the annular space between the two tubes. It travels down the two tubes. It enters the hammer. The piston reciprocates. The air then escapes just above the top of the bit, flows across the bit, and the cutting flows up through the sample tube, through the inner tube, through the head, into what we call a, a sample hose, into a sample collecting system. But the key point here, two key points, it's a pneumatic system, it's a down all hammer system. So I can drill hard rock incredibly quickly, very, very fast. And then the second thing is I get an uncontaminated sample. And that's the key to what we call an RC system. I get very pedantic about it. I call it a dual tube RC system because the system is based on having the dual tubes, on having the, um, the, the inner and the, and the outer tube. So we get this uncontaminated uh, sample produced. Let me just get my mouse to work again. Bear with me one second. Sorry, guys. Okay, there we go. Now, one of the keys to dual tube reverse circulation drilling is collection of the sample. We must always bear in mind, very often we forget this. Um, we, we are drilling uh, RC. We're drilling dual tube reverse circulation to produce a sample, not to make a hole in the ground. It's to produce a sample. And very, very often what happens is we have this beautiful hammer, we've got a beautiful drill rig, um, and, and we get the sample to surface and then we turn it into rubbish because we, we, we handle it incorrectly. We mix it, we contaminate it, we spill it, we bag it incorrectly, we label it incorrectly. Um, and so the sampling of that, uh, of, a, of, a, of a dual tube reverse circulation sample is, is critical. One of the other important things we must remember is that when we drill uh, an RC hole, a dual tube RC hole. Typically, it's about, uh, it, it varies, but 114 to sort of like 150 millimeters in diameter. So we produce this big bulk of sample. We produce between 30 and 45 kilograms of cutting per meter. Now, we're not going to send 30 to 45 kgs of cutting to, a, to an assay lab. Uh, uh, um, to um, to to get uh, uh, to get assayed, so we want to produce what we call a split sample, a smaller representative sample, and so we use either a, a riffle type splitter, which are pretty much out of favour now, or what's called a cone splitter, either a fixed cone or a rotary cone splitter. I'm not going to go into all the detail of how these things work because we're going to run out of time, but we we have a splitter that takes that bulk sample and then splits it so we get a much smaller sample that is representative of that bulk sample. And in that word representative, there's a whole debate. Um, I have seen really good reverse circulation operations. I've seen really bad reverse circulation operations. We're basically you're wasting your time um, because of the sampling process because of the way the samples are bagged and handled and so on. So we must not forget that, that the purpose of this is to get a sample, not to drill a hole, it's to get a sample. And, and, and we must consider every aspect of this operation from the time the sample enters the sampler until it gets to the lab where, um, where the, 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 the assays are going to be done on that. Okay. All right. I'm not going to talk about this, guys, because it's, um, it's, uh, 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 we're going to run out of time. I want to just quickly, quickly, quickly make sure we all understand this, this flow of air. So the air flows, we're looking now up, up a, a hammer, up to the top of the, the borehole, if you like. 
So the air flows down the drill string into the um, uh, um, into the into the hammer. The piston reciprocates. The bit strikes the rock face, creates chips. The air escapes in these little ports here, these little holes here between this black ring, if you like, what's called a shroud. It comes down, picks up the cutting, and the cutting evacuates into these holes, and then back up the back up the inner tube. So that's the way that the um, the, the, the the sample flows. Um, so these two holes are actually the sampling holes. That's where the sample uh, the the sample enters. Okay, all right. So those are our two roach percussion methods of drilling. Two roach percussion techniques: downhole hammer and dual tube reverse circulation. Please, I if we meet in the in the field one day and I ask you what you're doing, if you say you're doing RC drilling, I'll be less than happy. You're doing dual tube RC drilling. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next one. Let's talk about rotary drilling methods now. I'm not going to talk about full hole rotary drilling. We're talking about expiration drilling. So I'm going to talk about diamond core drilling. And this gets a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, um, detailed in places just now, but we, we have to get into a little bit of detail here, unfortunately, guys. Okay. Let's get into talking about diamond core drilling. <clears throat> in a diamond core drilling operation, the bottommost part of our drill string, the front, sitting behind the drill bit is what we call a core barrel. And, and I'll try to show it here in this my little PowerPoint picture here. So we've got our diamond bit at the bottom here, which I've shown in, in sort of goldy color because we've got diamond in there. It's got a hole in the middle. And sitting behind it, we have a um, what we call a core barrel. And we'll talk a lot about core barrels just now. And this core barrel will be, will be a certain length. Let's assume that it is uh, three meters in, in length. I see somebody's got their... Um, Tanya, can we do something to get this guy to stop drawing pictures? I'm not sure that's possible. Um, so, so the principle is we will have the bit on bottom. We'll start rotating and we'll start, uh, we'll start feeding. Um, and we will advance the borehole the length of the core barrel. So this core barrel will now be full of core. It will then be necessary, we can't advance any further, it will then be necessary to pull the drill string out of the borehole. We pull the entire drill string out the hole, pull all the rods, we hoist them out the hole, remove the bit, take the core out, pack the, the core into, into core boxes, into a core box, reassemble the bit, go back to bottom. And when we're on bottom, we'll again start rotating and, um, uh, and feeding, and we'll again fill up the core barrel. So the point here is we advance the borehole in stages equal to the length of the core barrel. And um, let me just get my thing working here. I don't know why this doesn't work all the time. Um, and so we, we advance the, the length of a core barrel in each run. Now, if the core barrel is three meters long, in theory, you're going to advance three meters, pull and lower, um, advance three meters, pull and lower, advance three meters, pull and lower. We call that a conventional system where the core barrel has to be pulled out of the hole in order to extract the, the core sample uh, um, from it. Um, it's a method of drilling. It's a, a method of retrieving core that we still commonly use in the exploration industry, but we've got other methods we'll talk about. We'll talk about just now. But what the important thing is this, is that sometimes I can't drill the full three meters. Sometimes I can only advance less than a full core barrel. Um, and so uh, I'll advance in shorter lengths, depending upon the nature of the formation and, and, and other factors. So let's look at, at, at diamond core drilling operations. Um, We've got uh, uh, different kinds of drill rig, and we're not going to go into these in detail, but one of the most common types of, of uh, diamond core drill rig that you will see around is what we call a hydraulic long stroke drill rig. And these are two examples here of long stroke drill rigs. The one on the left is set, is, is set up for a vertical hole, and the one on the right set up for, for an angled uh, uh, borehole. The second type of drill rig that we have is, is what's called a top drive drill rig. And this is a picture of a top drive rig here. We're not going to go into this in any detail because it's just way, way, way 
uh, too complicated for this stage. We just we need a much longer time to to talk about these rigs in detail. But all I want you to know is that there's different types of diamond core drilling machine that we that we have available. Now, one of the key things that um, confuse geologists. I want to just spend two minutes talking about this. One of the key parts of the diamond drilling industry that confuses people is the naming system that we that we have. Diamond core drilling uh, had its origins in North America, in Canada and the United States uh, uh, way back. And in Canada, the United States, they uh, worked in inches and feet. They worked in, um, it, it wasn't in the, uh, it was in imperial units of measure, not in metric units of measure. So their bit sizes were in, were in inches. Um, and they named, uh, um, they standardized their bit sizes, the borehole sizes, and they, they designated them by letters. And so we designate diamond drill hole sizes by letters. So we have E, A, B, N, H, and P hole sizes. If you've been working in the drilling industry, you will have come across these terms. So if I talk about a B size borehole, a BQ hole or a BX hole or a BXM hole, it's a 60 millimeter, nominally 60 millimeters. It's actually 59.96, but it's nominally 60 millimeters in diameter. An N size borehole is 76. So if we hear, um, for example, if, if we say this is an NQ drill bit, as soon as we see the term N, we know it's designed to drill a 76 millimeter borehole. If I say this is an NQ drill rod, I know that that drill rod is designed to drill an N size hole. It's obviously not 76 in diameter, it's a bit smaller, 70 millimeters in diameter. But the, 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 the key point here is we use letters to designate hole sizes. And what you as exploration geos will come across in most parts of the world are these three terms here, N, H, and P. A P size hole is 122, an H size hole is 96, and an N size hole is 76. If you're drilling underground, you might come across A and B sizes. Um, a, and, a and B size equipment. This will all make a little bit of sense a little bit later, um, I hope. So that's the one key thing in the diamond drilling industry is we designate hole sizes by letters. If you work in, in Europe, <clears throat> they use metric sizes. Um, and so they don't use the same terminology. So you get basically sort of North American uh, uh, um, uh, uh, designations and you get metric designations. So you get North America, you get imperial designations, and you get SI units or metric unit designations. Gets very complicated, so we'll leave that, uh, we'll, we'll leave that there. Okay, so let's look at the most important part now. Forget about the drill rigs and the drill rods, all the rest of it. The key part of a diamond drilling operation from a geologist's point of view is the core barrel, that bottommost part the part that the core feeds into when you're drilling. It is the most important part, and it acts as the receptacle for the core. That's where the core feeds as the, as the bit advances. And the core barrel, there are many, 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 many different designs of core barrel, many different sizes of bore, core barrel, and they are all designed, I was going to say for different rock types, that's nonsense, but, but we can use them in different applications, depending upon what we, what we are trying to do. But the important thing for the geo to understand is that the core barrel will determine the diameter of your borehole, in HB or P. It will determine to a large extent, it'll certainly determine the core size that you get. And to a very large extent, it will determine the quality of the core sample you get. And that will become clear as we, as we move on now. So this little picture here at the bottom here is a picture of a whole bunch of different drill bits. Um, and these are all bits for different designs of core barrel. So these two here, for example, it's hard for you to see, but maybe you can get a pick, uh, uh, an idea from your... Um, uh, from your screens there. These are both 60 millimeter bits. 
Uh, these are both B size bits, 60 millimeter bits. The one on the right is what's called a BQ bit. The one on the left is called a TBW bit. You can see the core sample from this core barrel. It's very much bigger yes. than the core sample from the BQ bit. So it's a different design of core barrel. Gives us different diameters of core sample. These three bits here are N size bits. They are 76 millimeter bits. And again, you can see they've all got different core sizes. They're all 76 OD, the outside diameter is 76. Uh, this one on the right is called an N qubit. This one on the left is called a CUD 76. We won't even worry talking about that. And this one is called a TNW. Um, so you can see the curve, the cutting area changes to so get different sizes of, of core. And then finally, these two bits are both H size bits, both 96 millimeter holes. And again, you get different uh, uh, core sizes from, from, these, from these bits. Okay. So let's look at different designs of core barrel. Um, Tanya, are you there? Can you hear? Uh, yes, I am trying to 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 do this. Um, Mr. M Mahangu Melandu Rama Christel Christ, please mute your microphone. <laughs> You're making a noise in the background and we cannot hear. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. Tanya, guys, um, uh, uh, earlier I suggested, Tanya, that we might have a little bit of a break. Um, if you guys are happy, we, we won't. Um, I want to try and finish in, in about 35 minutes uh, to give time for questions and to allow uh, uh, Massey and, and Nolene to carry on. So I'm not going to take a break. This is, there's quite a lot to get through. I hope you're all, you're all still with me on this. Um, so we won't have a break. We'll carry on. Um, and there, there's going to be a tea break after my little presentation. So let's just, just keep plowing on if you guys are, are happy with that. Okay. I want to talk quickly now <clears throat> about different types of core barrel. Now, we've we've got we've got different ways that we can core drill holes. And the way I explained just now, a couple of minutes ago, we, we have our core barrel, we advance the hole, the core barrel is full of core. I need to pull the core barrel out the hole. I've got to hoist the entire drill string out the hole, remove the core from the core barrel, reassemble it, and go back into the hole to continue drilling. We call that a conventional system. And I want to quickly show you here different types of conventional core barrel. Many of you will never be involved in conventional drilling. You will use what we call a wireline system that I'll talk about just now. Um, but uh, the, the principles here are important because it, it will explain to you how we can affect uh, 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 core quality using different types of, of, of bit, uh, different types of, of core barrel. There are three types of conventional core barrel that we can use, what we call single tube, double tube, and triple tube. In a single tube core barrel, very simply, let me see if I can get my little pointer back here. In a single tube core barrel, we have at the bottom, we have a bit and a reaming shell. In, in every core barrel, we have a bit and a reaming shell. Then I have an outer tube and I have the core barrel head. So I have one tube. So as we're advancing, as we're drilling, the core's feeding into this single outer tube, hence the name single tube core barrel. The disadvantage of a single tube core barrel, again, is one of my very, very high quality PowerPoint pictures. Um, I hope you can make this out, guys. In a single tube core barrel, I'm pumping my drilling fluid, the, the water-based drilling fluid, down the drill string. It enters the core barrel. And because the core is sitting inside the tube, the fluid has to flow over the core, past the bit, back up to surface, back up the annulus to surface. So the, the drilling fluid has to flow over the core to get through the core barrel and back up to surface. So obviously, if the core is at all friable or washable, it's going to merely wash it away. So we use single tube core barrels, either where we've got really hard rock that is going to be immune to any water washing, or 
uh, in cases where we don't really care about poor quality. For example, in that top overburden in the, in the weathered section, we might use a single tube core barrel to drill that. We don't really worry about the quality of the core in that, in that area, um, and so we might use a, a single tube core barrel there. The, the second kind of core barrel that we, that we use, second type of conversal core barrel, is called a double tube core barrel. Now in this core barrel, we've again got our bit and reaming shell, we've again got an outer tube, we've again got a core barrel head, just like we had before. But the difference here is that we've now got an inner tube that is connected to the core barrel head. And you, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to see in this picture now, but as we drill, the core doesn't feed into the outer tube, it feeds into the inner tube. And the drilling fluid flows through the drill string, through a series of holes. Now I've shown you a blow up picture here. In the core barrel head, there's a series of holes drilled through the head. So the fluid flows down the drill string through these holes. It then flows down past the inner tube on its way to the bit and out to the annulus. So the core, because the core is housed inside the double tube, inside the inner tube, I beg your pardon, it is protected from water washing. So a double tube core barrel will give us a much better quality of sample than a single tube core barrel will. Um, obviously, it's more expensive, it's more difficult to make, and the costs of drilling with a double tube core barrel will be significantly higher than drilling with a single tube core barrel. But all I want to illustrate here, guys, is how we can, we can get a more sophisticated core barrel and we can get a much better uh, core sample. And that's important for a geo to, to understand. One other quick thing I want to talk about here, in this core barrel head, where it's connected to the, to the outer tube, to, I beg your pardon, to the inner tube, we have a set of bearings. And those bearings allow the inner tube to remain stationary while the outer tube and the bit and the drill string are rotating. If the inner tube rotated, it would tend to uh, twist the core with it and you would get a, 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 an element of, of core grinding taking place. You'd get damage to the, to the core. So these bearings are very important. They keep the inner tube stationary while you, while you are drilling. Okay. Now, sometimes, this is very important, guys. <clears throat> Sometimes the process of removing the core sample from the inner tube, because when we retrieve the core barrel to surface, the, the sample is sitting here inside the inner tube. And sometimes, this is important to understand this distinction, the process of removing that sample destroys the sample. Uh, the, the, the core is so fractured or broken or friable that the process of removing it, getting it into the core tray, destroys it. And I can no longer see any features in it. And so in those cases, we use what we call a triple tube core barrel. So basically, it's a double tube core barrel. But inside the inner tube, I have another inner tube. And the principle is very simple. We advance just like we did before. The core sample now feeds into the inner inner tube. And then all I need to do is when I've finished drilling my core barrel length, I retrieve it to surface, I now extract that inner inner tube. And typically what we do is the inner inner tubes are longitudinally split. So it's like in two halves. You can see from this picture on the left what I mean. So that when I extract it, all I need to do is take the top part off, and I've got this beautiful sample. And I can now do some work on that, on that sample. So we use triple tube core barrels, where the process of extracting the sample will destroy the sample. It allows us to get a much better core quality than we will with a double tube core barrel. So the principle here, guys, is very, very simple. We've got single tube, double tube, and triple tube core barrels. As you move from single tube to double tube to triple tube, the material, this is quite hard to understand, I guess, the wall thickness of the steel tubing that, that the core barrel is made of has to get thinner and thinner and thinner. And so as 
these core barrels get more sophisticated. The materials get thinner and thinner and thinner. The cost just rockets. It gets very, very, very expensive. Give you an idea. I'm a little bit out of things now. I'm not in the commercial side of the business anymore, but I, I, um, a set of split inner tubes like this um, for, a, for an NQ core barrel. I, I might be telling lies. Some of you guys might be able to correct me now. Um, but, but those would cost probably in the order of about 5,000 Rand a pair. 5,000 Rand, put that into US dollars. It's about a, a, a Big Mac and a Coke. Um, it's uh, uh, extremely expensive. And, and so as these core barrels get more sophisticated, the cost gets more and more, uh, um, uh, gets greater and greater. The other thing we've got to understand is that for a given hole size, if I'm drilling an n size borehole, for example, if I drill single tube with a single tube core barrel, I'll get a big sample. If I drill double tube, my sample will be smaller. If I drill triple tube, it will be even smaller because I've got to, I've got to get more tubes into that, uh, uh, in, into that dimension. And that's an important thing to, to understand as, as well here with these, with these core barrels. Okay. Um, so, so what I want you to take away from this, and I mean, we've rushed through this very, very quickly, unfortunately. What I want you to take away from this is the core barrel is critical. And the more you know about core barrel sizes, available sizes and designs, um, the, 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 the better you will be at, at, at trying to understand the kinds of samples you can get and that you can't get uh, from particular formations. Okay, so what we've spoken about there in this first part is we've spoken about conventional core barrels. Core barrels where we've got to pull and lower every time we've advanced the borehole. Those are called conventional core barrels. Now, in a wireline core barrel, this is the second way that we can retrieve core from a borehole. In a wireline core barrel, I've shown this schematically here, and I'll show you pictures now of, of what a wireline core barrel looks like. In a wireline core barrel, we have a retrievable inner tube. So it's a double tube core barrel, but the inner tube can be retrieved. So it's a loose fitting thing. If you look at, I'll show you actual pictures in a minute. Um, this is what the core, the inner tube looks like. So the core barrel's down the bottom of the hole here, but this inner tube can be pulled to surface. We leave the drill string in the hole, the entire drill string remains in the hole. We lower a special device called an overshot. It latches onto the top of the inner tube and we pull the inner tube to surface. We then disassemble the inner tube, extract the core, reassemble the inner tube, and we merely drop it back down the hole. It floats back into, uh, uh, um, into position in the core barrel, it locks in position, and I can carry on drilling. So a wireline, <clears throat> a wireline retrieval system, as I've explained it here, is very much more efficient than a conventional system. To give you some idea, one of the very first deep boreholes I ever worked on in South Africa as a young man, uh, uh, many, many years ago, was a hole that was 3,800 meters deep. And the guys, the contractor was drilling, <clears throat> and at 3,800 odd meters, they entered uh, uh, an overpressured shale band. They had the shale band, um, and uh, as soon as they drilled, the, the shale relieved into the hole. So we've got these long, very sharp slivers of shale that kept on essentially exploding into, into the borehole. And we, we couldn't advance the hole. So, so uh, I was asked to go along, and we ran a special mud system, a special drilling fluid system to, to try and overcome the problem. On that hole at 3,000 meters, meters, we were drilling <clears throat> with a three meter conventional core barrel. And, and it took us about 40 minutes to drill three meters. It took 13 hours to pull the drill string out the hole and 12 hours to go back into the hole. So it took 25 hours a day to pull and lower. So in those days, for those guys who, who, who are not from South Africa, I was working at it. This, this project was about 130 kilometers from my home in Johannesburg. So I would get in my car, I would drive to site, I'd get to site just before they got back to bottom. Uh, we would start drilling, we would drill for 40 minutes. I then get in my car, drive back to Johannesburg, do a day's work, sleep, and then go back the next day. So, so 
the deeper the hole gets, conventional systems become more and more uh, uh, time intensive and therefore really, really inefficient. So a wireline system was developed to to make it uh, uh, to make it more more uh, productive, more more quick. So the principle is very simple. We have our core barrel down the bottom. We advance. We fill the core barrel. We fill the inner tube. I lower the special device. I pick up the inner tube and I pull it to surface, as I showed in the second picture here. Once I've disassembled the barrel, removed the core, I reassemble the inner tube and I merely drop it back down the drill rods. Uh, the drill string is, is water filled, so it floats in the drilling fluid back down to bottom. It latches in the, uh, uh, in the core barrel. I can then advance my next three meters or six meters wherever along my, my core barrel is. And that's how I, I advance my hole. So now a, a wireline core barrel is a little bit more complex, a little bit more complicated. I'm just going to show you the basic outline here um, of, of what a wireline uh, a core barrel looks like. Just like our other core barrels, it has different components. It has the reaming shell and the drill bit at the bottom. It has an outer tube. And then it's got a few special things at the top. Don't worry about those. We call it an adapter coupling and a locking coupling. But that's the outer tube. That's the part that will remain down the hole. And then we have what we call the inner tube. And the inner tube is the part that's retrievable. And if you look at the top of my picture, you see this little, this little pointy thing at the top. We call that the spearhead. And that's the part that the overshot latches onto when it pulls it out. It's much more complicated than we've got time to talk about today. But essentially, this is the retrievable part. And this lower part here, this part here that I, I painted gray on my little sample here, this is what we call the inner tube. And that is the part that accepts the core. So as we advance, the core sample feeds into that inner tube. And that inner tube will either be three meters long. We can adapt them to make them six meters long. So therefore, I can advance my hole either three meters or six meters. I then need to stop, retrieve that inner tube, disassemble, remove the core, reassemble, and drop it back down the hole. And that's the basic principle of a, of a Y-line uh, uh, um, uh, core barrel assembly. Much more complicated than I've spoken about. We can spend days talking about this, but we just don't have that, that time today. Okay. <clears throat> So there, we, we've chatted now about the, the, the first part of what I wanted to speak about, about the technical aspects of, of a drilling operation. What we spoke about there in uh, just, what is that, about an hour and 20 minutes, um, we have online training programs where it takes us six months to talk about this stuff in detail. It's much more complex than I've spoken about, but all I want you to do is to have an appreciation of, of how we drill, what those critical elements are, and some of the factors that can affect the representativity and quality of your samples. Whenever I'm asked to talk to geos, one of the key pieces of advice I give them is I, I say to them, please be inquisitive. When you go to a drill site, uh, um, whether you're visiting or it's a drill site that, that you are running, ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. I, I, when I started this industry, that's how I got to know what I know. I just asked hundreds of questions. And don't always believe the first answer you get because very often it's not right. Um, ask the question more than once. And learn as much as you possibly can about those technical, those physical aspects of, of a drilling operation. The more you understand, the more you'll be able to influence the operation to get the kind of sample quality you want. Um, and, and that's the key part of that, that first part. Let's talk now about <clears throat> the second part. Now, here I'm going to just talk more philosophically than, than anything kind of any sort of nitty gritty. Geos need to know about safety aspects of, of drilling. And so you need to know about the, 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 the risks and the hazards that exist on, on, on drill sites. And as I said earlier, one of the key things you need to know as well is what your legal liability is, what your legal responsibilities are. And in different jurisdictions in the world, there's different legislation um, that, that govern uh, safety on drill sites. In some countries, 
uh, in, um, um, in Canada, for example, in Australia, um, there is legislation that is specific to drilling. In many jurisdictions of the world, in many countries, the law is silent. It doesn't say anything about drilling. In South Africa, we've got a very big drilling industry in this country, and a very big mining industry, um, but, but none of our legislation talks to drilling. And that's where one of the big challenges is, because what you've got to do is you've got to look at the law, you've got to look at that legislation, and you've got to interpret it and extract from it what applies to a drilling operation. And that can be very, very difficult. So you need to have some knowledge of, of the law and so on. It becomes very difficult. But, but I urge you, irrespective of where you're working in the world, um, try to find out what your legal liability is and what your legal responsibilities are. Because uh, uh, in some parts of the world, uh, you don't want to go to jail. Um, in no parts of the world, you want to go to jail. Uh, but some parts particularly, you don't want to go to jail because uh, it, won't be, it won't be terribly pleasant. So the best way I can explain this to you guys is, is like this. <clears throat> I'm, I'm very lucky. Over the years, I've become deeply involved in aspects of safety with, with drill rigs, and I've, I've been involved in writing safety standards for mining companies um, and involved in safety audits and, and all sorts of things like that. And, and I, I, I want to explain it like this. This little logo here, this little picture you see is, is, a, is a logo that's part of my, my corporate, if I can call it that, uh, a sort of brand identity. I think that's the term people use. But in all of my literature and all of my training programs, you will, you will see this little logo. And, and it encompasses what we need to know, or, or at least it gives the guideline to what we need to know about safety on, on a drill site. I believe that drill site safety revolves around four aspects. Number one, the equipment, the drill rig, the compressor, the trailer, the lighting plant, the pump unit, um, the driller shack, um, all of the equipment that we use on the drill site. And all of that equip equipment has inherent risk attached to it. So we need to understand all of the risk associated with that equipment. Now, mining companies tend to be fixated on equipment. And mining companies think, and I'm not being disrespectful of at all, mining companies, I, I do lots and lots of work with mining companies. If, if there weren't mining companies, I wouldn't have any work. But many mining companies tend to be fixated on, on equipment. And they think that if we automate everything, we've, we've managed risk. That's not true. Because we unfortunately have got to have people. If we've got a totally automated drilling operation, this argument might fall away. But right now, We've got to have people on a, on a drill rig. And we've got to have people, number one, to operate the rig. We've got to have people to maintain the rig. And more importantly, we've got people to repair the rig. So if that equipment, as automated as it may be, as soon as we put a person anywhere near a piece of powered equipment, we're at risk. And we need to understand the risk. And very often, we don't. I believe the biggest exposure we have um, in, in a drilling operation is people. Uh, there's no limit to what a person can do. A person can take the most simple situation and turn it into a catastrophic disaster just by making a bad decision or making a bad action or forgetting to do something. So, so we mustn't forget that unless the, the process is totally automated, we've got to have people involved. And so that leads us then to the third aspect of safety on a drill site, and that's the processes or the procedures. The one way that we can make sure that equipment and people interact correctly is to have the correct procedures. And so that means we need to understand how the equipment works. We need to understand how we pull rods. We need to understand how we pull the inner tube. We need to understand how we change a bit. We need to understand how we carry out maintenance on a, on a drill rig or repairs, how to change a hydraulic cylinder, how to clear a block sample hose, all of these things. These are all covered by processes. And we need to understand how people use the processes to operate the equipment. You can see this sort of triangle, uh, if you like. And if we understand all of that, we could then start to manage safety on drill sites. And very often what I see in many operations is, is the people aspect is, is, is not properly understood. 
and the process access, uh, uh, um, uh, aspect is not properly understood. And those three things are very, very important. Then the fourth aspect we've got to consider is the local working environment. <clears throat> and what I mean by this is that a process um, that is perfectly adequate um, uh, when we're drilling on a farmland uh, um, in the middle of a maize field, for example, um, that process might not be adequate if we're drilling on the side of a hill um, at high altitude. Um, and so what we've got to do is we've got to consider how we modify the processes that we use for any particular local environmental condition, uh, high heat, dust, wind, rain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, because it will alter the processes. And my belief is that if we understand those four aspects, we truly understand them, we can then start managing drill site safety. It's a lot more complex than that. Um, but I think if, if you guys can remember this picture, um, if you want to copy the picture, you just tell uh, uh, Tanya, send, stick us a message on the chat line and we'll send it to you. But I truly believe that drill site safety revolves around these, these four aspects. And if we understand these and we manage them, I think we can manage safety on a, on, on a drill site. The last bit I want to talk about today, <clears throat> the last uh, aspects that I think a geo needs to understand or know something about are economic aspects of drilling. I'm going to talk a little bit longer and maybe with a little bit more passion because, um, again, it's it's part of the industry that I'm, I'm very lucky. I've become more and more involved in, in managing, or not managing, that's the wrong word, in um, in assisting in, in developing the development of tenders uh, and, and the evaluation of tenders. Um, and I've seen how dramatic an impact a poorly designed contract can have on a, on a drilling operation. So I just want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then we'll call it a day and we'll have some, uh, we'll, we'll have some questions. Okay, so let's talk about some, some economic aspects of, of drilling. Some of you may have already been involved in, in, um, uh, um, in drilling contracts. Some of you may, may not. But at some point in time as a geo, you are, you are going to be. And all exploration drilling, uh, all, there might be a small amount that is, but all exploration drilling is based on a contract. The, 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 uh, uh, the, the mining company or the exploration company has some work to do. They'll develop a tender specification. They'll go out to tender. A whole bunch of contractors will bid. The contractors, uh, the bids will be evaluated and they'll say, we want this guy to drill for us. And there will then be a contract that will specify, hopefully will specify the work to be done, um, all the ifs and ands and buts, and what the prices will be paid for, for the particular work that, that is, is done. So all, all drilling, 99% uh, 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 of exploration drilling is based on a contract. And so it's very important for the geologist to understanding of, of, of how that contract is structured, because that contract, the structure of the contract will very much dictate the relationship there is between the geologist and the contractor. It will dictate what impact the geologist has on the contract and the impact that the geologist has on whether the contractor makes profit or not, whether he makes money or not, whether he survives or not, whether he's around to bid on the, on, 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 on the next contract. And so we'll we'll talk about a few of these these aspects um, now. Okay, um, give me one second. I just want to try and get my pointer to work again. Okay, let's look at a couple of, of basics here. In a typical what we call a variable rate contract, okay, in a typical drilling contract, <clears throat> you'll have the mining company or the exploration company that has a fixed budget. You've got a you've got a certain amount of money that you 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 have got to spend and you want to get as much information as possible. So you've designed your budget, you've designed your project that you want to drill 20,000 meters or 15,000 meters or 150,000 meters. So what you would like, what the mining company wants is the lowest cost per meter because the lower the cost per meter, the more information you're going to get. Unfortunately, you've got the contractor and the contractor has massive investment, huge amounts of capital invested in equipment 
in, in uh, drill rods and downhole tools, in ancillary equipment, lighting plants, compressors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, massive, massive capital investment, huge. Uh, um, um, uh, a modern day drill rig now, um, diamond drill will cost you anything from six to 14 million South African rands, whatever that is in, in real money, um, but, but significant amounts of money. And the contractor has to maximize profit because he's got to maintain that equipment, he's got to replace that equipment, he's got to meet certain safety standards. He has to make a profit. He wants to maximize his profit. And so he wants the highest price per meter or the highest rate per meter. There's a very big difference between the cost per meter and the rate. In other words, between what he says he's going to bill you and what you actually get billed is a very big difference. But he needs to make as much money as he possibly can. So between these two seeming extremes, you've got to come up with a contract. You've got to come up with a contract that allows the mining company to get its information and the contractor to survive for him to be able to bid on the next contract. And, and I'm not, I, I use that word very advisedly. Uh, uh, many, many mining companies. Um, this sounds very contentious, but, but uh, maybe it sounds rude. Many mining companies, you would, you would think that the, their objective is to put the contract out of business. That's not what a, what a drilling contract's about. You want the contractor there in a better position to do better work for you next time. So the contract has got to be correctly, correctly structured. And unfortunately, what happens um, uh, when we drill, we, we drill because we don't know what's down there and things change. But very often, the scope of the contract changes. Um, the contract says we're going to drill vertical holes. And you drill four vertical holes. The GS says, oh, dear, we want to drill angled holes now. That changes the nature of the project completely, completely. It changes how quickly the contractor can drill. It changes the rate at which his equipment wears, et cetera, et cetera. And you can't do that. You can't just change the scope of a contract because you haven't planned correctly. So scope creep is a very, very big, uh, 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 is, a, is a very big factor. Um, so we've got to make sure that that, that doesn't uh, happen or we, we stop it from happening. And what did, Two, two things here, guys. This, this next slide is probably one of the most important slides in, in this little talk uh, uh, today. And please, I want you to remember these two, these two principles here. There's two basic principles of business that we must not forget. When I say business, contracting, mining, you name it, uh, um, the same principles apply to every aspect of business. The first principle is this. If a contractor is not making a profit, he will not perform on site. A contractor has to make a profit. He's got to pay salaries. He's got to train people. He's got to uh, uh, um, repair equipment. He's got to replace equipment. Um, he's got to buy new vehicles. He cannot do that if he's not making a profit. He has to make a profit. And I argue very often with, with customers of, of companies I work with, it is more important for a mining company or an exploration company to know that a contractor is losing money than is to know how much money he's making. Very often we get, we think, oh, the ex making too much money, the guy's making too much money. It's more important to know that if he's losing money, because I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, if he's losing money, he's going to have an accident. And then your life's going to become a misery. Then your whole project becomes a problem. So the contractor has to make a profit. And so in selecting the contractor, select the contractor correctly. Don't always go for the cheapest contractor because you don't always get the best from, from the cheapest contractor. So, so that whole, we can spend four days talking about that, but, but please remember this, the contractor has to make a profit. The second principle is that <clears throat> profit is the reward for risk. So when you design your tender specification, <clears throat> A tender specification must understand and it must address risk in drilling. We drill boreholes because we don't know what's down there. There's all sorts of geological issues. There's mechanical issues. All sorts of things can, can, can go wrong in drilling a borehole. If the contract places that risk on the driller, on the contractor, expect to pay a high price. However, if you can identify the risk, if you can properly assess that risk and apportion the risk, let the contractor carry the risk that he can manage and let the mining company carry the risk that they can manage, 
you get a far more equitable contract. But very often what you see is all the risk is placed on the, on the contractor. And if that's the case, then you must expect very, very high prices. What tends to happen nowadays um, uh, in the exploration business now, in many parts of the world, there's fewer contractors than there is work. And so what you tend to see is, is contractors now try to, they try to structure or, or influence contracts so that the mining company carries all the risk and they carry for very little risk. This is just one of the dynamics of business. But it's, it's just very important to understand that if we ask the contractor to, do, uh, to, to carry all the geological and the mechanical and the economic risk and the, and the community uh, unrest risks, then we must expect to pay a very, very significant price for that um, for, for, for that uh, for that benefit. I want to show you just quickly last couple of slides, and then we're going to we're going to uh, we're going to call it a day. Okay. Um, in a in, in a drilling contract, uh, every drilling contract will ask the contractor to submit a schedule of rates. He's going to charge you this and this and this and this for different aspects of of, of work. And just, I want to talk very quickly about how, and this is very simplistic, guys, but very simplistically, how a contractor calculates his prices, how he would work out what he's going to charge you to draw. A, a contractor will have two basic elements of cost. There are fixed costs. These are costs that he pays every, uh, every month, whether he is going to, sorry, guys, um, he's going to pay whether he's drilling or not. These are fixed costs. So he's going to have salaries and wages. He's going to have rentals. He's going to have amortization payments on his equipment. He's going to have insurance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whether he's drilling or not, he's going to have these fixed costs. And those are, generally speaking, big, big chunks of, of cost. Then he will have also variable costs. And these are costs that he will incur only when he's drilling fuel, bits, drilling fluids, oils and greases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he's going to have fixed costs and he's going to have variable costs. And so what the contractor will do when he's going to work out how much he's going to charge you, how much he's going to put in his tender document, how much he's going to put in his bid to drill a meter, he's going to look at his fixed costs and he's going to look at that scope of work that you've developed. And he's going to say, okay, based on the conditions they've told me they will be on this mine, on this particular project, I reckon I can drill a thousand meters a month, or I can drill 500 meters a month, or I can drill 900 meters a month. And you'll take those fixed costs and you'll divide by either a thousand or 900 or 500, and you will get a fixed cost per meter. So the, the information you give him in that scope of work is critical because if he gets that estimated number of meters wrong, he's either going to be above the line or below the line. He's going to make money or he's going to lose money. So it becomes very important that that scope of work is, is, is clear. Then what he will do is he will add, please move on quickly. He will add to that fixed cost per meter, his variable cost per meter. Now the variable cost per meter, he will, he will base this on, on historic information and, and results he's had previously. He reckons it costs $25 a meter to drill in Q boreholes, or it costs $35 a meter, whatever the case happens to be. But that'll be a, a, another estimate that he that he has to make. So, so as an example here, and I'll go through this uh, slowly, very important for us to understand this. Let's assume that a contractor's fixed total costs are $150,000 per month. And his variable costs are $35 per meter. So that's his bits, fuel, blah, blah, blah. Right, those are the variable costs that he's, that he's going to incur. And based on what we've told him in that tender document, he reckons he can draw 900 meters a month. He says that's how much he's going to draw. So he will take his fixed costs, $150,000. He'll divide by 900, and he gets $167 per meter. That's his fixed cost per meter. Then to that, he will add his variable costs, 35, and he'll say, okay, this project is going to cost me $202 per meter to drill. And then he'll add a profit margin. We'll talk about that just now. He'll add a profit margin to that, and he'll put that price into the mining company. And that will be the price that you're going to use to, to evaluate. to evaluate. But now, the key thing I want to get through here, guys, is this. In putting that tender document together, 
uh, you 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 rushed it over the weekend because you wanted to go and uh, watch a soccer game, and you didn't give the guy all the information. And because you didn't give him all the information, he's not going to drill 900 meters a month. He's going to drill 700 meters a month. So his fixed costs now are not going to be 150,000 divided by 900. It's going to be 150,000 divided by 700. So all of a sudden, these costs have rocketed. And that's the basic principle that I want to get across in this little part of, 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 of this section. We have to be equitable in, in a drilling contract. In a drilling contract, there's, the mining company have to get their information. And the only way you're going to get that information is by having a contractor. And so treat him fairly. Specify the work correctly. You can then evaluate your your bids uh, um, correctly. So so that's a very important principle I, I want to uh, I want to explain there. Last couple of slides, and then we're going to call it a day. Okay, the timing has worked out absolutely perfectly. There are different types of drilling contract. Um, uh, back in the good old days when when uh, um, there was uh, not much work around and contractors had to had to compete very closely with one another to get work. Some contractors quoted what they called in an all-in rate. So they told you it's going to cost you this much per borehole. It's a one-line invoice. I drilled two and a half boreholes this month at this much per borehole, and that's how much you, you owe me. Um, very risky for the contractor, but in certain conditions, you can do that. The more common type of, of, of drilling contract is what we call a variable rate contract, like I've just explained now, where the contractor will bid certain rates for different elements of work, different types of work. And then the, the, the last one was also popular a while ago um, uh, and starting to come back a little bit more now into, into expiration is what we call a fixed rate contract, where the contractor says, I will bring my drill rig to your mine and you're going to pay me $200,000 a month to, for the pleasure of having that drill on your mine. And then if we do drill, I'm going to charge you so much per meter. And this type of contract works very well, very, very, very well, where you have intermittent work in remote locations where it's hard to mobilize a drill rig and demobilize a drill rig. And in many cases, many contracts, uh, many projects have been done very, very well on a, on, a, on a fixed rate basis. So you need to have a little bit of an understanding of what kind of contract you have, because that will allow you to determine where you can influence uh, uh, or, or what you do to influence whether the contractor makes or, or loses money. Because um, that is important. Uh, the geologist can have a huge influence on the profitability of the contractor and therefore the efficiency of the contract. And, and um, I, I always end this off by saying be kind to the contractor. If it's a bad contractor, you made a bad mistake, you might have to live with that. But if it's a good contractor, help him. Don't, don't give him money. Well, I'm not saying that, but, but do not stop the contractor making money through unreasonable actions. And that's kind of what I'm, what I'm trying to, to say there, okay. Okay, so that's, gee, the timing is absolutely perfect. Uh, down to the minute. So, so to summarize quickly, I, I believe from a drilling perspective, you need to understand technical aspects, safety aspects, and some economic aspects of your, of your operation. And, and as I said earlier, I suppose the best advice that I can give you based on, on, on my years of working in the industry and work with many, many geos, um, be inquisitive. Geos by nature are inquisitive people. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been a, a geologist, I guess. But, but be inquisitive. Ask questions. Don't believe the first answer you get and sift the wheat from the chaff. Um, but, but learn as much as you can about these aspects. Um, because unfortunately, modern day exploration requirements require that a geologist is not just good at looking at rocks. A geologist has to be good at all of these aspects. Yeah. And the, the more experience you get, the, the more detailed knowledge you get, I think the better you will be at what, uh, at what you're asked to do there. Okay, Tanya, I'm done. Um, Perfect timing, absolutely perfect. I, I expect to finish at 20 past, so we've got some time for uh, for questions if we do, and then you guys can break for tea. Um, guys, I don't know if there are any questions. Tanya, do you want to see, have we got any questions? 
we do have a couple of questions in the in the chat box. And to start off with um, Andrea's question, okay. what is the impact, impact of no flushing system? Is generating an inner tube that can be removed with no impact on the sample and the inner tube splits open upon removal a reasonable way if you cannot use a flush system? Hey, Andrew, that's a very interesting question. I think I understand what you're saying. In some, in some rock types, particularly, for example, if we're drilling into rock types that are water sensitive, um, kimberlites, uh, formations that are high in clay mineral, mudstones, uh, some shales, for example, the drilling fluid, the water-based drilling fluid, the water fraction, can can uh, uh, react with the, uh, uh, with the with the rock with the, the the clay chemicals in the rock, or, or it might be a, a potash, for example. It might chemically react with a uh, with a formation and cause hole enlargement. And very often, we want to try and drill without a flushing system. Um, it's very hard. It's very hard because in in any drilling operation, we create cutting. Um, it's the purpose of it. We 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 um, uh, um, uh, we fragment rock, and and when we fragment that rock, we have to get that cutting out the hole. And if you haven't got a flushing system, you can't get that out the hole. So we can, Andrew. I think I know what you're talking about. We can drill without a flushing system for a very short distance, um, and we can still pull the drill string out and go back to bottom. But we can't do that forever. Because we've got to get the cutting out the out the hole. So, Andrew, I don't know if that answers your question. I don't know if I've misunderstood what you were asking there. If not, then just pop another question on there. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Next question from Answer Beloy. Why is the focus on the hole size and not core size? What impact does a bigger hole have? Why would one go for a diamond bit with higher diameter if the same results can be obtained with a relatively smaller diameter? I ask this because different designs often imply different bit sizes, which leads to different hole sizes. Answer absolutely spot on, sir. Uh, a very good. It's, this is more a, an observation, I guess, than a question, but you, you're absolutely correct. The, the focus. Um, Generally speaking, in designing a borehole, the, the geo will know the minimum core size, the minimum sample volume that you require to do your various your various tests. Um, and, and so you're absolutely correct. The core size is, is correct, 100%. If, however, we want to, after the hole is complete, we will run some geophysical probes, some geophysical, uh, do some geophysical work in, in a borehole that requires a certain hole size. Um, I'm involved in some projects now where we're um, at depth, we want to run some, some geophysical probes and there's a big debate. Do we drill an NQ hole that's 76 millimeter or an HQ hole at 96? HQ hole is much more comfortable for our probes, but, but it's a hell of a lot more expensive. So to some extent, hole size can play, can play a role as well if we're going to run some geophysical probes. But you, you are, you are, Totally uh, uh, correct. There, there's no point just drilling a big hole because we want uh, um, and, and get a small a small core sample. It's it's a balance, and that's why an understanding of different core barrels um, and the hole size and the core size uh, uh, is important for a geo to understand. Um, um, and I, I hope that answers your question. Um, but it's a very good observation. You obviously you you obviously involved in some work. Um, because you've worded your question very, very smartly. Um, I, I hope I've answered it. Um, should we should we move on? Let's see. Um, yes. um, Andrea has a follow up question to her previous question. Yes. Um, what is the the depth that we can look at? Would it be less than one meter? Oh, um, Andrea, ask me who's going to win the next World Cup. <laughs> um, um, yeah, look, my it depends upon how you're drilling and the bit size and so on. But yes, I guess that order of magnitude. Yes, I, I would say that order of magnitude is around about a meter drilling with no with no flushing system. 
I would guess that order of magnitude. If you want to, you're more than more than welcome to give me a buzz sometime and we can chat specifically through what you're talking about doing there. Maybe I can give you a, a, a better answer. Um, uh, but yes, that order of magnitude, I would I would say you're about right. Yeah, we have another question from Chipejo. How yes. do you solve water contamination of samples in Chipejo? You're in trouble in RC drilling if the compressor compressor is not strong enough to create the needed flushing velocity of chips. Okay, Chipejo, great great answer. I should refuse to answer this question on the basis that you use the term RC and not dual tube RC, but we'll let you off this time. Okay, um, it's it's a good question, um, uh, uh, Chipejo. Um, guys, in a in an RC drilling system, a dual tube RC system, as we spoke about earlier, it's a pneumatic system, and uh, if we if we drill below the water table, we'll have water ingress into into the hole. Now, one of the theories behind RC drilling is the 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 pressure of the air as it flows past the bit will be sufficient to keep the water out so you won't have water flowing into the borehole so you technically theoretically drilling rc below the water table you should be able to get a dry sample coming up the top or at worst a dampish sample but the deeper you drill below the water table the greater the hydrostatic pressure of the water and the more likely it is to flow into the borehole and it then becomes a function of the size of your compressor. Uh, that's wrong. The, the pressure output of your compressor. If you've got a, a very high pressure compressor or a booster, you can keep the water out. If you haven't, you can't. So, Chebeka, the short answer, sir, is that if your if your the the output pressure of your compressor is not sufficient to keep the water out, you're going to get a you're going to get a wet sample. There's there's not much more you can do. You and that's why they use boosters. Uh, on deep uh, um, dual tube RC RC holes, so there's there's not a great deal you can you can do there, unfortunately. Um, should we look at Kamaleko there? Um, yes, uh, yes. My question is with regards to percussion drilling. How do we validate the depth of the hole against the given depth by the driller operator on site? I understand there's cases where you have the core barrel sticking out on surface. Let me read this again. Micro with regards to percussion drilling. How do we validate the depth of the hole against the given depth by the drilling operator? I'm not sure about the last part. I understand there's cases where you have the core barrel sticking out on surface. I understand that, but 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 let's just look at the first part of the question here. How do you validate the depth of the hole against the given depth? Um, um by the drilling operator okay i think i understand here what you're saying uh, uh camelico i said earlier guys that that hole depth is obviously critical it's no good drilling if we don't know where the heck we are um and 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 i can tell you with no disrespect to anyone i can tell you that very very frequently hole depths are incorrectly reported so so we have to know how to measure hole depth and I'm going to try and do this with my fingers. I'm going to see if you understand. When we when we measure hole depth, we measure hole depth using what we call a stick up. So let's let's look at it this way. I've got a certain number of draw rods. I know they're all three meters, and I can multiply by three. Then I've got my core barrel or downhill hammer or whatever else I've got at the bottom of the drill string. So that is my total drill string length. So when I drill, for me to calculate the depth of the borehole, all I've got to calculate or measure is how much of the drill string is sticking up above ground level. And then I can measure this. It's, it's just not so easy to do, but, but you've got to work out a way to do that. You've got to measure the length of the drill string sticking above ground level. So therefore, I can calculate what's below ground level, and I've got my whole depth. We've got to do that all the time. We've got to check depth all the time, particularly in deep holes. Um, in, in one of the training programs we do, one of our online training programs, it's a question I ask geos. And I've had hundreds 
literally hundreds of geologists go through our drilling skills for geologists program. And I think I've had four people who've ever been able to explain to me correctly how to how to check borehole depth. So it's done by what we call a stick up method. Uh, Kamaleko, I'm not sure what you mean by the second part of your question. So again, if you want to give me a buzz or send me a mail or a WhatsApp, we can have a look at that second part of your question. Okay, and hopefully, hopefully answer answer it for you. Um, okay. Um, uh, okay, I think. Um, okay, I think all that Prince is just saying here. He says he enjoyed it. Thank you, Prince. I'm very, very pleased that you that you did. And I'm glad you got something out of it. I'm just scanning through this quickly, and I look forward to getting your request on LinkedIn. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, okay, is there is, are those all the questions there, uh, um, uh, uh, Tanya? That's all the the questions on. Um, uh, there, there's one that has come up by Lima. Um, um, thanks for the marvelous presentation. I would like to know what technical information we should provide to the. The contractor. Um, might, might I suggest, Colin, that you chat with um, yes. Lima off offline? Yes. Um, because we, we're running into a, a time problem. Yes. And, and yeah, um, Lima, that's a very complicated question, but you're more than welcome to shoot me an email or contact me through the GSSA and I'll, I'll help you where I can. Okay. Very, very, take a long time to answer that question. Okay. Tanya, I'm, I'm going to disappear then. Okay. Um, thank okay, you, guys. Colin, thank you very much Colin, indeed for doing it. If you'll just send me the, the image for the, the safety um, yes. thing, send it to me. Um, today, still, and then I'll stick it on the, the chat box for everybody. Fantastic. I'll thank do you that. So okay. much for your time, Colin. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good to meet you all, and hopefully, we'll see you all in the field one day. Hopefully, not all at the same drill site. There'll be too many, but uh, <laughs> hopefully, we'll see you. Thanks very much indeed for having me. Bye, Thanks, guys. Colin. Bye Cheers. Bye. bye. Okay, folks, we actually have um, a, a short break coming up. Um, so if we can be back by 10.40, is it when we'll need to start again? You can unmute yourself and, and chat, um, but go ahead. Hi, Colin. Hi, who is that? Llewellyn. Sorry? Llewellyn. Hello, Llewellyn. How are you, sir? Fine, fine. Good, good, good. How um how are things going at, at Namdev? All good? All good, all good. Very cold, no complaints further. Only the weather. <laughs> good. Please <laughs> say hi to everyone there for me, will you? I will do so, Colin. I will do so. Excellent. Excellent, Duella. Thank you for joining today, hey? No, it's, it, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Good, 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 good. We uh, look forward to seeing you again in the near future, hey? Yeah, no, we will. We, you are always welcome, and we will wait for you. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Duella. You take care. Thanks, guys. I'm going to head off now and go and have uh, and get myself a cup of tea. Cheers, guys. Take care.
Okay, folks, before we start the uh, next section, um, okay, that's that's better. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Please make sure that your name is correct, that you have renamed yourself to your own name. Um, also, recordings. We are recording the, the session. We will make the recordings available to everybody through the GSSA YouTube channel. You don't have to ask for it separately. You don't have to record it yourself. You can't record it yourself. Everybody will have access to it on the free GSSA YouTube channel. I'll talk about CPD a little bit later. And also just a reminder to keep your uh, microphones muted and your videos off during the, the, the presentations. And please do not fiddle with the, um, the controls. Okay, so at this stage, I would like to ask um, uh, Colleen, Colleen Meissner, if you would please get yourself ready to do your presentation. Sure. Okay. Hi, Tanya. How are you? Hi, Colleen. <laughs> do you need to share your screen or are you just going to chat? No, I would like to share this screen, please. Okay. Just get to the meeting. Okay, can I share? Yes. Okay. Okay, uh, just give me an indication if you can see my no, screen. Not yet. No, not at all. After you've selected your screen to share, bottom right hand, there we go. Now we can see it perfectly. Thank okay. you. Wonderful. Go ahead. Okay, great. So, um, right. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, I just need to put this down. So, um, sorry, I can't get this closed. Can you just give me a moment, please? Actually, just trying to get something close here, and I can't. Um, okay, sorry, Tanya, I'm just going to start again. Uh, let me try sharing again. Not showing, just a minute, sorry. Okay, okay. Um, 
Hello, Tanya. Hello, hey, friends. Yeah, please, I think uh, you are still recording. Would you consider pausing the recording and probably continuing when we are about to start the next session? Uh, yes, friends? Prince, the recordings will be edited to take out all the dead space and all the chit chat in between. Oh, okay. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Colleen, is there anything I can do to assist thee? Colleen? Are you there? Looks like Colleen's internet has, has kicked her out. We'll just give her a minute or two to get in. Otherwise, we will just continue on and she can do her presentation just now. It looks like Colleen has more greater problems than just the screen sharing. Masi, are you ready to, to go? Hi, Tanya. Yes, I am. Okay. Okay. Our next presenter up is uh, Masi Zindwana from Anglo-American, from the Iron Ore. Now, you spent the morning... Oh, okay. Sorry, uh, Masi. I see Colleen has just... Uh, arrived. Let's see if we can get going on that quickly. No worries. Hi, Colleen. Okay, we can see your screen, we can hear you, we can see you. Perfect. Okay, how do I get that down? 
become uh, just here yeah, minimized. Good morning, everyone. Apology for the uphold. And I would like to thank all for this opportunity to quickly take you all through some of the products we have developed for the industry. Firstly, and at its core, UCP Africa provides its clients with a holistic core storage solution, which offers a multitude of design benefits for our users, from quick and easy on-site assembly to improved handling ability and even access uh, improved access and visibility of your core while it lies inside the core drive. Our products have been specifically designed with the geologists and the geological workflows in mind. Now I'd like to discuss some of the projects that we have been working on over the last few months. And firstly, let's start with the all new Scanet Photos application. Finally, you can put your cool sheet into your pocket for free with the all new Scanet Photos app by UCP Africa. It is a simple iPhone app which can import, capture, rename, sort, and export multiple projects called Drive Photographs all in one convenient location. You simply swipe to browse through your boreholes and inspect any core drive photos of interest at the push of a button. Uh, digitizing and sharing your borehole core drive photographs has never been easier and uh, even more, never rename your core drive photographs again. Apology. Okay. One digital, once uh, you have digitized your borehole, you can now block the core uh, digitally using Scanet. Um, it is purpose-built workstation software program where geologists are able to geologically, structurally, and geotechnically lock their boreholes. Um, it is time efficient, accurate, and precise, and Scanet can improve your workflows and data collection abilities. It is a software program developed as a tool to allow you scientists to obtain and control data and information quickly and easily. Once you've logged, you can access your data in three of the scanner display modules. The first being the three-dimensional orthographic representation where users can visualize the recorded information in real space orientation. You can even observe how some features might possibly interact with other recorded features in your borehole. You can also expand any of the planes of inter uh, uh, that you're interested in and even export this as a DXF file to be used in any guide based modeling program. Then we have the Scanet Stereo Net, where users can view poles to plane, great circles, and even display calculated means of poles to observe any potential lines of intersection which might be occurring. Means are displayed using uh, are displayed showing the calculated standard deviations as well. And at the click of the mouse scan it will display the plunge and trend of any line of intersection displayed. And lastly, in our composite log, we users can view a stitched image of the core alongside the recorded information. Finally, users can scroll from surface to target and access generated information alongside an actual image of the core. This uh, projection can also be exported via PDF or PNG, and it can be shared amongst your team and um, even it, it can even be attached to specific reports. Uh, it's just one of the many ways we at UCP Africa can add value to you and your projects. Um, information generated by Scanet can be exported into an Excel spreadsheet we, you can access and validate your data with ease. Um, it is fully customizable and integratable with your database management software. 
Scanet can save you time and improve your data collection. Please feel free to visit our website for more information on Scanet and many of our other products we have developed for the industry. And I would like to thank you very much for this opportunity. Should anyone have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us for assistance. Once again, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Colleen. And thank you very much to, to UCP Africa for your annual sponsorship. We do appreciate it. Anytime. Okay, next up then is, is, is Mercy. And as we've said, Colin has now shown you how to do the drilling, how to get your sample out. Massey is now going to talk to us about what do we do with it afterwards? How do we log it? What are the important things we need to, to remember then? So Massey, over to you. Thank you, Tanya. I'll be sharing my screen. Let me know when you can see it. Yes, we can see it. Just put it into presentation mode. Great. Um, Here we are. We can see it. We can hear you perfectly. I think uh, before we go into that, uh, I see the public that you shared shows the younger version of me. Uh, <laughs> so for those that haven't seen the face before, um, I am bearded at the moment relative to the image that is in the profile that uh, went out for advertising this. As Tanya said, um, I'll be talking to you about what uh, geologists need to know about borehole logging. Um, and for the purposes of bandwidth, I'll then switch off my camera. Um, uh, just a sec, my slide. Is it moving on your side, Tanya? It looks stuck on my, there we go. Um, so the presentation is structured into six, six uh, sub um, topics. Um, and I think, building on a lot of what Colin has already touched on, on, on the drilling. Um, and I think it's very important that we, we not forget that part because a lot of it and good drilling informs good geology afterwards. Um, the key thing for me though is um, all of this needs to be done and executed with the end in mind. So um, we'll go through the context setting um, and how to wrap our heads around what the end goal of logging is, uh, is about. Talk briefly and touch base again on the drill management and those aspects that uh, Colin was referring to in terms of what geos need to be looking out for in the, in the drill sites and managing a drill site. And obviously that goes with quality assurance and quality control principles. Um, logging then will get into the details of what goes into a database because um, called logging is a data collection process and then the end in mind connecting the dots. Before we jump right into it, uh, disclaimer, uh, as you've seen, I'm an employee of the uh, of Kumba, oh, a division of um, Anglo-American and I am a fellow of the Geological Society and registered with SACNASP. Even though my time is um, sponsored by the business, I am, although uh, dedicating my time to this event on my personal capacity and not as a, a representative of Anglo-American or the GSSA or SACNASP for that matter. Um, as, as such, any opinions I share here are attributable only to itself. So in terms of um, setting the context, um, we, we're dealing with, uh, when you're drilling exploration, you're dealing with a, a, a mineralization, uh, targeting an ore body. And these are 3D entities uh, that occur on surfaces of the earth. Um, and the critical aspect here is to remember that we're dealing with a mineral system we map and we present the data in two dimensions, uh, typically an X, Y, Z, uh, the coordinate systems vary across the world and across businesses. Where drilling comes in place is completing the picture on the third dimension. And typically if we can't drill, we look at road cuts or river cuts or trenches, but uh, the more relied and called upon uh, method of uh, completing the, the third dimension, the Z axis is uh, drilling. The, 
criticality to also remember is that um, if you're working in a major company, this this information leads up uh, to um, list, listing information that goes into the uh, stock exchanges supported by RNR statements. And the part we're going to dwell a lot on is on the mineral resource side of the conversation where with increasing confidence, um, you decreasing the risk in, in the deposit. And typically the big players are looking at uh, deposits that are spanning in the 30 to 50 year uh, span of operation. And where drilling then fits in that value chain, you'd start um, maybe the, roughly the first 10 years of a target in your exploration phase where prospecting and resource estimation are critical components of your drilling strategy goes into the planning phase and this is where your mining engineering and metallurgy uh, specialists come in play in terms of assisting completing the modifying factors that convert your resource into a reserve and construction comes only after we, we have decided that the deposit is um, carrying a reasonable prospect of eventual economic extraction and leading up and setting up your your um, uh, your mining and your development post exploration and uh, extraction of the mineral. The key thing I think for me in this conversation is that most geos uh, forget about the principles of drilling and the principles of this uh, framework past the construction phase. When it comes to actual exploration, there's two critical opportunities that involve a geologist. It's the geometallurgy space where um, the, the nature of the ore body evolves over time um, and the ore body itself, the extraction properties are not a linear um, extraction that you can base on your initial set of uh, exploration results. You have to set yourself up as a learning organization and as a learning geo, being curious as Colin said, to test and, and, and still satisfy yourself that your ore body is, you, you at least understand how it behaves in the, in the beneficiation process. Um, there is, of course, uh, also opportunities of uh, what we call brownfield exploration. That's typically the conversations around um, if it's within the tenement um, or the mining right where life of mine expansion happens. These are things that are typically outside your budget cycles uh, uh, beyond five years of your of your current life. Some operations operate for 100 years with a five-year life of mine, which uh, tells you that they are very conservative in terms of uh, work in that brownfield space, but nonetheless, the positive here it is being done. So getting into then the discussion around uh, mineral systems um, and the basics of uh, tire generation, there are four critical components that lead up to an economic deposit. And the key thing here, economic deposits are anomalies uh, in, in the surface of the earth. Um, and the factors that lead to the concentration are very dependent on what deposit you deal with. But the critical factors is that you need a ligand, um, Typically, and this is a conversation around metal deposits, a ligand being the one aspect that attaches or binds to the metal you're after. You need a source to extract the metal from. It could be uh, an existing rock, it could be a volcanic uh, emplacement, whatever the, the type of deposit you're dealing with. You need plumbing and a pathway for those fluids and the ligand to migrate to a particular um, setting. And the third component is, um, is, is, is the trap where the deposit occurs, where you trap the, and concentrate the deposit and obviously then flush out the system being the fourth and the outflow. What you want is the remainder of the fluid, not to dilute your um, economies of scale in the deposit to flush out the, the remainder of, um, of, of the fluid. Uh, and this this framework really is is in my view applicable to almost all the deposits you can think of. You just need to understand the style of emplacement and the um, the mode of mineral occurrence that would lead to how you define these four components. Applying and understanding this framework is for me one of the basic components around understanding what your role in a drilling campaign as a geologist starts off with. 
the important uh, relationship to that is the major geologic and uh, tectonic events um, where here just illustrating is that closely related to the major tectonic events in the Earth's history. There's been significant deposits um, that, um, that have been emplaced and understanding that relationship of uh, major tectonics is important as well as an input into how you set up your understanding of the context within which the drilling is happening. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, in the South African case with a bushveld complex being the biggest PGE deposit you can think of, the, the major tectonic events around 2 billion years, and you see the spike there. Uh, in the iron ore space, you see a lot of superior type uh, deposits pitching up just before the 2 billion uh, mark, um, between 2.5 and then 2 billion mark. That does not mean those time horizons are the only time horizons you need to, to be um, looking into to find economic deposits, but it certainly highlights the fact that understanding your tectonic history is fundamental to understanding the context within which you, you're dealing with the drilling air, which you have to log afterwards. And that goes with the field uh, regional settings. Um, this is an image of uh, the terrain within which Kumba operates uh, looking for iron ore. And obviously, as I've mentioned, maps are two dimensional uh, features, but the equally important is what do you see in the field? And this being an image I took on a particular site, looking roughly northwards, um, you would basically um, as a geofamiliarize yourself with what the layer of the land looks like. Because remember, a drill hole is a spot on the surface of the earth, and everything that you interpret or you log in the process uh, and describe needs to be consistent with um, the two dimensions that you see on the surface of the earth. It cannot be that uh, the field settings tell you one thing and a bowl tells you another. The disparity between those two things, that's where your geology skills are called to action to explain that difference. If the difference is uh, scientific, that's what you need to be guiding the conversation towards. If the difference is related to what Colin was referring to in terms of uh, mishandling the samples, then you need to be awake to those uh, potential pitfalls and manage them proactively. So um, going into one of these things to see is um, on the left-hand side is the stratigraphic succession of the area I just showed you. On the right-hand side is what you typically see on the, on the bowl. And understanding this, you'd realize that um, it does happen that the stratigraphic succession is put in, in, in sequence and in time sequence um, and chronology, uh, but in, in your encounter, things might be jumbled up. And being able to see, for example, here, the case group, which sits at the top, is sandwiched between two older uh, parts of the Transvaal supergroup. And there are telltales and markers in your core that tells you of this relationship. And this is why it, is, it becomes important as a geo to not only think of a drill exercise or a drilling campaign as putting a number of holes in the ground it's instead, as uh, Colin captured it, is an exercise of retrieving representative samples of the targets you, you are after. And uh, those telltale signs can easily be lost if your drill samples are being mismanaged. So um, drills, Colin has uh, probably showed a few pictures of this. Um, this is a Roco drill. Um, one of the sponsors of the event, Rosant, um, owns and manufactures these drill rigs. Uh, they are the older fleet they, they, they would have spoken about. Uh, still very reliable and good machine to, to work with for diamond drilling specifically. And the key thing for me here talks to, to the fact that be cognizant of the environment as well, the environmental factors, um, because you'd see in this environment, it's in a dry, harsh, desert, semi-arid area. So um, being able to conserve the environment as best as possible while it's still in the early stages of exploration is part of what a geo needs to be managing on site. That comes with specific site layouts and setups to minimize the footprint, to preserve portions of the topsoils and, and throw away the 
Colin said, don't call it sludge, the cuttings. The cuttings he was referring to, you basically would put them and you dispose of those, you preserve the topsoil. And once you're done with the drilling, need to help the site rehabilitate while you're in the process of deciding whether that is economic to extract or not. Um, I've been to a couple of uh, historic uh, drill sites where you find that um, the only thing that you use that pitched up in that site cared about was drilling the hole and left it. Some of the boreholes are still leaking diesel. Um, being brought to the surface by the groundwater running up the hole, which is really untidy and uh, not good for the environment. And it attaches to the legal considerations that Colin was referring to. In some instances, um, you might be dealing with uh, drilling within a community. This was a drill site in uh, the Eastern Bushveld uh, site in, in a town called Pegasport. Uh, it does happen that your mineralization extends within areas where people live um, and being mindful of bylaws, municipal and uh, traditional laws or customary laws that are applicable to the area you're working with is quite important. Um, in this particular site, 24-hour drilling was uh, a no-no because you don't want to be having a drill rig noise at night close to people's houses and even drilling within the day you need to be consider considerate and sensitive that you are within a, a community and make sure that um, you do not leave the area um, displeasing to, to, to the residents. This rig is um, one of the important developments in a technology sense. Um, from my perspective as a geologist is that when these conversations around technology start, people quickly think that it's a reduction of manpower, which is actually not the case. In, in this example, this machine actually has two operators instead of one, um, like this one, there's one drill operator here, there's two. Um, this machine is an automated rod handler system. Then in the front sits a, an operator that uh, um, handles the rod handling system. And on the side here facing the back of the picture is uh, the drill operator. And this is the, the rotation elements and the drive that, of the drilling action. There's a, even still newer versions where the, the two operators are still two. Uh, but um, on, 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 on our site, we have female operators and they are in an enclosed cabin, um, which is still off the machine. The advantage of this machine is it considerably improves the safety management aspects because most injuries you'll find on a drill sites are normally hand injuries uh, because of size. Um, and these are the things that uh, as a you need to carry in, 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 your, in your understanding that it is not just about the hole in the ground. There are human beings um, that are going to be handling the, the samples that ultimately as a geologist, you be uh, piecing together to tell a story of the earth. Now coming into, into the discussion around drill management, um, the first thing that uh, needs to be crystal and clear um, is whether the drill campaign you're on is a brown field or a green field uh, exploration exercise. In the brown field, the critical thing is here is that the mineralization style is mostly understood. And um, please uh, never take a brown field exercise as um, the geology or the genetic model is a done and concluded case. Um, geology is a very interesting uh, exercise. Yeah. Thank you. Um, geology is a very interesting exercise and I think um, the genetic model is typically regionally based. So it's important that um, you as a geo, you bring the understanding to a de deposit scale. As you see here showing from the geophysics, um, the bottom is an area that uh, we know and there's mining existing. And slightly to the north of that, uh, there's prospective um, mineralization occurrence which um, occurs in a different um, modality than, than what is known currently. Um, the management of your drill campaign is not about the hole in the ground. And I've said this already, and Colin has, um, has highlighted this. It is about the representativity of those samples. And 
it can make or break your project, particularly expansion projects. If you conduct an expansion exercise um, incorrectly, you could limit um, potential uh, mining expansion discussions where the initial conversation was based on the first extraction, but there is potential of economic extraction. And the more cost, um, cost effective your mining exercise is, the better you are able to expand the life of mine. But the cost effective strategy relies on good and well defined geology understanding. And Colin has already touched this, and I, I enjoy always talking after Colin because it's always about the curiosity, regardless whether it's your first year in the site or you are now the one uh, managing the entire drill campaign across a province. The critical thing is always teach your eye to always look out for the thing that you haven't seen in the previous borehole, because that small um, and fundamental um, difference could be a telltale sign for something um, that, that you need to pay attention to. And much more importantly, you pay attention also to, to the human beings uh, that you work with on, this, on, on that site. The rest of the conversation uh, really, and you would have seen by now, it's, it's tailored for core drilling. We're going to be talking about diamond core drilling. As Colin has highlighted, this is an extraction of uh, a cylindrical um, soil. So um, someone is playing with the recording button. Uh, Sorry, Marcy. Um, people, please do not fiddle with things on, on, the, um, on the controls. We're trying to do this for everybody. So please leave the stuff alone. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Ed. So core drilling um, extracts a, typically a cylindrical uh, representation of uh, the vertical or uh, Z dimension of your area. And I say it's non-destructive um, to the internal structures of the, of the rock, but obviously it is a destructive way of sampling because you, you, you are disturbing the earth within you setting up the drill sites. But the key thing about core drilling, it is um, more representative of uh, samples that uh, of the in-situ rock and uh, it requires um, a regular check and inspection of the drill quality, but the, the, the accuracy that you'll get out of the core exercise is much better than a ground or chips uh, from a different type of uh, drilling. The, the one thing though then to note, relatively speaking, core drilling is time consuming and it is cost expensive and understanding the cost structures uh, that Colin was talking about is fundamentally important because you do not want to keep a driller a drilling and struggling with a hole, especially if it's a technical issue in the drilling process and incur unreasonable costs on the drilling uh, side, because from that point on, the quality of sample that you will get is going to be a poor sample. Cost sizes, uh, Colin talked about uh, this quite a lot. Um, with the imperial system, which is used in North America. Um, we typically work in the metric system and the typical size for, for exploration samples is finishing or the, across the mineralization. Uh, across the mineralization is the NQ size uh, range. Um, in some deposits, you could go down to BQ as well. Uh, but uh, as Colin explained, the construction of the hole, you start with a bigger diameter at the top, um, typically it would be an H2 size, um, and you then narrow down through casings uh, to, to the desired end size across the mineralization. Where it comes uh, to PQ size, that's typically used um, for, for metallurgy test work because it's um, the size and the weight of size required for, for some of those tests, you need a bigger volume of sample. And that's typically even more expensive and more time consuming. Triple tube uh, type uh, drilling is the one that Colin was referring to that has a third um, tube inside the drill string, slightly reduces uh, the sample you'll retrieve, but it improves your recovery um, of, of, of core. This is typically used in the geotechnical uh, assessments uh, to, to understand the stability 
either of the of the pit or the shop, whatever you're dealing with. This schematic um, is based on true data from one of the sites I, I managed. Um, and the line is basically showing a cost profile on, on what the expenditures would have looked like. And um, this is to show that um, the activities and what I've already touched on in understanding your context, your regional um, geological setting, the mineral systems at play is a time consuming exercise um, as well. And it's an important exercise to set up your drilling strategy and uh, generating a target. But when it comes to cost management, once you start putting a drill rig on the, on the ground, um, your costs significantly increase. And this is to highlight the importance of being aware to uh, on, on, on cost management and contract management principles, because that cost escalation needs to lead uh, to a return on investment, which is in the production space. And I've separated in this uh, production into two because I found in my experience that most people arrive uh, at the production phase and they convince themselves that all that there is to know about the deposit is final. There is still opportunities that lie in life of mine expansion. In some cases, this could mean low grade or opportunities. In some instances, it does mean high grade or mineralization that might not have been known uh, in the mode of occurrence in specific uh, areas. And obviously the cost would then drop off uh, post mining when you've depleted the deposit. And I expect it to to be rehabilitating. Critical thing is geology, drilling, and target and mining are always and planning, uh, mine planning at the background. They are always in an iterative um, process where your current drilling informs your next plan, which informs the next target uh, plans that you need to be putting in place as a geologist. And the key thing is the more you drill, the accurately you drill, you're decreasing risk for the business in terms of um, recovery. But the important also to note before the mining exercises, you need to go through critical stage gates. The last one, which is most, um, alludes most geos in my opinion, because it's typically handled by mining engineers. This is the concept stage of a, of, of, um, of a project where the geos focus on data collection, but um, limit themselves in helping the engineer connect the dots. The engineers focus typically on the best way of uh, extracting the deposit, but um, the, the way and the interpretation of the deposit is always a conversation that needs to be guided by the geologists and never forget the mineral systems that are at play. Remember, I, I spoke about the ligand and the source, the plumbing, the trap, and the uh, fluid escape pathways. Those four critical elements are generally are always at play. And please do not forget those things because they inform um, the, the processes that drive that iteration between target generation, exploration, mine expansion discussions. And that's a space where geologists needs to be driving the conversation and supporting business, uh, uh, critical business decisions. Now um, we can move over to the drilling QAQC methods. When it comes to drilling QAQC methods, this is, the fundamental piece of work that the geo needs to satisfy themselves. They have um, understood the process of drilling, the extraction, the packing and storage of their core samples before the logging starts. And if the samples were not ruined or compromised during the drilling stage, the next stage that the samples get compromised in is in getting them out of the drill site to where the logging happens. In most instances, I would, and the environment allowing out, I generally prefer preliminary logging being done on site. Um, reasons for this is a hard lesson I learned as a very young geologist where I, a lot of core boxes um, while transporting them and obviously things fell out of the box. Had I not listened to my then uh, boss and, and mentor now, 
of uh, having a preliminary log with photographs on site, I wouldn't have known how to piece together uh, those core boxes that fell over completely. It was three core boxes uh, dealing with a total of about um, 21 meters that were compromised in the middle of the, uh, of the borehole. And the fact that I had photographic evidence of what it looked like um, on site before we even picked it up in the preliminary log. And obviously the markings that I'll talk to in the next sessions do not underestimate the criticality of that part. However, it is not always possible, which then leads us to the criticality of making sure you also plan to how you're going to move your core samples from where the drilling is happening to where the logging will be happening because those could be easily kilometers apart, uh, often uh, uneven and rough terrains that you need to travel with the core. However, the primary focus or the, the initial steps of um, QHUC um, include what is referred to as a directional survey. To, to explain this, we, we're going to have a a, an engineering exercise. And the question really here is what is the connection between the, the pivot in the neck of a dove and the concept of uh, directional um, drilling? The importance of, of that stability is basically how, as the whole progresses with depth as a geo um, or doing the directional survey, you know your position in space and it's an X, Y, Z location and remember one of the things that Colin touched on is being accurate on depth and this is one critical component of that depth accuracy. What it is about is a gyroscopic um, method. There are other methods of doing this but uh, typically preferred method lately is a gyroscopic method where the propagation of a, of a hole is is basically set up by a, a gyroscope which maintains um, a rotor and a spin axis and a gimbal, which remain fixed relative to the movement of, of the hole. And as the probe goes down the hole, it, it records at whatever intervals is set every second, every 10 seconds or every minute, whatever the set intervals, its position in space. And it's always reading its location or its position in space relative to the, 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 the angles between the, the three components of the gyroscope. And this is a critical thing to understand because what it leads to is that even if you're drilling a bow hole and you say you're drilling it a vertical hole, it's never a true vertical hole. There is rotation or deviation from, from, from the planned uh, hole. And typically you get this uh, in terms either in a graphic representation from whoever did the work for you, or they'll give you a CSV file that tells you the power number where it was drilled and then gives you the direction and the depth of, of the power. And as you can see the, yeah, the hole was planned for vertical, but it's not exactly minus 90, it, it changes. And those millimetric differences are quite important. In some instances it can um, shift up, up to 10 degrees. So it's uh, very important to know that propagation um, with relative depth um, of, of, your, of your gyro survey, because that shows you the path of the drill hole. And obviously as a geologist, you need to know this and correct for it in your interpretation at a later stage. In some instances, you want as a geo, and this is typical of precious metals like gold and platinum, where you want to drill a particular hole and you intersect the main mineralization, then pull out um, in, to above where your mineralization is and intentionally force your drill string to deviate. And this is uh, basically something referred to as deflections. Um, it's more cost effective than going back all the way up to surface and drilling another hole 10 meters away. Um, and you you would have your original hole as the mother hole. And then when you're done with that and you understand all your mineralization and testing, you go out and you drill all these plays in as many directions as practically possible. And that piece of information helps in the 
accurate modeling of what you're going to be dealing with, with uh, as a survey, um, as, a, as a geologist post, um, post the logging. The critical aspect here is your accuracy of your deflection surveys, because you need to know exactly how, in which direction that hole you planned it, in which direction did it actually go. The next uh, phase, which touches on, um, on, on QQC methods is what is referred to as core recovery. Um, the critical part in, in this conversation is knowing what was drilled or what the drill advance was versus what was, um, what was recovered from the hole. So in typical exercises where your drill string is three meters or rather your drill rod is three meters, your drill string um, advice is three meters at a time. However, that does not suggest or mean that your, the core inside your barrel is three meters. It's always going to be around three meters, give or take, let's say five, five centimeters in, in what I've, I've, I've gotten used to but you can assume that number. So it's, it's where the, the first part of the conversation is the total core recovery, abbreviated in here as uh, TCR. If you remember what I said, this I prefer it being done and it's best being done at the drill site um, if, if at all possible. And with um, drill contractors that are investing in making sure they deliver quality samples, they would normally do this as well. And your duty as a geologist is to verify that part, not to do the entire core recovery in the string, but to accurately verify that and spot check that it's been done, it's been done correctly. What it is, is the total length of core that was recovered with each uh, drill run. In this example here, the recovery was 2.98. Then the next part that becomes uh, useful in, in understanding and also preferably at the drill site is the solid core. Now what this is, is typically core that is fully cylindrical and solid and on average two and a half, two to two and a half times the diameter of the core you're dealing with. And the importance of understanding the solid core is how much of the core is affected by structures, joints, and veins, and broken horizons underground, and what other portions of the core are actually competent pieces of core. The relationship between total uh, core recovery and the soil leads to the conversation of what is a rock quality designation, which is uh, summarized as an RQD. And this is typically expressed as a, as a percentage and it gives an indication uh, of the competence of the rock you're dealing with. So the higher your fracture frequency and all of those things, the less uh, metrics you'll get in your solid core, which means it reduces your RQD. And this is where the conversation with geotech engineering starts. However, it's not a geotech, purely geotech conversation. It gives you as a geo an understanding of the set of um, structures that you need to pay attention to. The higher your, your, your RQD, the better your recovery is. And obviously in your drill and blast exercise, you will also have a solid or re relatively better drilling uh, versus a lower RQD environment where most of your blast energy will escape through the fractures. So that's typically what you as a geo need to be psyching uh, yourself to, to understand. In this example here, uh, RQD is roughly 69%. Um, and it's, it's mainly driven by areas where you have intense fracturing and, and broke, breakage. However, you need to always consider that natural breaks do not affect your RQD in, in, in instances uh, where the, the solid core was broken, artificial breaks was broken uh, by, by a driller to allow it to fit in a box. It's, it's natural breaks that you want to take into consideration. At this point, uh, my opportunity to drink water, we're gonna do a quick exercise. Um, one of the questions that was asked in the previous talk was how, how do you know as a geologist 
uh, what the depth is. Um, Colin explained this. Let's see if uh, we explained, uh, or rather, the explanation stuck. The the exercise that we're going to be doing is um, is 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 basically an assessment of what um, the drill should be. Um, the answer is already given there. Um, you you can calculate um, yourselves and satisfy yourself that uh, it is that that depth. Um, after after this, this slide, uh, Tanya, we can take a five minute break just uh, to to recuperate, and then we'll continue with with the with the with the rest of, of, of the discussion. However, what I want to highlight on this page is, is that um, the approach you can satisfy yourself and uh, most of the QEQC on site I was referring to is a layout of this fashion. Uh, this is, is, is a form I, I implemented in, in one of my uh, campaigns where this information we typically would write there and the drillers can normally assist with some of it. Um, but obviously the, this, the confidence of, of, of all of this, uh, the onus is on, on the geologist. Um, the information is just about the drill, um, the drilling itself, what, the, what was the whole number, which rig drilled it on what date, the method, um, the start and the end of the date and the date in which it was delivered to wherever the logging happens. The core barrel and the hammer is the attachments of the drill string at the bottom that Colin explained. The quill rod is the rod that uh, the rotation unit is in contact with and it's typically always above surface. So when you're referring to stick up, it's typically a portion of the quill rod that is above the surf surface. Odd rods um, are rods that are an odd um, length. It's not the standard length. So in this example, the standard length and the cool rod is three meters and all, there are no odd rods. So that's why it's zero. Then the total is basically a total of, of everything in the drill string. And the stick up is the portion of the drill string that stays above surface. Um, the next thing I just want to highlight is this 10 point uh, quality and uh, safety or sheet checks. Um, and uh, you, set, you can set up these as yes or no answers. And this helps uh, the total site management as a geologist where you're not only looking at the safety stuff, you're looking at the environmental stuff, you're looking at the people elements in terms of their uh, health and hygiene, and obviously all the other uh, procedural matters that the actual drilling exercise uh, needs to be governed with. At the bottom, I, I speak of a chain of custody to always know uh, wh who handled the samples and how it was handled between the drilling and the logging. Because in this, as I've already explained, the next opportunity after drilling to compromise the quality of the core is in the transport um, portion. And after the transport portion, it's on the portion of preparing for, for logging, which is taking it from wherever it was stored, putting it and laying it out for, for the geologist to log or you as a geologist laying it out for yourself. So, so that's, that's that. At the bottom, and this helps for me with part of connecting the dots as you go along and piecing the dots, is a quick yes or no answer and an estimate of uh, thickness if you've encountered mineralization and this for me has been a useful uh, tip uh, exercise where sometimes the person who's funding and expecting the results from the exploration is not on the site could be in a, in a head office or across um, the continents uh, in another part of the world where they want to know how the campaign is going and randomly you'll get a call to say um, what did you encounter any ore in the previous however many uh, boreholes you've drilled already? And knowing and having this yes or no answer and that number there, it's not for you to think of on top of your head, but to give a rough estimate of what you're dealing with and um, keep a structured way of managing the data because by the stage you, uh, you get the call, you might not even have gotten the opportunity to log yet.
So, so recording that piece of information upfront actually helps with those conversations so that you keep your stakeholders, especially the financiers of, of the campaign in, in, in where, where the exploration but exercise, because it is very expensive. So that's me for this slide. Uh, the next slide, Tania, is just a short five minute break, a body, uh, break but I'll, I'll leave this, this one on. To, to allow people just to satisfy themselves. You can put in the chat box um, if after the break, if you put, you get to a different number. Okay, folks, um, we have a five minute break. So we can please be back at 11.42. We'll continue on and Please stick your answers in the chat box. If you have any questions uh, for Masi at this stage, though he may have just disappeared. I'm still here. I'm just uh, having a glass of water. Um, Masi, there's a question in the in the chat. If you could share the formula for the depth calculation. Um, Tania, I had really. I can type the formula, but um, I really prefer that people don't know the formula, rather they understand the relationship because what Colin was 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 um, explaining, it's just a, an arithmetic exercise. So the process of getting there is is, um, is understanding the, the engineering design behind a drill string. So what we have- uh, yeah. And, and, and to cause it, that, that, that is your answer. Um, you you have to to work it out, as opposed to just getting a a, calc, a, a formula. See, Intokozo has worked it out. I uh, hope you got the yeah. same number. I have I have gotten a, a, a someone giving me a different answer before. Um, and Interesting getting to understand how they got to the answer, but we finally convinced each other that they, that is the correct one.
And Ford is a master of this exercise. Keitania, I uh, hope um, our team is back. I'm ready to go. Um, before we be, I see there's a raised hand. Hand is down. Uh, before we, we move on, um, there's a there's a question. Um, considering the unintended defle deflections, what is the best way of picking up structure angles and less contacts? Would you advise that they be taken from the coaxes and work it out mathematically on a spreadsheet? Um, We'll, we'll touch on part of this conversation at a later stage, but um, I think the critical thing in, in, in doing that is first understanding how much is the deviation. Then you can use the deviation and the coaxis uh, relative to the planes you will be measuring. Um, in other areas where the competence of what you're drilling through allows, you can do downhole um, uh, surveys. Uh, other than deflection surveys. And I think Nolene will touch on this in the subsequent talk that uh, lead to your structural logging information and and how orientating some of your, of your core um, is a useful exercise. So um, the core axis is typically useful if the core is orientated and that being done correctly. So um, look out subsequent part of the program. Um, there was a question, uh, but it was sent privately to me uh, by Kulumangma's question, uh, just touch on it is related to the one I just answered, uh, but it goes more the direction of um, correcting it and the cost implications of it. Kulumango, it's twofold the answer to that question. One is being aware of it um, and correcting it in the data interpretation, interpretation and modeling phase where you do not assume that the power hole would have been a minus 90 or a minus whatever the angle you drilled, uh, but you actually use the computer program to correct for that because you would house uh, the deviation data data in your database that you can correct for it. And what it means is that you adjust the, the, the blend um, azimuth with the actual data you get from a deflection survey. If it is absolutely important that the hole propagates in a specific direction to a specific um, azimuth and plunge, what then becomes is the frequency of your deflection survey. And there are mechanical ways of trying to correct uh, for, for the direction, but that obviously has cost implications and um, time consuming as well. So what becomes important in that space is, um, is understanding what your contract arrangement with the drilling uh, contract or service provider is to be actually able to, to factor that in because if it is not, part of um, the contract, that additional work is going to cost the contract and they're not gonna be the happiest people to do it uh, because it's typically not their fault um, that there's a deviation. That's typically something that relates to how the site is set up uh, and how you place the rib plus the rocks you're going to be drilling with. So here, varying hardness and structures influence the propagation of your drill string. In, in 3D space. Um, there's a question from Tokozo about the odd rod. Uh, Tokozo, if the odd rod was an additional rod, um, yes. Um, sometimes the odd rod is the rod count could remain 67, for example. 
uh, in the road string, um, but you find that not all the roads in that structure are, are, are three meters. This is very rare these days, and it's typically very low cost exploration exercises where roads are either hard to find or very expensive for the drill contractor and the company that's contracted them to do the exploration where they would agree that they can use odd rods, but then you as a geo need to know they are in use and measure all of them and separate them from their normal length. Uh, say if you might want to satisfy yourself, uh, you might have to satisfy yourself uh, by measuring each and every single rod. That exercise is a very time consuming exercise and um, it just tells me that there's little trust between you and your service provider. And one of the important things here, you need to build trust that your driller and your team will tell you that, look, we used so many odd rods. There they are. These are the standard rods. You, you can just do a normal count on the standard rods and measure the lengths of the of the odd rods. Okay. Um, if we can then move on. Now we come to the fun part of logging. What, what the aim of, of logging really is um, ultimately delineating an ore body. And when you begin this exercise, always have the end in mind and iteratively refine your targets. And, and by target here now is not defining a new deposit, but in which area of the deposit it's most important to drill to get to the quickest possible answer to the economics of the of the of the deposit and maintain a working mineralization estimate this goes back to the comment i made uh, in the depth check form where you'd keep a rough uh, log of which boreholes uh, intersected or and a rough estimate uh, because that allows you to do a matchbox exercise of uh, estimating what volume you're dealing with and uh, possible tons if you know the 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 volume density relationships already. And if you've seen the chemical assays from the lab, you then attach grade to, to that rough uh, calculation. And obviously the reporting guidelines are quite important knowing are you in the early stages of exploration where you dealing with exploration results or you are in a more advanced stage where you're dealing with an indicated and measured resource. What you see in this exercise on the bottom right is exactly what I'm alluding to in terms of refining your targets where you see that every way shows um, the reddish color, which is an indicator of mineralization is consistent with everywhere you we've already drilled. So in, in this understanding is to say that initially before that uh, understanding with the geologist getting involved in the pit layout design, uh, the assumption was made was the pit layout is in that area, but you can see that drilling with purpose does highlight that the pit layout was only based on existing geology. But when you go back and you understand the modality of occurrence and the mineral systems at play, you can find that the pit layout is actually uh, limiting the size of the pit. And key here, you see in areas inside the pit layout that were also not drilled, um, there is no mineralization uh, being factored in here. And this is one of the telltale signs for me that uh, the ore interpretation is 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 influenced and it's slightly biased by where drilling has occurred. Where there's no drilling and having occurred, there's no information. So, so your exercise as a geo is to be fully aware to how this conversation is unfolding post the drilling and logging, so that you do not um, add to the situation by narrowly focusing on areas that. Uh, you think that's where the deposit is, but understanding the ore body mineralization. And this area is actually um, a, an environmentally sensitive area as well. Most of the areas that are not being drilled are these um, whitish blue colors, which are basically wetland sensitive areas and only allowed to drill in those areas in dry seasons. Um, and a photo of, of an area as such is behind the vehicle there is a river. 
and there are rules and laws that uh, allow when can you drill within a certain distance of um, protected areas. And being aware of these things as a choose, you then plan your drilling in such that in periods where you expect to be dealing with a rainy season, you are outside those buffer environments and you communicate as such to the mine design uh, people that are using the information as it comes in. Because if they put this into a mine planning and they schedule it out and they report that they, they might either misrepresent the deposit and you might be adding to that by not communicating some of these details. Um, the principle I think in, in next for me we're logging that if you cannot measure it, you cannot uh, prove it. Um, and the key thing here is that logging as an exercise is a science and it's not a subjective interpretation of what you're dealing with. You need to be putting measurable observations to the rock properties. You can't uh, be using uh, general terms that the rock you're dealing with is gray. Uh, what do you mean gray? Um, and this I've seen it happens a lot. Uh, in, in, in it's not specific on the size of the company or at what stage of a exploration exercise, but the value of, of, of being specific to measurable properties means at a later stage, you can quantify uh, deviations. The intended outcome of this is good accuracy and precision, um, but sometimes this can be difficult. But at the very least, uh, if there's, compromise on accuracy, do not lose uh, the precision. Because if, if the rock is gray um, and the mineralization rock is also gray and you're dealing with a, a uh, precious metal, generally it'd be very difficult to see the, uh, the mineralization by eyes, but being specific on what type of gray and other properties you're dealing with in a mineralization zone helps distinguish between a marine reef and a, uh, and a bastard reef. Uh, which is, is a barren and um, unmineral, unmineralized version of the other. And, and at the very least, if your description is on point and the rest of the measurable properties are on point, um, you could be out, yes, on um, description or rather interpretation, but at least your description will help the next person to say, no, look, what Massey meant here might be this and goes back into the archives or the data to verify a possible uh, alternative to what you've logged, but what you can encounter, especially where um, the value is based, is based on time, uh, the quality is compromised and, and, and what you find between geos, especially where you have more than three geos on a site, you'll find that the description of the same thing is not consistent. And this for me is a problematic space to find yourself because um, in this exercise, it means what I describe as a particular mineralization, somebody else describes it differently. What helps in this part of the conversation is the ability to peer review each other's logs. And um, recent history and exploration, we were quite uh, strict on this that we do not capture and uh, close any borehole in the in the main database without at least passing it to one colleague to have a look at what was described. And this this is also a, a learning and coaching exercise because you get to listen to to your colleagues and 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 this is both ways seniority and Julia to say what informs the, the the thinking behind the logging and the description and it's where the power of continuous learning sits. The next, the next aspect of the, somebody is mute. Um, the next exercise of the, of the, of the logging is obviously uh, data capturing in a, in a, in a database. Um, this slide in this uh, session is, is just in here to highlight the fact that you are the geologist, not the database. The database is just here to store your information and it's governed by CQL, typically not geology language. So um, always think about how the database needs to capture and register the information as you, as you log. 
and be detailed. I, I have found and met users that are skeptical about writing comments in, in their logs, whether it's a, it's a paper log or it's a database log. Um, please go the extra mile of writing a comment because uh, like I say, if if your, your accuracy is out, but you're precise, or at least you are detailed enough, it enables somebody else to review and, uh, and assist in, 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 in aligning the descriptions to a common description. And bear in mind the GJO, uh, which uh, in, is used a lot in the computer science space. You put in bad quality data, you'll get a bad quality data at the end, and you basically garbage in, garbage out. Um, not having a database uh, on site or wherever the logging is happening, it's, um, it's not the end of the world. Um, you could uh, be as detailed as you get on a simple Excel spreadsheet or um, paper log, where you at least the critical part about the rock itself, the information of, of the textures and the structures and randomization. And obviously, as I've said, comments, 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 comments. Um, do not write a PhD thesis in your comments, but at least the, the specifics of what you're observing. Uh, and this is the space where that necess not necessarily interpret what you're seeing, but uh, putting in all those de details that inform an interpretation. So that at least the stage where an interpretation is required, there's enough detail in your logging process to, to, to describe what, um, what you were observing. Because typically what happens in big companies is that the person, the geologist logging is not always the geologist that would be building the resource model and the estimations. So that information needs to filter through entire the through the entire geology um, value chain estimation. Now coming to probably the section which is probably my most favorite in, in the logging, uh, defining the parameters of, of that that highlight the science behind logging. And it's basically a conversation uh, based on, on what could be referred to as parametric consideration, meaning it's a quality-based measurable or quantifiable properties. Uh, the starting part of the conversation is uh, borehole and project um, data. Um, the, the hole has an ID or a number, it's a unique number. The project has a name. The geologist logging has a name, uh, and this is uh, to know who to blame when things are not right. I'm kidding. Um, this is for making sure that you can follow up um, if it's somebody else. The driller information is important to, to be able to do um, the accounting in terms of the chain of custody. It's not to say who's a better driller than who. The start and the end date, some projects run over years, so you, you want to know at what phase of the project this uh, that particular hole potentially falls because it could also explain to you uh, at a later stage what was the frame of mind within which the drilling was being done. And then obviously critical from to depth, where did the hole start to what end? And um, the survey data, very important. Uh, where on surface of the earth is that borehole? That's what it's about. Um, and three fundamental components there is what spheroid you working with, the coordinate system at play, the X, Y, Z uh, elements of that coordinate system, please. Typically what you find in most bowls is that X, Y, it doesn't tell you the Z. The Z is important in the space, that's your elevation above sea level. Um, and then the accuracy, is, is, is your survey a meter accurate or is it 10 meters accurate? Um, that information is fundamentally important. In this image here is an image uh, of a borehole I worked on in Eastern Bushveld, um, and that's roughly in the eastern side of the country. Um, that borehole is an ID I still remember to this day. Uh, and if you can read, you can actually see it on the concrete as well. It's a C and an H and a six. So the borehole is CH6. CH is the farm name, uh, farm parcel or survey parcel within which the drill was made. And six is the sixth hole in that area. Uh, everything else then gets referenced to, to H6 as a, as a mother um, 
data entry point in the database. The next part of the logging is the actual geology, uh, starting with the lithology. Name the rock, please. Um, be specific uh, about the name of the of the rock. Don't say a pyroxenite. What type of a pyroxenite? Um, the contacts um, traditional can be simplistic and always look out uh, for 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 the contact in as great a detail as possible. Uh, weathering. Um, you'll find and you come across a lot of weathering data that says low, none, uh, high, medium, please put a number. Even if you are wrong, it's not 2%. Uh, at least you, you gave an estimated number. And if you are consistent, it can be quanti quantifiable at a later stage because sometimes the amount of weathering is um, indicative of um, geotechnical um, occurrence and stabilities you will be dealing with. But if you're not putting a number to it, um, you're not informing the processes that follow the exploration campaign. And remember the exercise and the, the, the intention here is to log with an end in mind because somebody needs to use the data to do something. You want to offer them as much data as possible um, in, in, at the later stage. Alteration. Um, this talks to being accurate about what the type of alteration, not the high, low, medium, or not, that can happen. Alteration, in this case, uh, let's say sanitization, that tells you you are identifying specific set of alteration minerals that are observable, either by hand or microscope, or whatever the case is, um, or hand lens, whatever you, you would have been able to describe as a geo. And if you're not sure what type of uh, alteration it is, um, that's not the end of the world um, because this would always relate on the uh, original uh, rock forming minerals. So understanding what the rock form, forming minerals is, there's only a limited number of alteration possibilities you could be, you could be dealing with. But being able to, to be accurate about its sanitization, it's a different uh, evolution history versus being general. You, you can't be guiding. Color. Color, um, I know all of us are taught to those 12 colors that you get in a box of crayons that we use when we draw our sections. Uh, but there are means of actually putting a number to color. The one I prefer and I've used in the past is the Mansell system, which looks at the hue, uh, the value and the chroma. The hue talks to the differences, what, what distinguishes one color from another. The value is basically an indication of uh, how light or dark that hue is. And the chroma is the strength, um, what other people link to brightness. Of, of that color. So being able to put a number to that is, is basically useful for a later stage, uh, not dealing with 50 shades of gray. Uh, texture, um, again, specifics, massive. Uh, sometimes I see a lot uh, descriptors that say massive, but on second look, and please cut the core if you're not sure, a portion of the core, uh, make it wet, put a little bit of water um, to, to just, help your eye because logging a dry core, um, you might miss those details, even at a, a millimeter scale, those, those differences are quite important. Structural geology, do not forget your fractures, patterns, frequency, and the fill. And this leads back to the discussion around um, doing your total core recovery and your solid core recovery on site. Because if you know and you have a good handle of um, what it was on site and you're doing this now after logging, you can see very well where you might have induced fractures through transport and you would not now capture those as part of, of your logging description. Um, somebody asked about the core axis. Um, it's best if your core is, uh, is oriented, uh, but that's not to say do not capture th that angle. The angle is fundamentally important because with the angle and the deflection survey corrections in the model, you can know how to how your deposit is sitting in 3D space at the very least. And stratigraphy always tie back to your field setting in which regional local geology and what outcrops and river cuttings are in the vicinity. And if not, there's always a mine if it's a brownfield exercise. What does that intersection in the core 
look like in the pit, in the mine or in the underground uh, surface cutting and, and development. So always, always keep the field setting in mind. Contact, uh, just to illustrate a point, um, the, the description here would have been um, in the initial log, it's a conformable or sharp contact. Um, upon review, you actually realize that it's a, it's a, it's, it is a shared contact um, because all the telltale signs of sharing like silicon sides um, and silicon lines and foliation are there. The angles on either side of the contact uh, are not consistent. And in this area, the, the geology is well understood. But you see, you know, at the top, what you've encountered, the age is, is one thing. At the bottom, the age is another. And the material between the contacts is the same age as, as, um, as, as the bottom part. And it shows that the only way this happens in a vertical uh, uh, hole is if material is either sheared off or, or folded. So this informs that this is not a natural break. It's an unconformity of sorts. And it, uh, already at this stage, you've built a picture that you, you've just drilled through an unconformity. You've left the previous strategy stratigraphic horizon gone through a zone into the next and your understanding of that transition and that zone is fundamentally important in, in terms of uh, modeling and visualizing how your mineralization and your deposit is, is, is sitting. It relates to the stratigraphy. Um, as I said, one part is, is um, the older part in the previous image. Um, that part is missing. And what now we, sorry, um, that part is, is caught up in between the, the unconformities and that portion there is at the bottom of the hole. And what all this now links to is that you're dealing with a real unconformity where the top, the middle section here is squeezed at the top of, um, of, of, of the older stuff and younger material is squeezed between two older uh, successions of the same stratigraphic horizon. Back to, to, to the massive textures to illustrate the same point in the core and because it's a relatively fresh drill, you do not see and the eye cannot see and perceive that this is a micro layered succession. And again, the field settings is important. And what's become important here is also the modal occurrences and that's where the variation actually lies. Mm -hmm. And seeing that these are a specific needle type minerals, they have a preferred orientation of, uh, of lying and that defines the thin laminations that you see in the field, but in the core, Naked eye doesn't see it, and you you would have to make the core wet at the very least in some sections, like that piece of core there and in that section. If it's wet, you can actually see the micro laminations in it instead of describing uh, the rock as massive. And I have a comment I normally tell to you that uh, I mentor and reporting to me that massive is a boring description of uh, of rocks. Next uh, aspect is the mineralogy discussion. Basics, uh, know your ore forming minerals, not only the crystal structures and the abundances, but the chemical formula behind it. Um, this is the start of understanding the, the limitations of chemical assays, because if your chemical assays don't match your, your understanding of your ore forming minerals, you have a starting point where you could be either dealing with a change in a genetic model or a quality assurance and a quality control issue that relates to your lab. Either answer is, is useful in ensuring the integrity of your data. The next set of minerals, and Tanya typically disagrees to this, is, 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 is that I don't refer typically to gang, I refer to other minerals. Uh, but Tanya would say there's diamonds and, and everything else. So, so in, in the case of diamonds, perhaps you might need to consult Tanya, but in my space, I prefer describing them as other minerals. And the reason behind this is, is that even though I know uh, they're gang uh, minerals, is describing them as gang typically uh, 
places a, a, a block in the thinking process where you, you would think that it's a discard and it's gonna to go to waste in any case. But the importance sometimes is lying in the fact that alterations don't occur on the off-forming mirrors or, or changes in a genetic model in a form of alteration or whatever happen first on the so-called gain minerals or other minerals. And obviously where the mineralogy is um, too thin or too fine to see, what becomes useful is having access to even petrography and the mode of occurrence and being able to tell and allow yourself to make time and insist on having at least one thin section or, or block made of your ore. Uh, it might be tricky sometimes to remember the, the operation of a, of a microscope, but it's a fundamentally important um, uh, exercise. One of the examples I recall is dealing with the same, um, same ore, uh, different deposit, and certain things structurally did not make sense. Um, and, and not giving up led to a, a, an opportunity where thin sections of the ore and some of the rocks, um, the hanging and foot walls of, of the deposit, we made thin sections of these. And seeing some of the primary and altered minerals and the reactions between the two actually helped make sense of the structures and what we could be dealing with because those minerals would only occur under specific conditions. Um, and it helps narrow down what the geology you're dealing with. And as it stands, there's a, there's a couple of uh, research um, programs that are running, trying to make sense of an alternative interpretation of that particular deposit. Uh, knowing that the microscopic uh, and petrographic data that we found from there is a deviation from the accepted genetic model in, 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 in the area. So pay attention to, to that level of detail as well, because um, the answer is not always in the core, at least from, from the eyes, but in the core in the form of um, using uh, microscopes and hand lenses to that level of degree as well. Sometimes in other areas, this might not be in the scope of an exploration geologist, but at least know who and where in the company or in the contact base of the exploration project, you could shift samples like that to someone who can provide the service to you, either an external company or finding a research uh, person at a university or a consultant, whatever the answer to the question is, but do not leave, uh, leave uh, unanswered questions. What came out on, on one of these exercises, and this is now data that's uh, been being gathered through uh, mineral liberation analysis. And what you'd see is what we typically would define the rock as one mineral. You would see there's at least a 20% of something else, uh, other minerals um, or gang in the, in, the, in the ore itself. And these are fundamentally important in understanding what the beneficiation impact will be. And if this detail is not well understood, could sit very well um, with an issue where the ore behaves in ways in, in, in beneficiation and post-beneficiation use, um, like case steel, still making where the, 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 the disintegration of the ore in, in a furnace to make steel is actually related to that 20% of the mineralogy. What's in that 20%, not the 80%, which makes up the bulk of your ore and not understanding that 20% or at least how much um, the other minerals are intertwined with the ore is, is limiting the conversation and you could prevent the opportunity of being upfront and proactive in managing and using the, the ore body to, 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 to receive the best possible revenue out of it. And I typically say to, to, to stakeholders here is that the ore body dictates what can be done and the ore body will always um, offer the information that is needed. We just need to apply ourselves in that fashion and understanding that the best possible uh, margins are linked to the best possible use of the of the ore body. And the other minerals or the typical gang is never uh, an, 
a less important exercise because there could be hefty penalties uh, associated with getting that balance wrong. And I'm talking in the tune of uh, millions of uh, US dollar penalties. Your analytical data, what did you send to the lab and what did the lab tell you the analysis are? Uh, this is where your sample ID and your description of the sample is important. Um, and the quality assurance that goes with that. And here and there, you want to have reference material and blank samples. Some blank samples, the samples the lab doesn't know what it is or, or which sample it, it is related to. Reference material, it's got a set and a known chemical value. And the importance of those two is, is basically telling you as a GOA uh, how accurate and how good your lab. This data is typically the data that uh, most you um, accept as it is, please do not always accept what the, the lab. There could be a fundamental mistake in the management, the handling of the samples. And I'm not to say labs are not um, accurate. It could be that in your sampling processes, there's a swap, sample swap. Um, and, and it could be in the transport, then there's a misplacement of a sample. It could very well be in the lab as well. But being aware and able to trace the steps back to the core is always going to be useful in, in linking a sample to a piece of core that comes from a specific X, Y, and Z location on the surface of the Earth. And again, those properties are measurable. If you have the opportunity to, to also um, your physics, and this is typically uh, very important for, for deposits where you find that um, measuring and orientating core and measuring structures is a fundamentally difficult exercise because of either the complexity and the structural uh, terrain you're dealing with, downhole geophysics becomes a very useful tool. So there are things like uh, relative density that you could run probes for. Uh, however, the the guidance I always give is do not run a density probe without a porosity probe, because the higher your porosity on the same mineral or rock, um, your density will be relatively lower. And the important aspect of those two relationships is it's a cross check of each other. So a porosity probe can help you infer density and a density probe can help you estimate porosity, but one measures the other. So that relationship for me is always important. If one of your probes is out, the, the relationship and the inference will always be a huge deviation. And you can put a number what's acceptable as a difference between the two. So basically what can you accept as a inferred density from a porosity probe versus the technique you use to actually measure the density itself. Um, televiewers, um, depending on again, what you're dealing with, televiewers basically help you visualize the in situ in the whole. Um, there's other, methods like um, ra radio properties or microwave properties of the rock, which talk to the aspects of the rock that you cannot see. Um, so there's a technique like RIM that's in, in, in use in other places. And obviously what also becomes very useful is UCS. UCS is uni unixal cons compressive strength. How hard is the, is the, is the strength, uh, is the rock you're dealing with? Uh, this is a fundamentally important uh, piece of data with the televiewers in, in designing and helping uh, drill and blast conversations because the hardness of a rock and the fracture frequency that sits in that rock enables you to, um, to, to see what the potential energy leaks and the end for that the drill and blast design needs to account for because what you want to retrieve at the end of the day in the, in the mining phase is the most optimal fragmentation of your rock to enable the most optimal load and haul exercise. And obviously when it gets to a plant, there's crushing and beneficiation processes that would rely on the initial fragmentation of the rock. So that UCS is very important and you can get that information from downhole geophysics. Which then brings us to 
probably the most favorite part of mine when it comes to exploration and even geology. It's not just collecting the data. Uh, my first rule, and as best as possible in one of my flip charts, I will have a working section. What that means is that in a select section line, whether I, I drilled and logged that hole as a geologist or not, I will know what the next uh, holes on either side of my drill holes, what they look like, and a rough sketch of the geology going down um, on each hole keep that working and as you drill you fill in the gaps and what that leads to is 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 already getting your head to think about that end in mind to say this thing um, i'm logging is a deposit and i'm trying to maximize the data that leads to the economic description descri uh, economic recovery of the of, of, of the of the of body and all of that will always be dependent on the primary data and the quality thereof that you connected and be curious and test the genetic model. In, in, in an area about, let's say, 25 kilometers away from this one, uh, one deposit, um, the, the drilling just didn't fit. And as you can see, uh, the surface I drew here by hand was a relatively flat surface. And the area that I'm dealing with is no longer flat, but the depth to all was not conforming to, to the expected uh, regional uh, depth tour, um, and we, we were surprisingly in and out of or quicker than I would have expected. And in terms of then unpacking what's happening in that area and the changes in topography, I realized that uh, I can't satisfy, I can't be satisfied that uh, I've in, intersected the ore and I'm back now in the waste, uh, the foot wall, stop the drilling and move on. Um, being, being curious, as Colin said, is have a nice conversation with the driller to say, I know in this particular area, or in general, we typically drill to this particular depth. Um, what I need us to do is push on for so many other meters and be crystal clear on what is in the contract for that conversation. The longer you keep a driller unnecessarily in a drill site, they won't be happy if they're not seeing the economic advantage of it. Um, and this is where you as a geologist need to understand that, yes, the trailer wants to give you a, a quality sample, but they are also interested in maximizing the value uh, of doing the actual drilling. So having closed up that discussion, we drilled uh, another week or two in that site and found and came into the realization, actually, the ore duplicates more than once. So uh, the ore horizon is not one. Had we stopped the, oil, the, the whole shot, we would have missed uh, multiple or horizons in a particular location. And that was a fundamental discovery in, in also understanding that genetic models change and structural and uh, structural uh, geology aspects influence the relationship between the local and the regional. Not ever take that part in our understanding ever for granted. And the work, working section line helps in, in seeing where things are not gelling and you cannot explain them in the simplest possible form. Uh, without that working section line, you would miss opportunities of curiosity and expanding the ore. As you can see there, there's a portion where the ore suddenly becomes deep and you don't need to be 100% correct in terms of why it's that deep. Safe to say that you can show it that in this area, there's an anomalous uh, thickness in the ore and understanding where that anomalous thickness on the ore is is important but equally understanding why it is there because then that refines your targeting and it iterates back to the next uh, areas you want to drill. Same, um, same section uh, presented in different forms um, and the key part of this discussion for me is uh, that um, always look at the validation of what the database captures as part of your of, of your log. Always go back and zoom in and out of the call and check that the, the, the description and what you saw in the call and the photos that you captured and how it's appearing in the borehole is, is as representative of what you saw, being aware of the list lithological and stratigraphic relationships because once you move on from this conversation and you say you've done your part 
uh, the next person dealing with that piece um, of information and all that data can misinterpret what your eyes and there's no replacement yet for the eyes of the children as the primary contact with 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 the core and and also be able to 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 zoom in into what are the shortcomings on your drill management so for example in this cross section i just highlight a few issues where the first one is obviously the logging is inconsistent. Suddenly the purple layer disappears because the way these holes were logged is different from those ones. The second issue is that uh, in some instances, the log is very simplistic and all of a sudden you've got these thick packages that are not well described and the detail that is captured elsewhere, you cannot do anything with it. Uh, in other portions of the same section line. And the only thing you're left with is a guesstimation of how um, the lithologies um, are connected. In some instances, the holes are stopped way too shallow and it forces a particular interpretation that might not be fitting uh, versus whether that some of these holes could have been drilled deeper. And as you can see, some of the things terminate um, in, in, in shorter spaces than they could simply because that the holes uh, that could help uh, piece the information do not extend deep enough. So never drill a hole to chase an end depth. Always drill a hole to chase the end of your mineralization. And if your foot wall and hanging wall and all the structures that you see as the drill hole develops are not convincing you that you've hit the end depth or the end zone, then it would be, the onus would be on you as a geologist to inform whoever is governing or managing the project to say, in this particular location, I do not feel satisfied that we've reached the end of the exercise because of ABC rules um, and reasons that are linked to the stratigraphy, the physics, the geophysics, the structural geology and all other data set, sets that you'll have at the disposal. Because at this stage, when a person is now modeling the, 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 the deposit, it's fundamentally late to integrate that information back because they will use the information that they had at their disposal. And remember I said garbage in, garbage out. And the end in mind is always gonna be mining um, and not just mining the most cost effective um, way of extracting the, the, the deposit. And it's about doing the right work upfront and doing it once. And the key thing here in this portion of the mine is just highlighting where in some of the areas you can see that the pit terminates right on all. Terminates right on all, which shows that the there, there could be expansion opportunities and limited geology information did not offer the mining engineers enough information to build a mine extension envelope um, to, to that side of the pit. And remember, always work with the reasonable prospects of economic, eventual economic extraction. Now, what that means is there are certain descriptors that are used in the mining space, things like strip ratio and all those NPVs, IRRs that are being used. Those are indicators of the cost of extraction, but they tell you nothing about the margins. The conversation must always be, what would be the margin? And for me to get to that exercise, always be curious of what is the resource share? Where does the resource end? versus where did we say the pit will end? Because that difference is always where you want to operate in and, and, and always look into the conversations around um, what is the pit layout if you would assume double your revenue? Because what that means is inside the double pit revenue shell, you would avoid as best as possible to putting permanent infrastructure because the cost of removing that infrastructure at a later stage when the economies of scale change and it becomes economic to mine those areas, you would have to do double work of first of all, removing the previous infrastructure, then mining, 
And in fact, it's probably three times because you have to now find a new place of putting that infrastructure again. So, so that's where the cost escalations go un, uh, out of control and limiting your scope as a geologist in that conversation, you're creating a situation where you are not guiding the conversation again. And the conversation must always be such that the deposit must dictate. It cannot be my interpretation as a geologist that limits what the deposit must be. And it cannot be what the mine design finds. Yes, of course, there are those areas where uh, it's risky from a safety perspective to do certain things, but important is what is the resource development plan and what is the life of asset and why those conversations are where the stage gates and the double pit revenues sit in. And it's probably a talk on its own, that one with somebody else um, perhaps to go into those details because that's where now the resource estimations and geostatistics and mine design become fundamental and mine design, strategic mine design at that become fundamental conversation because in this space, the focus is to giving and front end loading the geology exercise ahead of all of those discussions. That brings me basically to the end of uh, what you need to know as a geologist. Uh, thank you for having me again. Um, always enjoy this uh, part of the exercise, Tanya. Um, I'm happy to, to take questions. Hi, Mercy. Thank you so much for, for that presentation. Um, okay, there's uh, a question on, <clears throat> excuse me, on the chat. Um, at what intervals do you prefer logging? Or do you look just look for changes? Also, do you have minimum and maximum intervals for all and non-all? Um, very important question. Um, I developed a, method, a methodology where the first thing before I look at the interval is go look for those changes, especially unconformities, um, if they are, just mark them out. And um, I'm always, guided in that by the smallest change my eye can see um, in, into that level of detail. And obviously the, the important answer also you need to balance that out is what timeframes do you have? And this is where um, logging as a pair or having a peer review is important where one of you could easily be putting in the major unconformities and somebody else within those strat packages or lithology packages goes and puts in the fundamental changes within the same package um, of, of rock. And that's, that's for me, the always um, well-structured approach because first of all, you, you, you are framing yourself in a clear understanding what rocks can be cor correlated with other rocks in the next boreholes, and then your eyes tuned in into those fundamental changes within the same package. Those fundamental ch changes is what uh, informs your complete understanding of your genetic uh, model. In terms of the all waste discussion, remember, um, especially in the overburden and the hanging walls. Um, in some deposits, it might even be parts of your food wall. It takes the same energy to move your ore and your waste, just different, des uh, different destinations. So always operate with the fundamental that um, you will have to understand your waste. And this is probably touching on the conversation of changing the psyche from great control in the mining space to all control, because all rocks can be attached to, to cost or value. And the value of waste sometimes is not giving you money, but it's saving you uh, money in the sense that you could very well answer a question of uh, the necessity of double handling or moving waste that, that otherwise you wouldn't know had you not paid the attention to the waste. So always treat all the rocks with the same level of detail they need. And obviously the sampling and the budget will control which horizon you use as a sampling interval, but at least in your description being consistent because you are mindful that a deposit is not a deposit um, 
disconnected from its surrounding or its uh, environmental context. There's another question. Um, can you redrill areas that were previously drilled where the end of hole was at a shallower depth? Um, yes, it's possible. Uh, not always, but it is possible. The, the info or the data that are critically important to making that decision is knowing your previous drilling. And you recall where I was talking about the what I call the survey data about the borehole. Who drilled it? When was it drilled? Who was the driller? You know what the method of drilling was. So if, for example, the previous drilling was a percussion drilling and the hole was kept, so it means that there's a likelihood that the top portion still has casing. And before making that decision, you want to know is the hole uh, open from top to bottom. And that might take you a day's worth of an exercise to test that. And if your current real life is a different one from the previous one, um, understanding that you're asking them to set up on, a, on a, an existing site, there will probably be contractual and cost discussions on that and risk discussion more than anything on that. And you can then further that borehole deeper um, conditions allowing. Another way of, 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 of targeting that is twin drilling. What that means is that there is an allowable distance from the previous hole based on your survey method accuracy that within a certain distance from the previous hole, the hole can still be considered the same location. You just put an alphabet or something at the end to say it's the later version. So the original hole can be something like CH6, the second hole, which is a twin hole, CH68. So that's another way of doing it, but obviously that has uh, cost implications as long as you know what the depth you need to drill past is, and obviously the end of your mineralization as well, what you're targeting. Um, so you can always do, do that option as well. Thanks, Marcy. Um, Matumi makes a comment. Great presentation, Marcy. Working section lines help determine the direction of the main channel in a river system as indicated on your connecting the, the dot slide. And I can just add to, to that very, very definitely. The idea of creating working section lines is something that I absolutely believe in as well. Spot on, Tanya, I have no words to add. It's a very spot on uh, comment and please make the time as best as possible. Um, and this is probably for me, the most fun part of being a geologist with a sort of wine in the evening. <laughs> yes, the, the, the glass of wine definitely does help to um, <laughs> lubricate the uh, little brain cells. Yeah, definitely. Are there any questions for Masi? And guys, you have, no, not every day you have the, um, the expertise. At, at hand that you can ask anything that you want to. Okay, well, um, that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you once again, Masi, for your time and expertise. We will definitely call upon you same time next year. Um, a okay, so we can have a tea break now. And if you can all be back at your desks by one o'clock, and then we continue on with the, the next portion of our, um, our course. You can, of course, stay around and chat, unmute yourself um, and, and, and chat amongst yourselves. What I would like you to do is on the, the chat box, give us an indication of where you come from, because we know we've got people outside of South Africa. Um, even if you are in South Africa, where across the, the country are you? Please let us know. It's always interesting.
just to a an answer to a question um, from the gentleman from from Ghana. We will be describing the assessments a little bit later on this afternoon, but I will also send out the assessment and the instructions by email to everybody who is registered. So you'll be able to catch up the information there as well. The next activity after tea is the continuation of what we need to know about logging. And Nolene's going to talk to us specifically about structural logging. And then we will have an introduction to drill hole database management, which is an introduction to a course that we intend holding next year as well. And after that, I will be talking to you about the, the course assignment, what you need to do in order to be able to obtain a certificate of completion and your CPD credits. So now's not the time to log off and go somewhere else unless you have to.
Hi, Tanya. Hi, Nailene. How are you? Good, thanks, and yourself? Fine. Was that your little cup that took you away? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and yet you're here. Yeah. I just went into the kitchen to put the uh, the water on for coffee. And are your muffins out the oven yet? <laughs> yeah. Hi, Nolene, it's Colin. How are you doing? I'm well in yourself, Colin. Very well, very well. Are you, are you in Scotland? I am, I am. <laughs> what are you doing there? Um, we are visiting Gavin's brother and girlfriend. Oh, so very we, nice. Yeah, so we're in Fife, which is close to Edinburgh, as you know. And then on Saturday, we go up to the Highlands for a week. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. So it's, so probably you're about the, it's probably about the same temperature as you guys are having in the middle of your winter. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I, I guess you are obviously doing what good geologists do and you're drinking lots and lots of scotch. Colin, I can't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't of have to No, <laughs> Nolene, we know. <laughs> oh, that's great. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your trip, hey? Thank you. Thanks so much. Cool. And yourself, Colin, when do you go off on your big adventure? Um, probably middle of November. Oh, um, okay. So soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've just got to, uh, we, we <laughs> want to be there for Christmas, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, that's lovely. That, that's the plan. We're just trying to, trying to sell our house at the moment, which is not so easy. Um, yeah. Very, but, very difficult. But it is a beautiful house. It's a gorgeous house, absolutely gorgeous. But um, but yeah, it's uh, you know, not so easy. No, it's, it's very difficult. In fact, yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, it's quite depressing. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, we sorry, just I shouldn't be laughing, but yeah, I'm sure it is. No, it is. It's uh, soul destroying. It's um, it's terrible. But anyway, let's see what uh, let's see what happens. Eh? Yeah. Well, good luck with that. Thank you. Thank you, and good luck for your chat. We'll chat later. We will. Thanks, Colin. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Cheers, Tanya. Cheers, Colin. Tanya, should I just quickly try to share my screen? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> All good? Yeah, I'll put it into presentation. There we are. It's all good. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Just in case, you know, I'd be very embarrassed if it didn't work after all our Zoom calls and things. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> I see Vanek has joined us. <clears throat> yes, I, I saw him come in now. Bernard, do you want to, uh, are you going to share your screen at all? Um, yeah, this afternoon, ladies. Hello. Hello. <clears throat> yeah, I'll share quickly if I can. Um, okay. Let's just check this one. Tanya, I'll be back in two seconds. Okay. Yeah, it's just me. I just want to put in the presentation mode. Um, just let me know if you see my screen. Yes, that's perfect. Cool. Shall I wait until one o'clock or how are you guys schedule? What is your schedule looking like? Um, we're, we're on time to start at, at about one o'clock. We've just told people that we will be starting at, at one. So I think okay. a couple of folks have run out to get coffee and and whatever else. Okay, 100%. I'll just rejoin just before one. You You can just stay attached if you like. Yeah, yeah, I'll stay attached and stay muted until one. Thanks. Okay.
Wow, Tanya, people are coming from all over. I tell you, it's quite amazing. It is incredible. Social media has done a wonderful job of um, advertising this. Hmm. Definitely. The guys are coming in from Middle East and the Far East. Where did you hear about this course from? They've obviously also gone for coffee. Mm, probably. I also see a couple of people, uh, Nolene, obviously didn't read the um, course flyer. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I, we know which course we have to run again next year, Nolene. Uh, yeah, Collins. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I did notice um, a decline in the numbers when Collins stopped talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so nice to see people coming back again from previous courses and talks. Mm. It's not a complete waste of time. <laughs> <clears throat> and I did hear you um, throwing us all under the bus again, like, oh, next year, same time, really? <laughs> yes, well, this is a good time of year. <laughs> I'm going to mute myself now for Vernich. Okay, folks, well, welcome back to the afternoon session of our, our course. And 
First up, we have Bernie Dwellefi from Index, who is one of our event sponsors. So, Bernie, if you'll unmute yourself, we're all ears. Thanks, Nina. Thanks, Nadine. Thanks for the opportunity. So, I'm just going to do a quick uh, five minute uh, information on Index. So, Index in a nutshell, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Index. So, um, we just going to go one slide back. So we are actually uh, the two previous companies, AMC and Reflex, that was bought over by Index. And uh, we are a drilling optimization um, rock and real-time subsurface solutions company. Um, so the two legs of the companies, are the AMC drilling optimization includes the drilling chemicals and the muds. And then we have the, the Reflex part of the company, which is um, the core business that I think most geos are familiar with, and that's the core orientation tools and the downhole survey tools. Um, so we operate right uh, right around the world. We're an Australian-based company, so it's uh, Australian headquarters, but we operate across um, uh, all regions, uh, North America, South America, Africa, and uh, Asia back. And um, yeah, so we located right around the country. We have um, uh, offices in Joburg, so we have a manufacturing facility and our tools offices in Joburg. So if anyone wants to uh, come and have a tour, you know, just just pop me a mail. I'll, I'll, I'll share my email address in the chat afterwards if that's fine. And then we have another regional office in Ghana. So <clears throat> what do what do Reflex do? So I think at the core of our business is not just providing data to our clients, but providing uh, quality data um, with strict chains of custodies and as, as real time as you get. So our, our, it goes from our drilling optimization, uh, creating the best possible core for geos to collect data from, um, to our rock knowledge sensors uh, from our sprint, I think is the sprint easy, easy tracks and sprints and uh, the downhill surveys and the rig aligner tools that most of um familiar with. And then the area that I actually uh, find most interesting and that um, I'm also from a geo is our real um, time data software, uh, which the core is our, our hub IQ. So that's where all our data goes from our different uh, instruments. From a single hole, you just have all your data in one place and it's uh, QAQC, then yeah, it's available at your fingertips and integrates with some of our um, software, like our geochem software, like iOGAS, and also some third party. Um, software and then yeah to get you to those um, answer products so if you have to uh, sum it up maybe um, in just a few slides mm -hmm. you can see that the index how IQ is actually the center center of index so that that is at the moment still for free for clients and that just collects all your data from from your my data to your um, IQ logo structural data uh, through to some of the infield uh, geoanalysis um, equipment and, and, and hardware we have. So that's just a, a more detailed summary of exactly what we do. So it's from the drilling optimization, you can see at the bottom, it's all the fluids and the muds and, and the mud engineer and, and the real time data on your controlling your drilling fluids. And then the core business uh, right here at the right bottom of the slide is our survey tools, uh, some geophysics easy gamma, uh, rig alignment tools and, and all of that just seamlessly integrates in, into the hub for single holes. Then we have some uh, our structural IQ logger. I think a lot of geos are familiar with that one. And then in-field geoanalysis, we have uh, XRF Connect software, which actually you can um, couple with the PO XRF unit. And yeah, that's just um, <clears throat> another slide showing um, all our tools and how they actually integrate into a hub. And then on the right hand side, we actually integrate with third party software such as um, Leapfrog and Acquire, and then you know, seamlessly with our IOGAS um, geochemical um, software. And then we have a few new uh, interesting products like AI Siris, which is an artificial intelligence um, software that actually interprets your spectral data that you can upload in, in, into, into uh, the app as well. So, yeah, that's I think, yeah, five minutes. Um, so Maybe I have a minute for, for any questions. Um, I don't know if I should open up that can of worms, Tanya, or Annalene. Well, everybody has got your contact details. Yes, yeah, so um, I'll just share it. Slide um, with your contact details or put it in the in the chat box. And then people can contact you and also check out your, your website. 
And 100%. on our side, once again, thank you so much for being a sponsor of this event. We do appreciate it because, as you can see, we can have a large number of, of very interested people coming along. Yeah, thank you again for the opportunity, Tanya and Aline. And yeah, enjoy the, the rest of your course this afternoon. Thank Thanks, you, Vanya. Okay. Okay. So Just like next this. up. Bye. Bye. Next up in our presentation is, is Nolene, who at the moment is sitting with the light coming from behind her, so you can't see squat. That's my halo. <laughs> You're right. Um, so I am going to switch my camera off. I just wanted, um, as Masi did, to show everybody what I look like. Um, you know, still young and gorgeous, just like Masi and Colin. But I will now switch my uh, video off. Thanks, Nolene. And Nolene is a geologist, um, more than 20 years ex experience in all variety of exploration and mining. And she is also a ardent advocate of women in, in mining. And so with no further ado, uh, Nolene, if you'll talk to us about what geologists need to know about structural logging. Uh, thank you so much. And Tanya, thanks very much for um, the opportunity to do this talk. I know I was um, joking just now about them um, being thrown under the bus and doing it again next year. But I do think it's a very important um, part of what an exploration and a mining geologist needs to know. So I first put this talk together when I was working for Reflex, which is one of the companies that Vanek has just spoken about. Um, and we what we were trying to do was to um, get the geologists to, to take more control of the drilling part of the of their exploration projects. Um, and I'm going to start and say, guys, listen to what Colin said and Massey said. Be curious. Go out to your drill rig. Ask questions. Um, understand what the drillers are doing. Understand and understand that they know what they're doing because this is a very, very important part of, um, of exploration. And, and we'll get to that in a second. But this talk isn't just about structural logging because um, you know everything that goes into the drilling um, is involved in getting good structural readings. So a downhole survey isn't just a downhole survey. And a core orientation isn't a standalone uh, process. So I wanna go through the, the different processes that make up getting good structural logging. Um, righty, so there we go. So this is what I'm gonna be talking about during this presentation. Why is structural logging so important? And then how are you gonna get your structural information? best practices to generate quality readings, and then also you know, what to look out for, what errors to look out for, and how to mitigate them. Okay, so let's start with why structural information is so important. So Massey has touched on it. And um, one of the most important things, obviously, is we're drilling, and we don't understand what is underground, which is why we're drilling. And by understanding your structural logging and your structure underground, you are going to understand what you're going to find when you start with your mining. So it also predicts where your mineralization is because, um, as we know, a lot of the, the um, structures um, form uh, pods where your mineralization is um, is. Uh, accumulated and concentrated. So if, it, if you can identify the important structures in a project, you can obviously predict where your mineralization will occur. Then once your mine is being developed, um, you'll know the structure which will determine the design of the mine, how your ore blocks are going to perform while you're mining. Um, and then again, also environmental concerns. So um, your geologists, your hydrogeologists need to understand the structural geology 
because they are sites of groundwater flow and penetration, uh, which may affect the leakage of toxic materials from your waste dumps or salty water leaking into your aquifers. And, you know, the, the East Rand is a perfect example of this. So let's start with how you are going to get your structural information. So as I said, it's not standalone processes and, and it's obviously not just what you can see on surface. So one of the most important things to understand is where your ore body, where your core and where your rock is in 3D. So it's very important to survey your collar position to know exactly where you start drilling and then a downhole survey to determine the dip and the dip direction of where you have drilled your hole. And then obviously you also want to understand in which orientation your rock is before you take it out of the ground. So that is why it's so important to orientate your core. If you drill it and break it off and pull it out and you have no idea in which orientation it was before you pulled it out, it's useless. You know, you will never understand the structure underground. Um, okay, so that is basically how you start. But there are also other things you can do to ensure that your final structural measurements, which is where we're going to end up with this talk, are as accurate as you can get. So as Vernich mentioned, you can optimize your drilling to get the best possible core. And um, Colin did say, so the best recovery and less breakage and loss. Then you're gonna survey the holes with tools and you're gonna choose the best tools that you and your company can afford for this. Um, so you ideally want to choose something where your results can be viewed immediately and also remotely um, and your hole can be resurveyed if it's obvious that it, it, um, it's been it's deviated too much so you know you can always like then if you need to redrill your hole but um, you know at, at worst case scenario that is redrill but you will know where your hole has gone um, and also it's very important to have a secure order trail so I'm afraid that sometimes the drillers do give you what you want. And if they see that there is like a huge deviation in your um, survey, they might actually fiddle the results. So a lot of times in the field, um, our drillers have brought us our survey information on bits of paper, on Excel spreadsheets, and all of those you actually really can't 100% trust that what you're getting is correct. So you're looking for something with a really secure order trail. Um, and then you're gonna ensure that your orientation of your core is done correctly, that the core marking is done correctly. And only by the, at that point, do you actually start doing your structural logging? So you can see that structural logging um, contains many elements that are pulled together and every step of the way must be done as accurately as possible. So if your survey is slightly out and then the orientation is slightly off and the core mark isn't done as accurately as carefully, carefully as you can, and then the geologist is a little sloppy um, with the structural measurements, you can imagine that by this point, you've got quite big errors in your final structural um, results. So, I think my, my, my most important message of this talk is do everything as carefully as you can. Because um, as Masi did say, you know, your name is on that logging sheet and you are going to be held accountable. But if every geologist takes control of their part of, of the work, um, you're going to have a fantastic product. And when they start planning the mine, those geologists can trust the information that you are giving them. Um, and then the, the other point I would really like to make is you have to know what's happening at the rig. 
So when I was working with Reflex, this is my favorite story. I went out to site one day and the geologists were complaining about the Reflex tools, the um, core orientation tools. And they were saying, no, they don't work. And they um, want to return them. So I said, okay, fine. So let's just go down to the rig. And the geologist said, oh, no, no, don't worry. The, um, the driller can bring the tools back up to, to the office, which was admittedly a lovely air con um, container. It was lovely and cool. And outside was just sweltering. So now the driller brought um, the beautiful reflex survey tool. I opened the box and it had never been used. It was brand spanking new. So I asked the driller what they were using to do the core orientation. And they said that they were using a spear. My point of the story is the geologist did not know this. The geologist had not been to the rig once in five months. So go to the rig, ask questions, understand what's happening on your project. Okay, enough lecturing, let's carry on. Sorry. So we've gone through this already. It's obviously more than just taking the measurement on the drill core. And I've gone through the fact that you've got to ensure that your survey, your orientation and your logging tools are fit for purpose. So a lot of times um, cost is the definitive factor in what tools you use. But do try to use the best tools that you can. Ensure that your drillers and your geologists are properly trained and supervised. Um, a lot of times you as a geologist have no control over who your drilling company is but you can make sure that they are correctly trained in the tools that they are using. And everybody takes ownership of their part to give you a quality solution. Have your QAQC systems in place and do them every day. Don't wait until the end of your project and go, all right, let's like check the QAQC and realize that your survey tools weren't working correctly and your surveys are all incorrect. So good score. Structural quality data is only as good as the drillers and the geologists care factor, the accuracy of the drill hole surveys, the measurements, and then of course the follow through. Um, so you're gonna find some challenges, obviously not everything goes perfectly. And um, these are things that you should be watching out for again, all the way through the process. So in drilling, your core can rotate when breaking, and this is going to affect your orientation of the core. And you're gonna obviously sometimes find that um, your core's totally broken up or totally ground to, to like powder almost. And obviously you can't orientate that core. Downhole surveying, inaccurate surveys. Um, and yeah, again, don't trust anything that you get and check everything in orientation. So orientating the core, as well as making the orientation mark, both of these can give you errors. Um, drawing the orientation line from the mark, that can also be errors. And then in, leg, in logging, incorrect measurements and data transfer. So a lot of times in exploration projects, um, there are more than one geologist working on the project. So a lot of times you're looking at other people's work be aware that these problems could occur and make sure that you understand what is happening on your uh, core. Righty, so let's start with the downhole surveys. Um, Colin likes to say that there are certain things that are absolutely definitive in life. One are that you pay taxes, the second one is that you die. And the third one is that all drill holes will deviate from their planned path. This is so true. Deviations can be significant. So survey your holes. Let's have a look. So here is a mine plan, open pit, as well as underground over there. Um, the holes have been assumed to be um, undeviated straight. And from your mineralization in each hole, your ore body has been drawn in. So the pit's been designed around where you think your ore body is going to be, as well as your underground infrastructure. But if your hole has been surveyed and it now looks like this, this is where your ore body is now 
um, interpreter to be. And you can see that it actually goes into the pit wall. Your open cast pit has been designed in the wrong, has been created in the wrong place. Your underground infrastructure is never going to hit your, your mineralization. Um, so you're now got your stoke in waste and you're going to have to do more underground development. It's going to be dollars and dollars and dollars and your rep reputation is shot. So that is the importance of surveying your holes. Um, and it's not just the modeling that's important um, over here. You can see that the, um, the faults are steeper than expected. The, um, the mine was developed and you now have a huge failure in your open cast pit. Right, so you get different survey instruments. A lot of them um, are quite old, but let's have a look at how you survey your holes. They are separated into two different groups. Your magnetic instruments can be used for non-magnetic environments. So that is your um, normal drilling and there is gonna be no magnetic interference in that at all. These instruments are divided into two groups as well, the mechanical and the digital. So we don't really use mechanical um, survey instruments anymore, but you might end up in a project where they have used them. You have like older geologists who have not yet moved into the 21st century. Um, so it's just good to know that those did exist. And then you have your digital tools. Um, and then the other group are your non-magnetic instruments. And these are used for when you are expecting magnetic interference in your ground. Again, these are separated into two groups. Um, and I will explain this in, in more detail. So you have your reference and your non-reference instruments. So let's have a look at these. So these are the old mechanical ones, right? Um, I've never seen them, not even on any of the projects I've worked on. Um, if you do have any questions about them, Colin's the person to ask. Um, so you can see they're, you know, they're fragile, they're not auditable. Um, there's no built QAQC. Um, manual data entries, which is another problem where mistakes can occur. Um, so all of these are, for me, that just looks like just like really bad stuff and like, you know, hard to use. And um, I think that's why most people obviously have moved on to the, the um, non-mechanical and the digital instruments. So obviously, because I work for Reflex, um, I understand those tools better. And um, you might find this like a little bit of a, a reflex bias talk. Um, so what we're looking at now are the magnetic survey instruments. As I said, these are the ones used when you're not expecting any um, magnetic interference. And all the digital tools are robust, solid state electronics. Um, they can do multiple survey shots so that they go quicker and you have more accurate information. So, you know, the more shots you do down hole, the more accurate your information is going to be. There is a built in QAQC functionality as auditable, um, digital data capture and transfer, and then the data is easy to interpret. So, all of these things, as I said earlier, are so important. Um, in making sure that your survey information is trusted. So here we're looking at um, instruments like the Reflex Easy Track, the Bolt Long Year True Shot, um, and the non-magnetic ones are made from non-magnetic material, but they do need aluminium spacer rods. Um, with the drilling to keep the the um, the instrument away from the uh, magnetic uh, tools, they use magnetometers to determine the magnetic field, and then accelerometers determine the direction. Um, and they can't provide an azimuth with with magnetic ground inside of drill rods or near man-made 
magnetic items. So these are the cheaper option when you're looking at digital survey tools. Um, and as, you, as I said, you know, if you're not expecting any magnetic interference, they do a great job. If you are going to be uh, drilling through um, magnetic ground, so your BIFs, uh, massive pyrotite, pyrotite yeah, et cetera, okay. you would then start looking at your non-magnetic instruments. Um, so these are divided into the, um, the two. Um, on the left, you can see it's either referenced or non-referenced. And the only difference really is that for the, um, the reference instruments, you put in the position and the non-reference tools are north seeking and you only have to put in the azimuth. There's um, obviously um, more benefits to using your non-reference instruments, but that does add quite a lot of cost. So again, it's very important to choose the correct tools that will do the job you're looking for um, and still you know, be cost effective. It's always very important because ultimately everybody's trying to make money. Um, so these non-magnetic survey tools um, aren't affected by magnetic ground or drill rods. They're very robust. They can be used inside all types of drill rods. Um, they're intuitive, they're easy to use. And again, the built-in QAQC report generation. And yeah, we're looking at like the reflex gyro. So the, um, the non-reference one, this is the one I said you um, only have to put in the, the latitude and um, they are north seeking. This is the reflex sprint, it's the latest reflex. Although Vanich might correct me, there might be a newer one. All measurements reference the geographic north, uh, no alignment required. And historically, this is where you would have got service providers to come out and, and do your surveys. So one of the good things about using these kind of survey tools is that they are operated by drillers and they are done while you're drilling your holes. So historically, you would drill all your holes for your project and then you would get a surveyor in to come and do your downhole surveys. Um, so, you know, the, the downfall of this is that by the time your surveyors arrive, after, you know, drilling 40 holes, half your holes might have collapsed. So your surveyor couldn't get his tools down to do the surveys. And then also you've now drilled 40 holes and you have no idea whether they are accurate, whether they've deviated um, and you haven't been able to interpret your, your project while you're busy drilling. Um, so, you know, as we saw with Massey, it's like it's every night you should be looking at your drilling data, putting it into your interpretation so that you are building your, your project in your mind as you go along and you can then make adjustments with your drilling uh, where you're going to do your next hole as well as when to stop and you know when to carry on drilling. Um, so to get back to these tools you can survey both RC and DD holes, diamond holes, that can be done on vertical as well as angled holes. Um, okay, so, so there are other um, tools. Sorry, I just want to get to where we are. That are, again, older technology, relatively cheap, um, but there are quite a lot of downfall to using them. So even though we don't use them very often, I just wanted to, to include this slide so that you are aware that you know, these things are around. So when you're busy doing your surveys, um, some issues that you need to be looking at, um, when you start getting your surveys back and they they just look dodgy you know do a conformance check 
on the tool. Um, but when you when you rent these tools, the service provider should give you very good training on how to use them, how the drillers must use them, and, and how to make sure that they are working correctly. If they don't, get a new tool. Um, but if you have checked the tool and the tool passes the, the check, then go and have a chat to the drillers to make sure that they know what they're doing. Um, don't wait till the end of your project. Really, you need to continuously check all the steps of your, your surveys to make sure that you're getting the best results you can. Okay, so now you've surveyed your hole, you have your survey information back, you know where your hole has gone, you know how it's deviated. Um, hopefully you have got mineralization. And if you haven't, well, that's got nothing to do with the survey or the core orientation. So let's move on to see um, how you're going to orientate your core. Um, as I said earlier, so core orientation is the process of determining the in-situ orientation of the drill core in the ground. You, you really need to make sure that you understand how your core was situated, um, because if you pull it up, and also, you know, if you don't orientate your core and you pull it up and you don't know how it was situated, you really can't use it to understand your structure. Um, and then the drill core is marked to reference either the gravimetric bottom or top of the core. And we'll go through that in a second um, in inclined holes or true north direction in vertical holes. Um, okay, as I said, errors in the position of the orientation mark will impact the accuracy of your structural readings. It will then impact on your geological and your model. It will impact on the mine design. And ultimately, it's going to impact on how much money your company makes. So the core orientation tools. Um, there are two different methods and um, two different kinds of tools. The, the first are the contact or front end instruments. And then the second lot are your non-contact or back end instruments. Again, the, the, the first one, your, your front end instruments are, are quite old, they're non-digital. Um, we tend not to use them anymore, but because they are cheaper um, and Again, you might end up on an exploration project where, where you have you know, the more experienced older geologists who, who actually have been using them for their entire lives and they just feel that why change them. So especially the spear, you might still um, encounter a spear. Um, oh, thanks, Colin, for the slide. Um, so the, the front end ones, they obviously go um, onto the front end of your drilling. So they actually make a mark at the bottom of the hole before you start drilling. And sorry, so the bottom of the hole, which will then end up being the top of your core when you pull it out, which means that it has been marked in situ before you've even drilled that core. Okay. Um, so the key considerations would be that. Um, Sorry, I've lost track of myself here. When you are choosing your tools, these are the key considerations. Um, the accuracy and reliability of your in-situ rock orientation data, uh, the cost, interruptions in drilling, the production rate, the difficulty in use, and the condition of rock mass. So these are the things you look at before you choose your, um, your orientation tools. Right, so these are the front end ones I was talking about. Um, you might still find the spears. And then this over here is your impression barrel. It goes into the front of your, um, your drill string and it hits the rock. And these little pins um, get um, moved so that it shows the impression of your rock. So when you pull out your core, you can then reorientate it and put in your 
your mark. Um, I've actually never seen it used, but um, you might. The advantages of using these um, is that the orientation is made at the start of the run. So therefore it's not going to be affected by rod, rod torque and core spinning in the tube. And it is simple and easy to operate. The disadvantages is that you can't use it in soft or broken ground. And then um, it's restricted to inclined holes between 30 and 75 degrees because it's obviously got to go slide down the hole. Um, you can't use it for upwardly, upwardly inclined holes. And you do need your operator to be very careful to get a quality mark. Um, it's susceptible to tool damage and it's slow. So the tools have to be separately run before a new core run commences. Then if we look at your um, Sorry, I've got this thing across the top of my screen, so I can't really see what my slides say. Um, the the non-contact or the back end instruments, these attach to the end of your core barrel and they orientate the core tube. So the core is locked in the lifter case and it's brought up. The tube is retrieved and rotated to its correct position. And then the orientation is marked on the core. Um, so they're again, two different kinds, either the mechanical ones, as well as the electronic ones. So the mechanical ones, you're looking at, again, older technology, the Reflex Easy Ori, I don't even think that they um, sell them anymore. But again, you might find them on a project. It uses a steel ball, marks the bottom of the hole on the soft metal disc. And um, as I said, it's superseded by electronic systems. The electronic systems, you're looking at things like the Reflex Act 3. It uses a series of accelerometers to determine the gravimetric bottom of the core tube. Um, the operating parameter data is digitally captured, and then it can be analyzed to ensure that the tool is being operated correctly, and it's within the design parameters. The advantages of using these electronic uh, instruments is that it's more reliable in soft and broken ground. You have your digital QAQC data capture. You can orientate it up and down holes to within five degrees of true vertical. And um, the orientation is accurate to, to one to three degrees. You can't orientate vertical holes um, and it may be affected by rod torque and core spinning in the tube. Um, that can be mitigated by ensuring that the drillers are, are careful, that they ensure that the, the rod has stopped spinning before they, they break the core. So yes, that's where we go. Look for core spin. Um, and then, you know, we're geologists, so you use your geological features across the core to align your core if you do actually have core spin. Okay. So now that you have your um, orientation, you need to make the orientation mark. And this is where it becomes more the geologist problem or where we can ensure more quality um, in, in your core orientation. Because up to now, you know, it's like, it's pretty much been the drillers that have had um, control of what you're getting. So from here onwards, it's the geologist. Um, so once you have your core lined up at your draw rig, you need to make the orientation mark. So um, again, these are reflex tools. You've got your, your jig that you put your um, core on, you align your jig, and then you can draw your mark. This one is a little bit more um, involved goes over the front of your core, you um, align it with your core orientation tool, and you'll see that you can then put your pencil in there and make the mark. Um, so you would want to make your mark as accurately and as straight as possible. And if you're not holding your jig perpendicular, then your line is going to be slightly skewed. And you'll see when you then draw your line across the top of your core, 
you could actually be doing it in the wrong direction. Um, very important, make sure that if you have decided that your um, line is going to be on the bottom of your core, make sure it's always on the bottom of the core and um, not on the top. So bad orientation marks. You'll see over here, big fat mark. You don't actually know where the center of that mark is and where you will then draw your, your orientation line. That one, it's not even on the bottom of the core. So those are from spears. Um, you can have bouncing spears and you can like end up with three marks as the spear has bounced across your core. Um, and then you have to believe that sometimes drillers are going to give you what they think you want. So, you know, they're just going to make a mark anyway. Um, and then it's just something that you need to look out for. When you draw your orientation line from the mark at the, um, on the circle of your core, uh, use an angle iron rather than a ruler. It's longer and then you, um, you don't have to try and line up your ruler. Um, yeah, you can see over here, you know, this core line was drawn before the, the core was um, fitted together. And then over here, it was just totally skew. And then they fitted the core together and realized that they had made a mistake. So other things that you need to look out for, you can't propagate your orientation line through broken core if you can't rejoin it. And rotating your core 180 degrees, you're gonna end up with your line on the wrong side. Um, also then make sure that you're, you're doing your arrows in the correct direction, downhole rather than uphole. So after all of that, we can actually now start doing some structural logging. I was gonna say, are there any questions, but let's just carry on. You can ask the questions at the end. Um, so making the structural measurements is a routine part of logging drill core, as, as Matty said, and I'm not gonna go through you know, what you log, he's already gone through it, um, but I can say from experience, for me, it was probably always the, the worst, most boring part of logging core. I really never enjoyed it. I always um, handed it over to anybody else that was willing to take it. And in hindsight, I, I, you know, I think it is one of the most important parts of, of your exploration project. And by giving it to, you know, young, inexperienced people, it's probably not the best thing to do. Um, and because a lot of people don't like it, they leave it right to the end. Um, and sometimes, you know, data is not used for months or years later. And we then just assume that it's, it's accurate. And then a lot of the times we, we start using the, the structural information. It doesn't make sense and it has to be discarded or you, um, you have to relog it if you have the core. And if the core is not available, um, you might actually end up having to drill more holes. So it really is important to do correct structural logging. Um, Radhi, so there are many ways of doing structural of like doing structural logging and using it. Um, you've got your manual tools. So those um, include the, the rocket launcher which I um, actually never thought anybody ever used. And then I was in this huge big mine in the DRC, um, one of the biggest mines in Africa, the biggest gold mines in Africa. And all this structure was done with a rocket launcher. Um, so I was, I was flabbergasted because it is so slow and so time consuming but it is really used a lot still. Then you have your goniometers, your chronometers, and your core protractors. We now do have digital tools that make the logging much easier and quicker, like the Reflex IQ Logger, um, core photo analysis systems, as, as well as televiewers. So um, the, the rocket launcher, it 
is actually, although it's time consuming, it's really good because your orientated core is positioned exactly as it was in situ. So you can see, um, you can visually see how it was and you can visually see and understand your structures in your core. Um, so you put it in your rocket launcher, so it goes in there. Um, and then the geologist directly measures the dip and the dip direction using a compass and a clinometer. And there are many, many different styles. I mean, some of them are handmade, um, some of them are engineered. There are many um, different ones. Um, as, as I said, you know, you can see it um, visually and you can, your measurements are done in situ. There's no conversion of alpha or beta angles required um, because you're not using the internal angles. The disadvantages, um, it is susceptible to set up errors. It's easy to knock and then it's not accurate anymore. It will pick up the magnetic interference from surroundings and rocks because you're using a compass. The frames can be heavy and bulky um, and you, you can have measurement errors. Um, it's also quite hard to hold a plane against the core and align the compass and the Kleiner ruler on it. So, um, and again, it's slow and it's a manual uh, process. The other ones that we, we use, uh, they measure the orientation of a feature relative to the core axis and the orientation line. So you would measure your, your alpha angle, which is the acute angle between the plane and the core axis and then your beta angle, which is angle between the orientation line and the lower end of the ellipse. Um, you then use these angles to calculate your dip and dip direction. And, and generally that would be used, that will be calculated in um, a, a separate software package. Um, so, Uh, you can also measure the plunge and the plunge direction of a line on a plane, and that means that you need to measure your gamma angle. Please be aware that there are different conventions for these angles. Um, so, for example, the arcuologer that Vanek spoke about, your um, angle is measured from the orientation line to the first intercept of the lineation, um, or the angle can be measured clockwise in a plane from the long axis of the ellipse, or it can be measured from the orientation line to the bottom intercept of the lineation. Uh, just be aware that there are different conventions. And if you have many geologists working on a project or many generations um, of, of the same project, you, you, know, you might come back to the same project five years later, um, that you are totally aware of what convention has been used previously. Because if you start using a different convention, obviously you, you understand that your, your, um, your core orientation measurements are gonna to be totally different. And it's gonna be quite hard to understand where the problems have occurred. Um, so this is uh, another tool that you can use, the, the goniometer. They're available in different sizes. You measure your alpha and your beta angles, it's quite easy to do. Um, and it's, it's also quite accurate. So your, your beta angle is up to about two degrees and your alpha um, angle up to about five degrees. Um, these are, are really easy to use. Um, so you align the core with the orientation line pointing down the hole um, against the zero on the beta angle. You measure beta angle on the bottom of the ellipse. Um, and for your alpha angle, you align it to the side of the feature and you just read off your angle. Um, so your sources of error where you're gonna find problems is the thickness marker line. Um, so if you have a very thick line, you can see already here, you've got a five to six degree error um, and it's gonna like, give you one and a half to 2% measurement error. And you're gonna find throughout all your orientation, if you use a thick pen, you're gonna give yourself errors. So try and use the thinnest pen you can. 
Um, another source of, of error could be the uncertainty in the position of the apex of the ellipse. Um, and this is going to be particularly your high alpha angles. But it's not just the, the goniometer that's going to give you this error. Um, this is something that no matter what tool you use, if you're not certain where the position of the apex is, it is going to give you an error. So what I used to do is just draw where I have made my measurements. So if somebody comes back later, they can see what I have measured or what my team of geologists has measured. Um, and then again, you've got to be quite careful of that you measuring the top of the ellipse rather than the bottom, because that is going to give you a 180 degree beta angle error. Um, low alpha angles can be difficult to measure and there's an estimation. So you'll see that your angles are uh, in increments of five degrees. So you are going to be averaging up to five or down five. Parallax of errors. So hold it up to your eyes so you can minimize that. And then you need to use the correct goniometer or chronometer size. If your core doesn't fit into the, the tool, you are going to get wrong readings. So chronometers, very similar to goniometers, again, available in a variety of sizes. They measure the alpha and the beta angles. Again, um, increments of five degrees. And with a chronometer, your apex of the ellipse is aligned with the zero beta mark and the angle read at the orientation line intersection. Please be aware that this is the reverse of the goniometer. So if you're using goniometers and chronometers on the same project, then you need to be really, really careful that um, the geologists are using them correctly and aligning the core in the correct way. So we've already gone through the sizes um, and using a thick marker. And then please ensure that you use that you are using the core pointing in the correct direction when you fit it into your uh, chronometer. Righty, so these are, look quite old um, and I always think, well, we never use them, but actually people still use them quite a lot. So um, you have your core protractors, and there are different ways of, of measuring your alpha and your beta angles. Um, just be aware that you're reading the correct end of the ellipse. Um, and again, you know, the, the position of the apex and um, ensure that you're using the, the correct diameter. So with all the tools, just ensure that you use the correct tool, the, the correct size, and you know which way your, your core is pointing. Uh, the wraparound core protractors, I think a lot of people still use these. Um, so you, you uh, wrap it around your core, you read off your, ang your alpha angle, making sure that your protractor is orientated facing down the orientation line. And then um, you read off your alpha and your beta angles. Um, I can say that they're not very waterproof because you print them on... Um, on plastic. So I have found that um, crying at the courtyard isn't really helpful to your protractor. And then the mistakes, you could have it upside down. Um, so it does help to have a, the side up stick on the correct side. And because you print it, make sure that your scales, um, that you're not scaled it so that it is um, printing correctly. And again, use your correct size. So I honestly think that this is the best thing since sliced bread. It takes away all the pain of all those errors that I have just been talking about. It is digital. Um, it has an app that calculates your alpha, your beta, your gamma angles, um, and gives you your dip and dip direction immediately. So you don't have to do it. There's much less chance of making errors. Um, you can visualize the readings on a stereo net. So while you're busy doing your structural readings, you can already build up a picture of what your structure looks like. 
and it automatically syncs, or excuse the, the spelling there, um, to a cloud-based hub. So this is what Wernich was talking about earlier. And if you haven't seen one yet or you haven't used one yet, give him a ring. Um, it does take the pain of, of structural logging away. Obviously, like with any other tool, there are some sources of error, but not as much. You just have to make sure that you um, properly align the RQ logger on the orientation line before zeroing. Make sure that once you have orientated the RQ logger, you don't move the core. Um, and then again, like the other tools, the low al alpha angles are more difficult to measure. Um, you can measure your um, structure on the side of your ellipse rather than on the apex. It's less accurate, but it is still possible. So for example, if you have half core and your apex has been cut off, you can still take a, a structural reading. Um, it's, it's really nice because you actually don't have to pick up your core in order to do your structural readings. Um, and you know, uh, you know, it's just a lovely tool. So if you're interested, get hold of Ernie for that. Then there are other ways of, of doing your structural readings as both, as Massey has mentioned earlier, um, you can use, um, Things like you know uh, the scan RT from UCP, stereo core, photolog, um, and you have software that uses core photography, and then you draw the lines and points on structures. Um, you know you don't have to be on site to be able to do this. The the um, downfall is though that you're only seeing one side of your core; you can't pick it up, and um, you know as geologists we all do like to lick our core, so you won't be able to do that. Um, and you can obviously make your measurements at any time. It doesn't have to be when you're in the core yard. And because you have great photos, core degradation is less of an issue. As I said, you only see the one side of the core. Uh, poor image quality and resolution of core photos will be a problem. And then again, your parallax and lens distortion. Subtle structures may be difficult to see. And if you're working on a structural project where that is very important, then you're probably not going to be wanting to use that as, as your method. Um, and then televiewers, uh, Massey went through that. So, um, you know, they're, they're the two different varieties. You have your optical and your acoustic. Um, and you can map the structures in RC holes and you can see zones of poor core recovery or lost core which is a benefit. It avoids the issues of poorly orientated core, but we're all going to be very careful and make sure that our core is perfectly orientated going forward. Um, and it's generally run by other um, contractors, so you, you wouldn't do it yourself, which means that it's expensive and the data turnaround times can be slow. Um, so you have your high resolution optical sensor um, and it's going to require your dry hole or clear water, which is sometimes a problem too. And you're going to need a good color contrast. Then acoustic, they use ultrasonic beams to measure variations in acoustic attenuation of the drill hole wall. Your hole has to be filled with fluid um, and you have to have a good acoustic contrast. It's very good in identifying subtle fa fabrics, such as mineral foliations. I'm sorry, identifying subtle fa fabrics such as mineral foliations can be difficult. And then also there's some difficulty in telling fractures from veins and alterations. And that is the end. So I am now totally open to any questions. If I have rushed through anything and you haven't understood anything I've said. Thank you very much, Nolene. I am once again reminded of the advantages of pitting in shallow alluvial deposits. <laughs> oh, this one is for the column, right? Nolene, there is a question in the chat uh -huh. from Stanford. Is the orientation line difference between the runs a major issue if the previous run orientation 
and the new run orientation are about a millimeter off. However, still running parallel to each other in the same direction. Um, so this is something that you as a geologist and your company would decide on. Um, at which point would you not accept the orientation line? Um, there are ways of going back and, and making the, the corrections and, you know, to make sure that they all match. But um, personally, I would think like a millimeter is okay. But then if you carry on having a millimeter off in every run, where are you going to end up? Have a look at um, Holcomb's um, articles on, on how to, to calculate, back calculate any um, deviations. And there's another one regarding IQ logger. Do you know if there's stock available for the IQ logger? Okay, we are going to have to ask Van Nuch. I'm not sure if he's still here. Um, there should be stock available. And um, so Reflex generally rents out this, this stuff. So that's great for small projects. You don't have to like you know, uh, put out the capital to buy them. However, I do know that in Africa, um, in the African region, they were also selling them. So get hold of me and I'll pass it on to Vernich or get hold of Vernich and ask him. Um, and about the archaeologists. Where are you based? Who was that? Tokozi. Okay. Oh, DRC. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Gladys. Is there a preferred marker size for the drawing of the orientation line? The thinner, the better. Um, just make sure that um, it Oh, thanks, Nat. Um, sorry, just make sure that it's not going to rub off, but the thinner the line is, the better. Are there any other questions? Are there in the chat or just put your hand up or unmute yourself and ask? Um, Stephen, the, uh, the Teleview structural data is good. But personally, I think that doing it yourself, doing your physical measurements on the core is, is preferable. Um, that's my own personal opinion. And it again depends on your, your geology, your structure. Yeah, um, um, sorry, yes. Sorry, there's that question from Maimo. Um, yes, rely on your geology. Um, we're geologists and this is what we do, right? So look at what you, you see, use your geology to, to align your core. It's not going to be always, always going to be possible. Um, but yes, always, even if, even if your core has been fitted, just have a look and make sure that, um, your, your patterns, your structure is, is correct. Just have a look. We've still got all our presenters here. Marcy and Colin are still on board. So if you have a question for anybody, please don't be afraid to ask. Hey, Nolene, which tools in logging do you consider are easy to operate and accurate, both manual or digital? Okay, I um, so survey and orientation tools, downhole, digital. When it comes to logging your measurements, um, it's very dependent on what your project can afford. Um, but use the you know, the best that you can afford. So if you can afford an IQ logger to do your structural readings, by all means, go for it. If you can't, I would then say perhaps the easy logger, the, um, the goniometer, but um, they all work, 
just use them correctly. Does that answer your question, Mohammed? Cool. Okay, well, we, we'll pick up with questions. Okay, there's a question for um, Masi and Colin. Have you any experience in drilling a core from mineral sand successfully? Either Colin or Masi? Colin, go ahead. Sure, just sorry. Um, <clears throat> Tanya, why do you repeat the question, please? Drilling a core from mineral sands. Um, so, so is the person asking, is it possible or... Or what are the problems with it? Is, is there a particular part to it? it have, have you had any experience in drilling a core from mineral sands successfully? So it looks, uh, Andrea, would you like to explain further your concern? Hi, Tanya. Hi, Colin. So, yes, um, we are currently um, with a geotechnical campaign and trying to get a core from the mineral sands. I'm based at Trodox in the on the West Coast. But our first attempt with the Sonic was not so successful. Um, they have sent the rig or the core and the tubing to Europe for more specifications. So we'll do a retry in six weeks. But yes, so I, while we here, I wanted to know if you've know if you know if anyone has done this successfully, gotten a core. Um, I I would say that what you've done there is what I would have tried. You know, a, a normal core drill whether it's triple tube or whatever you're using in 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 sand would be would be very difficult you'd be very lucky to get a decent sample i i would have said sonic and having said that i was i was at a mine maybe not far from where you guys are uh, a little while ago and they were also running sonic and they were also having big problems in sand and i look i don't have much experience in sonic other than to know that what I've seen has been very impressive. I would I would suggest carry on with the Sonic and, and try and try and you probably find it's just a couple of bugs you've got in your system there. But I would say that's your best chance would be Sonic. Thank you, Colin. Okay. Uh, well, let's move on. Andy, I see you are are on on the call so if you would like to share your screen you can go now if you're okay hi tanya all right cool just give me a second to set up sure no problem while you do that let me just introduce you um Okay, so Andesiwe Vertuza is a geologist by training, and she has made the, the move from mining and exploration to the IT sector. And Andy's going to, to talk to us about the basics of drill hole database management. It's an introductory talk because um, and he's going to talk to us more about this next year in a database management um, one or two day event. Alrighty. Then just share my screen here. Uh, I think this is the one. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes, and then we can see it. We can hear you. We just like to just... put your your video on for a couple of seconds. Okay. So yes. Can so everyone you. can see me. <laughs> Let me do that. So I'm gonna have to get out of here a bit. Let me stop sharing and then come back to the video. Okay. Can everyone see me? There you go. Yeah. Cool. All righty. So, um, hello, everyone. Um, I guess Tanya has introduced me. My name is Andy Siwe. You can also call me Andy Vutuza. I'm currently a technology advisor here at Acquire Technology Solutions. We are basically a data management um, software and services company. 
And today I'll just be giving you a brief introduction to Joho database management, okay? So I'm just gonna stop my video for now and reshare my screen. All righty. Okay, we can see you, we can hear you, off you go. Off I go, all right. So I guess I've done the introductions part now. I'm just gonna move on to the next slide. Okay, so um, our speakers today have basically covered a variety of drilling related topics and the types of geological parameters that drilling can give us, right? So these parameters are basically uh, at the core of uh, business decision-making uh, processes for, for mining companies. But of course the data has to make sense. It has to give us information Therefore, it needs to be stored and it needs to be managed and processed for information. So it all starts with the data, okay? Geological data is extremely, it's an extremely valuable strategic asset which is used to make uh, profitable business decisions based on the quality and the integrity of your data. It is the single source of truth that guides everything you do within the mining value chain. Now, we all understand that um, geological data forms the basis and it guides the decisions that are made across the, the, the mining value chain, right? But in many cases, this data is, is underestimated. The value of this data is underestimated, especially when you consider how many meters have been drilled, how many samples have been done and the related costs. Then to add on top of that, there's the amount of time and the manpower that can um, you know, add on to that cost, basically. So currently, internationally, the average cost of diamond drilling, I mean, Colin can, um, you know, correct me on this, is like, it's approximately 200 US dollars per meter. So assuming you have drilled, let's say, 50,000 meters, um, you're looking at a cost of 10 million, 10 million US dollars. Then you add on the manpower costs, which could easily be an additional 50%. So your effective replacement value is in the region of 15 million US dollars. Now, when you look at it from this perspective, geological data is definitely a significant and strategic asset, and it needs to be managed accordingly. Now, to function um, effectively as an, as an organization, you need information. For example, a library needs a list of borrowers and books which are borrowed, a mining company needs drilling details. Now, information in essence is just data that's represented in a meaningful way, okay? So the same data can be shown, shown in different ways and it will, uh, will provide different information to different viewers. An information system, it must be able to store and retrieve data in a way that is meaningful to the user. So at the core of, of information system, it's data basically, which is then transformed into information according to the user's needs. Now, before we look at the common types of information management systems that are used within geosciences or within the mining industry as a whole, let's discuss what makes a good information management system. So, there's a number of op um, information oper informational operations that a, a management system is capable of, but the core ones are the collection of your information. Um, an information system must be able to store information. It must be able to process that information. It must be able to distribute that information. And most importantly, that information must be accessible. So let's look at the different ways in which um, data is managed currently. So you have your hard copies, which are stored in basically physical file systems. Now with hard copies, we know that sharing can be a nightmare. You know, you always have to track where you put a certain form. You always have to check um, who last saw the key to a certain room that, you know, stores your different file, file, um, files. Finding is also a nightmare. There's multiple places to retrieve related information. Usually, you know, in, uh, at the production side of mining, you would have multiple cabinets where multiple files are being stored. Sometimes the wrong file can be put in the wrong cabinet and you will struggle to find that file just because someone put it in the wrong cabinet. 
So this obviously introduces the opportunity for data to be lost in the process, okay? Then you have electronic files, such as your Word or Excel. These are better than your hard copy, but sharing is still difficult. There's also the versioning issues where there's multiple copies that may exist of the same for the same um, Excel uh, file. And also finding it can be quite difficult. Then you come to databases, which are the best of all. Um, in databases, data is organized and it becomes a central repository for all to access. Now, you might be asking yourself, what is a database? So a database can be defined as a structured collection of data that is stored in a computer so that a program can interrogate it to answer queries, okay? Now, the records that are retrieved in answer to your queries, those become your information that can be used to make decisions. And the computer program um, that is used to manage and query a database is known as a relational database management system. Now, there are many different types of databases. You know, the best database for a specific organization, it depends on how that organization intends to use the data. In geosciences, they commonly use flat file or relational databases. So what is a flat file database? Basically, this is a database that consists of one, usually very large table, okay? Like the one that you see on my screen. Now, in the context of drill holes, Commonly, data is stored in a single large table, which displays information about that drill hole. This table can have color data, like what I have on my screen here. It can have downhole survey data, which is what I also have on my table. You can also have your sampling data being added, um, added there. You can also have your logging data being added there. So for visualization purposes, one can say this is a superb way of viewing data. But in the scheme of a good geoscientific information management framework, where you need to ensure that your data is secure, your data has integrity, your data is also scalable, meaning you can accommodate um, your database becoming bigger, this is not an effective way of storing data, okay? Storing data this way can introduce a number of problems. Number one being that um, there's data redundancy. So there is repetition of your data and there can be duplication of your data. Like in my table here, there is rep um, repetition of the color information for your drill hole. Also, this can introduce storage issues because you keep repeating the same data, you are using up storage space and you're wasting it, okay? Also, there's the issue of not having um, cascade delete or update. So what this means is if I delete on an Excel spreadsheet that has multiple tabs. If I delete a drill hole on one um, tab, right, it might still occur in another tab. So there isn't um, a good error tracking system in this regard. And also the flat table, at some point, it becomes uncontrollable because you will keep adding more fields. For example, if I add my sampling intervals, if I add my lithology intervals and et cetera, and this makes finding information even more difficult. So all the problems that I have mentioned in the previous slide can be resolved by dividing our data into multiple tables that are related to each other. And that's where relational databases come in, okay? So a relational database is a database where the data is stored based on its relationship to other data in the same database. So with the relational database, you have related data that is identified and it's placed in relevant, in relevant tables. And the rule is each set of data should appear only once. So for example here, this is my flat file um, database, the large table that I had. What a relational database does basically, it splits the data sets. So you have your color information going into your whole location table, and then you have your downhole survey information being saved under your whole survey table. And then based on the common fields between those two tables, which in this case is your whole ID and your project code, you can relate the two tables to each other. 
There is no duplication of data here. There is no repetition of data. There is a relationship between two tables which are related to each other. And this way, um, you know, if you're looking, for example, for um, survey information for this whole ID called ABL001, you don't need to sift through a very large table to find that information. You can easily go to that relevant table, which is whole survey in this instance, and, and get the information related to that drill hole. So with data um, stored and managed in one location, multiple applications and users can access information. So with a database that's centrally located, it becomes easy for the users and the apps to interact with the data and to query the information they need from it. And what, what I mean by applications, I'm talking about now your third party applications, such as your modeling or mind planning applications or GIS applications. Instead of having to export data out of your database and then import, import it back into um, those third party applications, those applications can now directly also interact with the database from the same location as your users also. So this ensures that everyone is ac accessing this single source of truth, and it also prevents a lot of data handling and corruption by users. Okay. So what I've shown you here, basically, it's a client server architecture. I'm not going to go into detail about that because this is just the introduction, right? But basically, what a client server architecture does, it allows employees to share information amongst themselves in a quick and efficient way. So the software that manages your database is called a Relational Database Management System, or RDBMS for short, and that is located on the server. In simple terms, an RDBMS is basically, it acts as an interface between your database and its end users or the applications that are trying to communicate with the database. Now, um, as specialists in the data management um, field, we've seen a common set of challenges across the board from exploration to mining production, from single sites to multiple sites. And these include, I'm gonna, not gonna go into each and every point here. I'm just gonna touch on a couple. Let me just have my laser on here. So for the first one is that um, you see, we see a lot of data being stored in too many places and data being easily lost, basically. So with a dedicated RDBMS, so Relational Database Management System, your database, like I said before, it becomes the only source of truth, meaning everyone is working on the same database and it's like they're all ac accessing the same data, okay? There's also opportunity for data to get corrupted. So there's opportunity for human error at capture and also during delivery. Now, again, with a dedicated RDBMS, business rules and validation rules can be set at the point of entry, preventing the input of corrupt or incorrect, uh, incorrect data. For example, you can assure that um, the same validation codes are being used throughout for lithology data fields. Again, another example, if granite is being inputted as GRA, as your organization, what an RDBMS can ensure is that each geologist always enters GRA and not GRT, for example. So this way, everything that goes into your database, it's always validated. It always has um, integrity and it's correct. And another thing that we have um, picked up with, uh, uh, you know, departments that don't have a, a robust geo, geoscientific information management system is that there's a lot of time wasted reformatting data for analysis, for example, or for reporting. So a good RDBMS should save you that time, the time that you spend on a task. For example, resource geologists, before they model, um, they would usually, if they don't have a good RTBMS system, they would usually go through multiple Excel spreadsheets, you know, um, to ensure that the data is in the correct format, that it is uh, validated and it will be allowed into their modeling software. Now, a database management software, it should allow interoperability. 
meaning that it should be friendly. It should play well with modeling, GIS, and mine planning softwares. So when you take data from a database that's been managed by an RDBMS, it should move into any external third-party systems in a very swift and streamlined manner. So like I said, to save time, I'm not gonna go through the rest of the typical data management problems that you may encounter when you lack a robust system. But the takeaway message here is that poor data management can lead to inconsistencies. It can lead to frustration. It can lead to a loss of data, which in turn results in a waste of money and resources and time. Now, a good geoscientific data management system, it should provide you um, a single source of truth for your data across the organization. It should improve bus business efficiencies and enable process improvement. And it should also leverage innovation, meaning you should, you know, an organization should be able to move away from logging on hard copies, for example, and do a digital capture on mobile devices. And then most importantly, a good geoscientific data management system should minimize operational disruption. It should manage the risk and optimize your workflows and increase your efficiency as a geoscientist. Um, I hope this has uh, been a good introduction on what to expect on next year's workshop about this topic. Thank you guys for lending me your ears and uh, please do follow us on LinkedIn and sign up for our newsletters. And yeah, you're also more than welcome to reach out directly to me for any more information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Does anybody have any questions at this stage for Andy? Looks like you're getting off lightly. <laughs> That's fine. Oh, they, keep, oh. they keep being okay. Go ahead. Hi, Tanya. Uh, sorry, just just one comment. I, I I don't know if if Andy put part of that uh, sample database in deliberately, but um, I don't know if anybody noticed in uh, some of the samples there that Andy had, it was survey data. There was inclination and azimuth data for a borehole yes. that. Uh, just was garbage. It didn't make sense at all. So in other words, what I'm saying is the the, the survey data was obviously wrong. Um, and and uh, um, obviously, one's got to be very careful about validating data before you put it into a database. Because yes. once it's in there, you believe it's correct. And that, that data could not be correct. It's clearly is very, very inaccurate. Um, so that's just the point I wanted to make there. V validate before you stick it in. Mm -hmm. And that's what an RDPMS can do for you, basically. I think what I was showing though was just, you know, just to demonstrate how um, the different databases work. Sure. Ab absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Anything else, guys? Looks like they're keeping their questions for next year. Andy. For next year, yeah. No, that's good. <laughs> That's good. Um, this will give them an opportunity to go and Google some more about this topic, and then next year we'll have more interactive in, um, discussions, I guess. <laughs> ah, great. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Okay, folks. Um, towards the conclusion of the, um, the afternoon now, and I want to take you back to when you first registered for this drilling program. That was the, the upper part of the registration flyer. And everybody saw free online workshop. But the reality in life is nothing is completely free ever. Because when you scroll down, the, and it's not so small writing, says in order to receive a certificate of completion, you will be required to attend the entire day and write and pass a short assignment based on the course content. Now we realize that there's load shedding, there's internet connectivity issues, there are people who are doing this in between uh, work as well. So that is why we have the recorded version of the, the course 
And that will be available uh, within 48 hours. Initially, it will just be the, uh, the, the raw, unedited uh, version. But within a day or so, we will have the edited version up on the, the, the GSSA YouTube channel for everybody to, to, to go and have a look at. Uh, let me just show you where this is. So if you go to the, the GSSA website and you click on the, the YouTube link, either on the home page or on the playlist page, you will find the link to this presentation. So that is where you will find the, the recording. You don't need a special link. You don't need any other access. That is how you get to the, the YouTube recording. And then you can listen to it over and over and over again. Then if, now, what I would like you to do is to ask any questions that you might have as I'm going through this. I do need you to, to understand what is happening. So you can get the, 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 um, the recording, you can listen to it, the, the, the full assignment on it. Then we have two essay type questions and a survey monkey questionnaire. Right, this is the, the document that we're going to send to everybody. And right now I am going to stick it in the, in the chat box. Um, okay, so it is in the, in the chat box. So download it, and what you're going to do when you open it up is you're going to put your name, your full name as it is in your registration, and your email address. To receive a certificate of completion for the workshop, you need to demonstrate an understanding of the principles as contained in the online course. This assignment, based on answering two compulsory questions below and a survey, survey monkey questionnaire must be completed in full by typing your words, your answers in this Word document. I don't need a separate document. I on, want... the, on the above class, it's, it's only going to be the upgrade that's coming out next year that will look totally different. Oh. It will have the uh, same shape, but... Okay, so you type your answers in this document. Don't send us a separate document with a million pages in it. It must just be in this document. And you email it directly to me. For each question, it's either going to be a pass or a fail. And to receive your certificate, you need to pass all three questions. Wow. If you are successful, you will receive a certificate from the GSSA by the end of September. So just be patient. Do not expect to get your certificate in two days' time. It does take a while for us to work through all of the, the answers and make sure that everything is correct. If you have not heard from us by the end of September, you may send us a, a mail. Yes, I've just put the, the document in the, in the chat, Joshua. It's on, the, it's on the chat box, guys. Let me put it in there again. Yeah. 
It's a Word document. Oh, so it's, it's the Word document that should be in your chat box now. Okay. So there are two questions. I need you to type your answers below each question. Answer the question fully. And we're looking at between four and 500 words long, which is effectively one page. If you supply us with 15 pages of, of, of answers, no one is going to mark it. Therefore, you're not going to get a, a certificate. For the guys who've just um, said on the, the chat that they can't find it, just look up to above Siwe Siwe in Dalela, just directly above his uh, comment, there will be something from me to everyone, an introduction to drilling assignment. That's where it is. In the chat, directly above your current questions. It will also be emailed to you if we have, so that, that's a possibility um, to cause a, those who are using a mobile device might have difficulty in seeing it. Uh, Nolene, do you have any idea how to access it through a phone? Uh, no idea, because today I'm using my computer, Tanya. <clears throat> um, okay. Let me think about well, look, it. it is there, guys. I'll put it on again just before we go. But we will also email it to you, to the email address that you registered for this um, course with. Okay, it is uh, an essay structure, but I don't necessarily don't want subheadings or anything like that. So your first question, geologists are responsible for aspects of quality, safety, and productivity in exploration drilling projects. Please explain what actions of the exploration geologist can influence these aspects, and you type your answer in there. Pretty much one page of answer. This is the, the second question. Given the section line with the drill holes and legend, summarize the geology and history of the deposit, pay attention to discontinuities and identify both the number and nature of the present unconformities. And again, maximum one and a half pages of that. Question three, this question must be answered online at, at that address and then confirm that your questionnaire has been completed because this will go to directly to Nolene. And so we'll be able to, um, to, to confirm things. And when you've finished this, email the Word document back to me. Um, there is no specific deadline for it. You can take as long as you like to get it in but you won't be getting your certificate until such time as you have, have sent it in. Um, we realize that people have, have other jobs to do as well. And um, some people might um, need. Uh, to, to, to review the, the presentations online. I'm not going to go through all the questions again. They are here. They are on the document that, that you have got and will continue to get by email. Are there any questions on the, the process and what you have to do? If you don't ask, I'm going to assume that you all understand what you need to do. I do not want an email from you tomorrow. I didn't know what I had to do. Please explain. 
Ask your questions now, please. Is there any option after completing the questions to send to you? Uh, I'm not sure what I, not sure what you mean, but once you've done the, um, uh, answered the questions, you, you send that to me. I don't see there is any other option. Uh, Ian has noted that there is, that not all of you are exploration geologists. I completely understand that. And what you might wish to do under those circumstances is directly underneath there, um, note what you are doing, uh, what your experience is with respect to the reason you're on this drilling course. Njabulo, you have your hand up. Uh, would you like to ask your question? Um, yes, I do have my hand up. Um, my question is, is there an opportunity to retry um, this essay question type document if you fail it? Or is it only one try that's afforded to, to us? There is only one try, pass or fail. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from anybody else? Tanya, it's Colin here. I wonder if it's yes. worth mentioning to the guys that um, if they submit a check together with the uh, assessment, it would dramatically increase their chances of passing. Um, <laughs> The, the, the no, the Colin, no, 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 I don't take checks. Sorry, no. <laughs> EFT works much better for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I think in fairness as well, Tanya, it's, it's, uh, it clearly, uh, you know, maybe the guys are, are getting uh, a little bit concerned. Um, you know, it's uh, certainly from, from my question, I'm sure from Massey's and I'm sure from Nolene's, you know, we're not masking, going to mark this like it's a PhD thesis. Uh, exactly. We just want to be satisfied that you've you've taken away from today some of the learnings that we've emphasised. So so don't uh, um, don't get too too concerned about it. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, agreed. We, we're not looking to to fail you. We're just looking to make sure that you you actually got something from the uh, the course, uh, Lucia. Uh, where will we get the link to the survey question? Here it, uh, here it is. On, on underneath question three, it says this question must be answered online at there. And you just click on that one and it will take you to the, the website. And again, there is no deadline for the assessment, you do it as and when you wish, but you will only get your certificate after you have supplied the, uh, the, the, the questions. Yeah, guys, even, even, even geotech engineers are, are able to do it. As, as everyone has said, this is not designed to, to fail you. It is designed to see if you have an understanding of, of, of drilling. And if, if question two looks looks tough, again, Massey will take an EFT. Uh, the copy of the presentation, the, the recording will be made available on the, the GSSA YouTube site. And we will hopefully have that up before 
with, within the next 48 hours, very definitely by, by Friday. So you can go and go over as many parts of the presentations as you wish. So guys, thank you all very much for your um, participation. And I've just realized I've forgotten to run the, uh, the poll. And since everybody is gone, it's not particularly useful to run it now. Um, thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you found it worthwhile. And uh, we hope to see you again at one or other of the, the GSSA events. For the upcoming year, will it be possible to integrate um, the database for geosciences with more pro like machine learning? Yes, indeed. Um, I hope many of you will, ha will have seen in the, the current newsletter. And for those of you who don't get the newsletter, please look at the, the GSSA website. Um, go to the, the newsletter because there is a survey in there asking you for your opinion on the types of courses that you would like to see the GSSA run next year. Please go in there and give us your opinion because we want to present courses that are going to be useful for you guys. So please let us know your opinions on that. Yes, Mohammed, I will do that. I will put the link in the description of the YouTube video. That um, I will I'll, I'll actually have in the, um, the note that goes out to you all, the email that goes out with the, the document. Again, we'll put that link in there. And thanks again to our, our sponsors and also to our presenters. Thanks, Colin, Massey, Nolene, Andy. And yes, you can partake in the assignment if even if you did not register, as long as you've been able to download the, um, the document because I won't be able to email it to you if I don't have your email address.